21 people connected, 25 light. Hold on, guys, if anyone can hear me, please use the raise your hand function. Oh, perfect. All right. So we are going to wait for everyone to join. We have this 30 minutes together now. All right. All right, so we can use those 25 minutes to talk. You can ask me questions and then we will begin. I want to make sure that everyone will join. So we are 32 out of 99. Hey, Paris. Ah, yes, of course. Uh, next to me is Saya. Hi, guys. She is a new addition to the website. She is going to help us next year with the Italian exam as well. And um, we are going to split the marathon together. I'm going to do the biology physiology part, and Saya is going to do the math, physics, and chemistry part. And then Shalev, which most of you already know, is going to do the critical thinking part. Make sure if, uh, that you have a paper and a pen. And um, so we are going to finish all yours today. You mean all the subjects? Yes, we are going to do all the subjects today. We prepared a very high yield presentation to only the specific part of the IMAT that usually pop up in the exam. And we are going to have a lot of examples for the different tricks that usually repeat themselves. And we are going to see together how to notice those tricks and exactly how to solve them. It's going to be a long day, so be prepared. Yes, of course. So on the website, because uh, a few days ago I asked you to give me your emails of the Intermed School account. So I'm going to assign to this account a uh, donators only forum which you are going to find the presentations summaries q a and all the questions you asked me on this um, q a we are going to show them on the website itself so you are going to have able to even see the recording so don't worry you're going to have everything later all right nice to meet you So this Zoom session is a bit different than what you are used to. It's called a webinar Zoom session. So as you can see, you have the option to ask me question and I can uh, answer it uh, live. You have the options of poll, which I'm going to run live polls, each question we are going to do to see exactly uh, which answer you chose so I can know exactly how to help you. And then you can use the chat just for regular chat. So if you want to ask me anything before, before we begin, just it's your time now. Hey, hey guys. I wish I could see all of you, but 90 people is too much. If anyone wants to talk, I can allow to talk specific people. So just tell me and I will allow it on Zoom. Yeah, all right. I hear we are flying with people trying to take the test to Italy, not being able to enter. Yes, um, can you present the live so everyone will see the question? All right. 
uh, guy I saw some uh, rumors about people not uh, able to get in, but I'm not sure about it. Um, I'm not sure if it's going to be the same because Cambridge is the body that takes the IMAT exam. So I think it's going to be different. Um, would you mind reading the question when you answer them? We cannot see the questions. Yes, of course, every time I need, because it's a different kind of Zoom, I have to pick questions specifically in order to share them. But each time I'm answering, either in text, Saya will help me over the marathon. Let's say Saya is teaching, so I will answer the questions and I will teach, Saya will answer the questions. And each time we will answer them on text, you will be able to see it on the website and as well on the Q&A chat on Zoom. And if you want me, I can copy the entire chat and you can see it as well on the website after the marathon. Could you please explain the admission rounds one more time? For EUs, Marion, you mean for EUs or for non-EUs? Because non-EUs don't have admission rounds. The EUs have, and um, I have the post Sarah wrote on the website, which every five days you need to pick your university, but it's pretty complicated to uh, explain now, maybe in one of the future breaks, I will explain it. What about general knowledge? All right, Jacopo. Um, we have in this presentation, we analyzed all the past papers, if you, if you, um, including the test of medicine for the Italians, the IMAT, and even other exams that Cambridge take in uh, different high schools. And we analyzed the general knowledge they asked about. And we made an anki deck specifically for the next five days you can do of all the past papers questions. And at the end of this uh, marathon, you will be able to see exactly which topics are being asked a lot. How long will the marathon last? Um, I assume around six to eight hours. Uh, it depends on the amount of questions and the um, speed of the actual marathon. But we prepared, as you can see, probably from the screen sharing. By the way, if you can see my iPad screen, please raise your hand so I can make sure everyone can see my iPad. All right, perfect. Good. Okay, we are 43 people now out of 90. So we are, we are probably going to start uh, from 10. But we made almost 600 pages of marathon, so I assume it's going to take a bit of time. But um, yeah, six to eight hours, probably. The general knowledge is going to be a day. Guys, yes, one more thing. One last thing. We did solve the first paper. Um, it varies a lot. I used to get between 30 to 55, and my final score was 48. So it really depends because the stress during the exam is a bit different than uh, your simulations. And also a couple of past papers, like 2017, was com a complete mess. So a lot of people told me privately that they got like 20, 30 on this exam but it was a completely different exam than the others, so it depends. I think it's important to evaluate the, Do you know this year mean entry score will be higher than that of last year? I can't really know for sure. Every year it depends. For non news it usually goes up every year, not related to any, anything at all. Because last year they changed the general knowledge, and a lot of people say because of the general knowledge it is going to be less points, but it was actually more points, so we can't really know for sure. And this year, because, because of the COVID situation, and the different uh, exam conditions, you can't really know for sure either. So don't really think about it, just focus on doing your best. And the next five days, after this marathon, you have the skills and the tools to actually know what are your weak spots in order to work on them the next four or five days before the exam. So be ready to get five more points on the exam in your simulations anyway. Do you write in pen in the exam? Yes, you have to have a black pen 
you can't write anything on the answer sheet except the answers themselves, but you can write anything you want on the question paper itself. So make sure you answer and you fill the circles on the answer sheet correctly that we'll explain in the beginning, but it's good to know exactly how to fill it before because you have to fill the entire circle. And if you want to dismiss a question, you just exit, even if you fill it inside the circle. And if you want to dismiss it completely, you will have this uh, square or, um, I think square or circle next to the question, which you can fill and then the, the question just uh, won't count. So it's very important to know how to do it. Another a very important thing is because you are going to be stressed during the exam, keep five minutes at the end to fill out the questions and make sure you are filling the right number because it's very easy to skip one and then to fill the entire answer sheet just one ahead. So make sure you are doing it correctly. It's very important. Did you manage to solve the entire test? Was, given, was the given time enough for you? Okay, this is a very important question. We are going to get through it in the beginning of the marathon. The point is nobody solves 60 questions. You have to know which topics you are going to solve first. And at the beginning of this marathon, I'm going to give you some tools of uh, approaching the questions and knowing which topic you are going to solve first. For example, personally, I solved the biology first because uh, it, this is my stronger part. Then I moved to the general knowledge just to see if I can get some points. Then to the other scores like chemistry, um, physics, math, and then general knowledge and the critical thinking again. Um, bring a watch with you and decide mm -hmm. beforehand how much time you're going to spend for each uh, section. Uh, sometimes, maybe because the chemistry will be super difficult, uh, they decide that your marathon is spending more than uh, 30 minutes. So, when you finish the time, go on first, yeah. uh, go through all the questions, and if you have extra time, uh, try to solve again the one that you didn't. Can't really hear what she is saying. All right. Sorry. Maybe we'll try to move the computer a bit. Right. Mm. Guys, I'm going to try to connect a different microphone, so let me know if you hear Saya better now. Try to speak again. Okay, do you hear me? Is it better now? Perfect. Perfect. All right. Mm, which exam? 2017. Yes, the um, weird exam was 2017, as, and a lot of people told me that we were getting low scores. So don't be too worried about 2017. All right. Will you have to keep the mask for the whole exam this year? I assume you will, yes, you most probably will, because you are going to be split it into different classes and each class will contain probably 15 or 10 people. And in the class you have to wear masks because inside buildings you have to wear masks in Italy. I don't know about the different countries, but I know in uh, Italy and the vast majorities of countries, there are still COVID rules for inside buildings and stores, so it makes sense. Are we gonna talk about the new structure of the IMAT? Yes, of course, we are going to mention the general knowledge at the end. I'm going to give you some tips about how I, uh, how I scored um, all the almost part of the general knowledge at the beginning of the exam, which I think you should do as well. If, if you want a question to be unscored, will we be able to fill in the circle next to the option or just leave it blank? All right, so you have, two times to answer the questions. You can do it, you can do it uh, three times. If you answer it and then you want to change it, you need to X the question and then circle another uh, circle or a square at the answer sheet. If you want to dismiss this one as well, it's, it was your only option, your last choice. So if you want to dismiss the entire question, you have to either X it or to fill the circle next to the uh, five squares on the answer sheet. It's very important. Sorry. If I don't feel anything, will it count as zero or minus 0.4? Zero. Because only a mistake is minus 0.4 and you didn't answer anything. 
All right. I tried a time exam, which was two days ago, and I saw a big difference in the logic part, especially in biology was, let's say, compared to the little bit easier than the IMAT. I want to know if she gave the both exams last year and how was the experience and the score she got in both exams, if she would like to share. Yeah, uh, yeah of course. Uh, I am Italian, so I took both of the exams. Actually, um, studying medicine in Italian was my first choice. Uh, I was very stressed uh, the first day, uh, test I took, which was the Italian one. I scored about 51 points. Um, the IMAT was much better because it was the second time I was taking the exam, so I knew what I was, what uh, uh, yeah, was expecting me. I knew the structure of the exam, and also I had this week more to revise. I knew exactly what, what my weak points were, so I scored like ten points more. Um, I did sixty-three in the IMAT, uh, and I passed in Pavia, so I'm studying Pavia now. Which is one of the high stress equal, yeah, I know. Paris, Paris says stress equal 58 points. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I was surprised as well. All right, perfect. So we are not allowed to write solutions on the test paper? No, wait. On the answer sheet, the one you filled the answers, you can't write anything other than the barcode they give you and the answers themselves. If you write anything above it or below it, the actual answer sheet, they will fail your exam. They will just dismiss it. But you can use the question paper itself as much as possible, and you should, because I'm going to show you how to solve questions and um, add these extra steps to the question to actually find the trick. So you have to write a lot of the question and a lot of content. So make sure you do that as well, only on the question sheet not on the answers and not on your name. All right. Anyone have is there any other questions? No, a lot of questions. <laughs> I solved on the exams. I always finish before the time ends. My score is usually between 42 to 52. I see. Okay. Um, I can't see your name because it's an anonymous question, but I will assume you're a native English speaker. Um, the past two weeks I did some coaching for non-English speaker and English speaker, and I saw in the English speakers that they always read the questions very fast, because I guess you are used to the SAT, AP, and UK CAT different exam, which are very speed-based. So the IMAT exam, you should maybe force yourself to add an extra step to the question, like um, writing the actual question, writing to your own stuff, marking the important definitions, because to find the tricks on the IMAT exam, you need to spend at least two minutes for each one, one minute and 40 seconds. If you spend less, you're probably doing something wrong. And if you spend uh, 70, 80 minutes, you are completely the exam, again, you are probably doing something wrong. So it's very important to force yourself to finish the exam in 100 minutes so you can get these extra points. This one. I cannot re-choose an answer after dismissing it. No, you have one option, one time you can dismiss it and choose another one. But the second time you can dismiss it as well because if you will dismiss it and choose the third one, it won't count, it just be a mistake. So it's much better to just circulate to complete dismiss. Is the more practice material similar to the past paper? Alex, you mean the material we're going to do in the marathon today? So yes, we wrote a lot of questions and we brought a lot of questions from similar exams. For example, the AP, the IB, that uh, IB the Cambridge does, and it's very similar to the IMAT and the study material and the tricks they do. So um, I believe so, yeah. Are we allowed to bring pencils? They will give you pens or you will bring a black uh, pen and that's it. Can we bring a stopwatch? You can only bring a mechanical watch, you can bring a digital watch. So it's very important as well. On the table, even the water bottle will be peeled off 
and um, you will have only a, pe a black pen and a mechanical watch and that's it. Yes, exactly, Paris. Can you show this, um, what Paris said, please? It's very important. As a non-English speaker, you have to force yourself. I mean, as a native speaker, you have to force yourself to slow down a bit because it's so easy to pass, even if you pass and you skip to a single layer wall, you can just uh, uh, dismiss the entire question. So it's very important. All right. I usually, this one maybe? Yeah, I usually get just below the score that I'm aiming for. What would be the best way to boost the score by minimum of five points? So at the beginning of the marathon, I will show you the, um, which tools I used for the IMAT. And um, I hope it will help you. I believe so. Because it's like five steps for each question you should always use in order to find the trick, the actual question of the question, and how to dismiss your options to have at least one or two best options to choose from, which is extremely important. I see people, I see like 60 po 62 uh, people here, 63 now, and um, we should be 90, so we might start after 10. I hope everyone will join us until 10 o'clock. Just off topic, I will be doing the test in Italy, and I will be carrying my laptop and all the other stuff. Will there be a provision for putting the bag safely? Okay, when I took the exam, we had a separate room to leave all, all those uh, things at. I'm not sure what's going on to be um, with COVID. So personally, I would prepare the least amount of stuff to bring with you, just to be sure. But make sure to bring some food and some, uh, something sweet to eat before, and even headphones to hear some music before and be like, to calm down a bit, it's important. Can I bring in a marker? No, you can't uh, enter the exam with a marker. You can only with black pen, watch, and uh, water peeled, peeled off. Any specific dress code? I heard people were not allowed in at some classes. Uh, no, I don't think so. I never heard of it. Just dress up properly. Yeah. Maybe not shirt, not too much yeah. skin, just normal as you were going to school, I think. Yeah. Something they do a lot is to trick you replacing NADH with NADPH and vice versa. That's why reading and analyze everything is important. Yeah, exactly. And also they are confusing you between reduced NAD and uh, NADH, NAD+, NADP. It's very important to know. A very good one, Paris. Will there be a short break in the marathon? Yes, don't worry. We need some breaks as well. It's going to be a very intensive day. So we are going to have around five, six breaks, which I'm going to answer questions as well. And um, we can speak about other topics. Can we bring a photocopy of the Italian tax code instead of the real version? Um, the Codice Fiscale? Mean, yeah, the Codice yeah. Fiscale, yes, of course. Yeah, I don't think it's important. But you should have an original document with you, not a copy. The passport, yep. yeah, of course. Back in when yeah. you took the exam, did you memorize your code to check the list after the exam? Do you think that is necessary? Yes, I think so. Because the um, results are split into two sections. The first one is anonymous results that go alive after two weeks, which you can find your result only from the country code and the five last letters. So they will give you the sticker to stick on the paper itself. So if you will read the last five digits, digits and memorize it, it's very important to remember because the anonymous uh, result they will give you will be just a random letters and uh, words with the scores. Uh, and especially if you're also taking the exam in Italian, I think it's really important because um, the results uh, will be published in different times. And you might want to know if you have been accepted in the IMAT or not. Uh, because you have to accept uh, the university where you get in, in uh, for Italian. Mm -hmm. For example, I get in into Brescia uh, for the Italian medicine course, um, but I knew that I was um, with high probability in Pavia uh, for the English version, so I denied, I didn't accept Brescia. Uh, it's too late 
to accept uh, on university or to not accept it if you um, if you wait for the graduatory of the IMAT to be published. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It? Is permesso di soggiorno enough and passport? Um, I'm not sure about it. Passport is for sure. The permesso, I mean, you probably studied a year before in uh, Italy, so you have the permesso. I think they will uh, count only the passport because the body that takes the exam is Cambridge, it's not Italy. So you sign up to the exam with your passport, I guess, so they will check your passport. Um, Eva, I will ask, can I ask you what made you to choose Pavia as your first choice? Um, isn't it more expensive than Turin, for example? Okay, so personally I choose Pavia because I live in Tel Aviv in Israel and Tel Aviv is a huge city, so I wanted to change the environment and uh, Pavia is a small, cute city and I really like it. It's like a village. Also, I'm not sure about the prices because I'm pretty sure Pavia is the cheapest out of the, all the northern cities to study at uh, medicine and English. Um, my budget is around seven, eight hundred. So I hear people in Turin paying 200, 300 more and even in Milan. But I guess it depends where you live in Turin because it's a big city and you have a lot of different places. Also the thing about Turin is the main university for the Italian medicine and the English medicine is 12 kilometers from the center. So usually people live outside of Turin next to the university itself so it's it's more easy and probably cheaper to live in this than living in the center of Turin. but it depends on what you're looking for personally i like to have my silent my quiet and small libraries around and um, because i'm depending on scholarship i prefer a cheaper city so pavia was my first choice even though it, the score is very high comparing to Turin, i think i made the right decision i really like it here so if you want me to, I think, yeah, a few months ago, I wrote an article on the Intermed School website. So you can go and read it, my, um, what I think about Pavia in the first year, even though it was only six months and six months I had to come back to Israel because of COVID, um, I'm writing my impression of Pavia in this post. Can we write the digit on our hand? Uh, no. no, you can't write anything on your hand. Uh, you cannot spend too much time trying to memorize the code because you might be disqualified. Yeah. Everything you do other than writing on the papers, they might disqualify you. Last year in Israel, um, someone just went to the bathroom and they thought he used his phone or something and he was disqualified. So it's very important. They are extremely strict. So make sure you do everything correctly. But in the other hand, don't be too stressed about it because they are not going to disqualify you just for taking the exam. Just don't do anything irregular. It's important. So before the 24th of September, we can't know the scores in any way. No, you can't. But after the exam itself, like one hour after, you will have um, the A form of the exam. We can where you can see the results, not the result, but the actual questions. And personally, I remember what I chose. So I got a one point less than what I thought from the questions I remember. But uh, yeah, don't worry about it. It's going to make you crazy these two weeks. So just wait for the anonymous results and make sure to spend these two weeks because once you are into entered med school, you're going to be so busy. And um, I better spend this one month before the result just to relax. It's much better, in my opinion. Yeah, go on vacation right after you finish the exam. Yeah, absolutely. For two weeks, uh, then when the results are out, you can come back and think about your future. Absolutely. Yeah, about the sweet food thing, I would advise you to eat something sweet, but only a little bit. Even though sugar is able to boost your mood and get them <laughs> endorphins <laughs> running. Look at you, Perry. Sorry about the medicine right away. The fall from that endorphin high is even faster. So this is kind of tricky. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You are going to be a great doctor, Perry. Yeah. Good one. Can we start at 11? It's their problem that they are not here. Sorry, don't worry. We are going to start at 10. Actually, it's 10 in one minute. So we are going to start very soon. We have 74 people here. So don't we worry. We have a lot of questions. Yeah. 
Um, I'm going to answer a couple of more questions and we are going to keep the last questions for the next break, which is going to be in about one hour, one hour and a half. And then we are going to start very soon. So... Mm. This one is a good one. Do you get an email when you are being accepted? You don't get anything, especially as a non-U. You have to go to the, um, to the university itself and manually sign you in. Um, but I'm pretty sure because of COVID situation, you're going to be able to do it online. And I think last year we were able to pay the tuition fee there, only the 156 euros for the tuition at the beginning. So yes, you are going to be, you have to uh, check your score and to manually register uh, to the university you just got in. It's very important. I'll answer this one. Uh, so this is, yes, for EU and Italians. Uh, for us, we don't, uh, we're like taking the test to get into uh, university all over the Italy. So we make a list of our first choice, the second choice, third choice. Assigned is when you get a high score uh, enough to enter in your first choice. MOOC is when you get into medical school. Uh, so you are above the minimum score, but maybe you're not in the first choice. It's on your second, third, fifth choice. So you have the option to accept it and enter in your third, uh, second, third, fifth option or to wait in line until you get into your first choice. Yeah, absolutely. All right, I think we are going to start. We have 74 people here. The rest probably going to watch the recording. All right, so thank you so much for joining us for this marathon. I think it's the biggest thing we did until now on entermedschool.com. And without your help, it wouldn't be possible at all. So thank you so much again. I see we have a lot of questions, but don't worry, we're going to answer everything during the breaks. So again, I would like to Thank you so much for the donations. And this is the only way I was able and we were able to host and make this marathon. I think we spent the past two and a half weeks every day, like 12, 13 hours a day making this presentation for you guys. And it wasn't able without your help. So thank you so much again. All right. So you just saw Saya, the new addition to our website. She studied with me in the class at Pavia. And we have also Shalev as well. Probably most of you already know him from YouTube. He's a roommate and my best friend. And he's studied the third year. We just finished, sec finished second year. And my name is Ari Horesh. And I'm going to teach, teach you cell biology and physiology. And I studied the second year. I just finished first year as well. So thanks to you all, we were able to actually host the website, create our new app, which is completely free and took me a lot of time and provide the free education on YouTube, at least the beginning. And thanks to you guys, we are going to be able to upload more content and answer a lot of topics on the forums. I, I didn't believe I saw how many people are so active on the forum and I was, we were able to answer so many people. So thank you for that. And we reached, actually this, I created this PowerPoint a week ago and we were having a, um, 1650 um, members back then, but I think we just reached uh, 1700. So thank you yeah. so much. And of course, we were able to make this marathon. Thank you, guys. So thank you for being such a great community. All right. So we have a lot of big plans for next year. We want to keep doing the free education and we want to make education available for everyone. The biggest plans we are going to have for next year is to actually to translate the website and have free stuff for the Italian, Hebrew, Japanese, and Arabic. We know the Italian and Arabic audience is very broad and a lot of people from other countries that can't afford study in their own countries come to Italy because there are a lot of scholarships, the Edisco scholarship one, and a lot of other things that are um, helping you to study here for an affordable price and achieve your dream to actually study medicine, which unfortunately is not something we all can do and afford in our home countries, and even in Italy in some different universities. So medicine is Italy. In Italy, in general, in Europe, is a really good option to study medicine 
under a budget. And this is why I created this website in order to allow you to study and have this equal opportunity to actually enter med school. So next year we are going to change the website completely. I'm well aware that the website is a pretty much a mess because I started the website with like two or three topics and then it just kept growing until we have like 300 main topics you should read. So, um, but unfortunately I have to have some budget in order to afford myself to buy the different codes and to rearrange everything. I think some, some of you already saw that I'm trying different stuff on the website. So next year we're going to plan and change the user experience completely. Continue the free IMAT course and provide on the app to remove the ends and provide a lot of questions in different languages. And of course, keep giving everyone the equal opportunity to study for admission exams and enter med school. All right, so before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this session is being recorded. So you won't need to record it or um, just write your notes. Take a paper and a pen, make sure you have it as well. And uh, you will be able to watch it uh, under the supporters heaven on the website, which is a donator only. So if you can't see it, please send me a PM on the website. So we'll be able to open this section for you. It's very important because you will be able to see the anti deck we will provide, the summaries, the PowerPoint, and the recording. So if you want, and if you can see it after this, this marathon, send me a PM on the website. So it will be easy for me to just click, click on your username and assign the donation benefits to, under your name. All right. So as you saw, as, as I explained um, a few minutes ago to the new people who didn't, there are two new uh, options on Zoom, which we host on this webinar, which are different than the regular Zoom, which are Q&A and poll sections. Every time we will answer anything together, you will be able to have this option to answer and we will see and analyze everyone's mistakes and we will see the uh, statistics of everyone answers, so it's very important. So, and it's also very important to sign in for the Zoom section from the computer and not your phone, because the poll is going to take your entire screen and you won't be able to see the question. So if you are not using the computer, raise your hand, so I'll be able to wait five, five minutes to everyone to move to a computer. And if you are not able to use the computer, but only the iPhone or uh, Android device you have, I uh, will make sure to upload the questions to the website as well. But I see, okay, I see one people, two people, yeah, that are not able to, okay, more. So I will wait, um, I will give you two minutes to sign, sign on and turn on the computer and to enter the Zoom uh, using your computer. It's very important. All right. So uh, let's wait a couple of minutes to let them log in and I will keep answering questions now. Which one you think we should last answer? One. The last one? That's all. Is the presentation a little bit blurry or is it like that just for me? Is it still blurry? Uh, can everyone see the presentation? I am showing uh, on the screen. Yeah. Yes. All right. Is it blurry or you can see it? It's clear. A bit blurry. And as, let's say I zoom in a bit, it's better? It's blurry. Clear, okay. So I'm it guessing is. it depends on your internet speed. Um, if we have, a, we use a bigger font because we knew probably people will use a kind of pixelated. Okay, we knew people will have a slower internet connection. So every time you see a question in the future that you can see, just uh, tell me in the chat, I'm seeing the chat, and um, I will zoom in the question for you guys. Don't worry. All right, perfect. Okay, so we are going to start very soon. All right, any more questions? This one is a good one. What was the minimum score last year? You can see on the website a list with the scores. You can um, send me a PM on the website and I will just link it for you. You have a list with all the scores. Sorry. Can you change to the Italian course after? Uh, I'm not really sure, but I think it's pretty difficult. 
uh, you have to wait for a spot to be free. So it means that someone in the Italian course in the university you want to get in um, is not attending anymore. So there is a free spot and you can try to get that spot. Yeah, but I'm it's so always sure. difficult. Yeah, it's very difficult. And I think you have to take the um, test in Medicina as well yeah. anyway. Oh, I think so. Yeah. Um, what is the tuition fee in Pavia? The tuition fee is uh, 4,500 euros at the beginning, but it's based on uh, your IZ, which is documents you bring in order to lower your tuition fee based on your socioeconomical status. Uh, basically, personally, I don't pay tuition fee. And uh, it's very, it depends on your country because I know some countries are just automatically pay like a couple of hundred, mm. which is amazing here. This is the reason to study medicine here. It's extremely cheap. Yeah. Um, anyway, I think the tuition fee is the same in all uh, Italian statal uh, universities. So it's not only Pavia. Yeah. But it varies from um, Napoli, for example, is um, 1,200 a couple of years ago, maybe are not updated, but Pavia is the, um, has the highest tuition mm -hmm. fee. But still nobody pays the entire tuition fee because it depends on the documents you will bring later. What exactly should we send you to get access to the recording? All right. So again, in order to get access, you have to send me a PM, a private message on the website, so I can assign your name to the donators, and then a new section on the website under forms on the new menu will pop up, so you'll we'll be able to see the recording. Ankidex will provide summaries and PowerPoint after this I'm at Marathon. So it's very important. So if you can't see it, the, I will show it again on the screen. If you can't see this one, and you don't have this badge under your name, just PM me, private message me on the website and I will assign your name. Because I think I missed a couple of you when you sent me the emails because there were like so many. So um, if you don't see, just send me a PM. It's important. Last one. Yeah, last one. What topics will we cover? Um, we will cover all the topics. And now I'm going to show the IMAT exam pass paper statistics, which based on the probability of different subject to pop up on the exam, we based our IMAT marathon because eventually we have, we have only one day. So it's important to go and to explain the specific tricks they always do other than the random stuff they usually not ask on. But we will go through almost everything. Okay. All right, I think we should start. So, like I said, we analyzed past papers and we did these statistics for each one based on we are going to do this IMAT marathon. So the critical thinking, usually they ask of uh, drawing a conclusion questions. By the way, the critical thinking is going to be uh, teached by uh, Shalev, which is a native speaker. So it makes more sense to him to explain it. And we are going to give you a trick for each one, which is very important for the exam. And we're also going to provide you some logic questions after this marathon. So as you can see, the conclusion is a lot. And after that is the assumptions and the arguments. So we are going to work on it especially today. But yet we are going to, all the seven subjects, we are going to give tricks. The biology. The biology on the IMAT is pretty weird because if you read the syllabus, it's like reading a syllabus of the entire six years of med school. But actually what they are asked on on physiology and anatomy, they barely ask anatomy, only the very gross anatomy structure of the body, like the position of the diaphragm, lungs, heart, and stuff. But physiology, they are usually asked on muscle physiology, a nephron, female and male reproductive system, brain gross anatomy, and these are the most important stuff to know for the exam. A couple of questions I got is how deep should you study female and male reproductive system and if we have embryology on the exam. So for the female reproductive system, you have to study until the point of fertilization, but we don't have embryology on the exam. Uh, but it's very important to know the female reproductive system and the hormonal profile of the, uh, of the female in depth 
because it's a couple of questions in the past papers was pretty surprising, so it's important. Also metabolism, they say biochemistry, but as we analyzed the past papers, we saw we have mainly carbohydrate metabolism. So we will explain what happened once glucose enter the cell in anaerobic, aerobic, yeast, and all the respirations, including the mitochondria and without mitochondria, lactic respiration, etc. This is the question they also usually ask on because they won't ask you about beta oxidation of fats and um, protein metabolism, but comparing to the NCAT and other exams that uh, people used to prepare for the IMAT, but metabolism is usually carbohydrate metabolism, so it's important. Another very important subject we are going to go through today is mitosis, meiosis, and genetics, and inheritance in general. Uh, they are doing some specific tricks and repeating themselves over the year. So I just um, going to give you those tricks specifically and some skills in order to know exactly how to solve them very quickly. But technology is not something that you are being asked of so much. Uh, maybe one question, even less, like zero questions a year. It's very, it's very rare to see biotechnology. But if you do, you should know the PCR the steps, gel electrophoresis, idea behind it, because DNA is negatively charged, and the bigger it will stay behind. Just I will send you a YouTube video about it, it's very important as well. And basically, that's it. Maybe recombine a DNA with plasmids, but once they give you the question, usually you can solve it without knowing the actual uh, biotechnology behind it, or only the sense behind it. Can you repeat the part about PCR, please? Yes, of course. By the way, guys, because we are non-native English speakers, so if you don't understand anything, just tell me on the chat and I will repeat myself. Sorry about that, but we are doing our best. Uh, okay, so the, the PCR uh, subject, uh, yeah, CRISPR won't come up. No. Uh, it's too much for the exam. Um, PCR, you have the three main uh, steps, like the heating, the cooling, and the heating again. It's very important to know what you're doing in each one. And uh, you have these great YouTube videos about it. It's like three minutes and you cover the PCR. You only have to know the idea behind it. And each three rounds, you, get, uh, you multiply the strengths by a factor of two. So this is the point of it. Also remember DNA replicated by a sem semi-conservative way. So just split the strengths into single strengths and just multiply it by a factor of two. Other than that, the PCR is not being that strong. Okay, and of course, cell biology is the organelles, the membrane, etc. And the cell dogma is when they ask you about the DNA, template strain, coding strain, tRNA, etc. And we will go through it as well. All right, chemistry. They are usually ask you organic chemistry and reactions, and it's a broad topic on the syllabus as well. But for organic chemistry, you should know the basic functional groups and how to nom nomenclature to name the actual molecules. But more than that, to the nucleophiles and the attack of the electrons, you shouldn't really know it for the IMAT exam. It's too much. So we will have a couple of questions as well when we go through and see exactly how to nom and how to name the questions and the molecules. Stoichiometry is subject that pops up in the exam all the time, every exam. You have gas laws, you have balancing equations, and you have a redox reaction under stoichiometry. So it's very important to know those three. We will especially go through stoichiometry, organic chemistry reactions, and chemical bond hybridization. And we will go through the five uh, periodic trends we should know for the IMAT exam. Other than that, you have us in basis and equilibrium, which usually you have one or two questions on, pretty simple questions on the IMAT, only to know the actual idea behind it and not to know the, how to calculate pH with the Ka, Kb and stuff because you don't have a calculator on the exam and it doesn't make sense. Math and physics. Again, it's very broad. They are expecting you to know the entire high school syllabus, but usually once we analyzed all of the exams, the BMAT, the IMAT, the AP and the IB, you can see mainly three topics that pop up over and over again. For math, it's very simple algebra and inequalities and geometry. Once you have two uh, different structures, you need to reduce from one each other in the area. The inequalities, it's pretty simple, only algebraic 
uh, tricks. For physics, in the other hand, you usually have kinematic in dynamics, speed, acceleration, Newton forces, etc. The definition of units and units, which you'd have to know from high school how to memorize all of the different units. So you can't really do it in the next five days. But if you do want to practice a bit of physics and math for the IMAT exam to get a couple of points, if you're not coming from a high school background, I would suggest just going through simple algebra, inequalities, geometry, kinematics, and dynamics. It's very important for the IMAT exam. And for physics, usually you have one electrical circuit question, which you can use using Ohm's law, which is pretty uh, simple if you know math. And you can just calculate the resistance and the flow of the electrons in the circuit. It's pretty easy. And um, if you want to make sure to perfect these areas and to get some extra points, I would suggest that to study electrical circuits, kinematic and dynamics, and those three subjects. All right, so now we are five days before the exam, but you are only going to have four or three days to actually study. So the first one, based on this marathon, you are going to make a list of your weak areas today, and you are going to see, based on past papers and questions, we are going to show you today, which one. Can you repeat what you said about acid and bases? Yes, of course. I said you shouldn't really um, know how to solve uh, acid and bases based on Ka and Kb, the constants, they will only going to give you strong or weak acids to calculate the pH based on the very simple molarity. For example, 0 0.1, 0 0.01, which you can just calculate very easily the pH. At what time will the marathon start? We are going to start it uh, now. I'm going to show the first questions very soon. We are going to go one by one and I'm going to explain some subjects. All right, so I think I'm going to rush a bit. So study and review the material. Don't spend too much time reviewing things you are strong at. A good, usually people like to um, enforce themselves and to make some uh, feel better and to study things that are really strong at. But uh, um, based on the, uh, what I did last year, it's better to um, study the weak areas and to perfect it in order to get these extra points. Um, all right. Oh no, it's fine, Joe. I just, I think I have a timetable and I want to get, make sure because we have, as you can guys see, we have 593 yeah. presentations. So I think I'm going to rush a bit. We have a lot to take care of today. Okay, so gain confidence by answering the questions of this marathon again from the PowerPoint on the Internet School website. And um, this time you'll be able to understand if you did or didn't manage your, uh, and figure out what you should cover and your weak areas. And the day before the actual exam, in my opinion, it's best to not study, to clear your mind, you rest a bit, hear some music, because nothing you will study probably stick to your head the day before the exam. So just relax before the exam and on the day of the exam itself. All right. So a lot of you asked me and still have unanswered questions about how you should approach the exam. So the first thing you should know is you won't be able to solve all 60 questions of the IMAT exam. Never. It's not, it's not an ideal situation. If you did solve all 60 questions, probably something is wrong. So make sure you don't. So uh, figure out which topic you would like to begin with. Usually, it's your uh, strongest area. For me, it's biology. For other people, it could be chemistry. It's usually either biology or chemistry. And then jump from your uh, left to, to the strongest to the least one. It's very important. Can anyone see the text on the font and the font? Yeah, all right, mm -hmm. good. I will zoom in anyway, a bit. I hope I can. So get some confidence by answering the old easy question you used to solve, but also solve your weaker areas and perfect them. All right, 
So the, the idea behind the IMAP is to know how to limit your guesses. For example, I told myself I'm going to solve 40, question, uh, 40 questions and I'm going to guess five of them if I have only less two options because the probability is the statistics is on my side. When you have minus 0.4 and 1.5, it makes sense to solve and to guess a couple of questions, but still only guess when you have two less options and limit your amount of guesses. For example, I chose to limit myself to five guesses and that's it. And I used it on general knowledge. And I scored some. <laughs> Okay, again, so don't try to solve everything and don't be able, like don't afraid to skip questions. If you see a question, like I guess some of you saw the past paper of 2019, <clears throat> you can saw the paper that you had this one question of the beetroot, which has a full paper and it took like five minutes to solve. So personally, I just read it so I don't really understand how to solve it, skipped it, and then I came back to it at the end and actually solved it. So don't try to solve everything and don't be picky on the questions. Just don't be afraid to skip them. All right. So I'm going to explain now my strategy to solve questions using five steps. It's especially important for the native speakers who are used to the old format and um, used to actually skip, just skim through the question and answer it quickly. The idea behind the IMAT is to know to find the trick. So using the next five steps, I'm going to show you how to find the trick and how I use them. So the first one is to read the question itself by after the question, by after the content of the actual question, you have the question itself. Read it first, see what, is the, question, what the question is about. Step two is to read the actual content of the question and then mark important keywords. If you see enzyme names, definitions, tricks you think they are going to ask you and the actual question itself, mark everything. And this is leads us to the step number four, which is to sketch on the question paper as much as you, as much as you can. Because once you see the questions in front of your eyes, it will be much easier for you to find the trick and to solve it. So it's very important. And of course, at the end, we remove as many options as possible. But the most important thing is to ask why you removed each one before you remove it. So convince yourself you are doing it not out of gut feeling, but out of actual focus. Okay, so we are going to have the question number one. I'm going to show a poll on the screen and then we are going to solve it together and to see the uh, statistics of everyone. And then I'm going to show you the steps I just show using this question. So I'm going to launch the poll right now and have like maybe one minute, one minute and a half to solve it. Can anyone see the poll on the screen? All right, okay. I will zoom in a bit. Perfect. That's nice.
All right, so you should see the uh, poll results on the screen now. And like I suspected before, there is a confusion for uh, reading the question itself. So first of all, let's go through the steps we just did previously and see how you should approach this question. So step one is to recognize the question itself, which is which type of bond lists must they both contain? Okay, next, next step is to read the actual content of the question. So ligases and restriction antinuclease are used in genetic modification. This is the content, all right. So as you can see, I just sketch as much as I can on the question paper just to make myself think in templates and not see the general question in front of me. So step number three, find and mark the keywords. So you have the uh, enzymes, you have type of bonds, you have must, which is an important keyword. If you see must, old, don't, typically it's very important keywords to notice and both contain. Now, we just sketched everything on the question. And step five, remove the options from the actual question. So the trick in this question is both contain and not responsible to. So you can see ligas, ligas, which make phosphodiester bond. And you can see from the statistics from the poll, people are, was confused, were confused between A and B because if you didn't use the steps and you saw they're asking you contain and not responsible to, it's very easy, it's very easy to be confused between those two. So the ligas is an enzyme, an enzyme is a protein, and protein contains peptide bond. It's very important to remember. And the question, the idea, the trick behind this question is to just mark the important keywords. And you can see from the poll, a lot of people confused A and B. Okay. Um, D, some people chose D. So a hydrogen bond between complementary bases. Um, enzymes are proteins and you don't have bases, nucleotides in the proteins. That's for DNA. Yeah. Or oh, RNA. All right. So you can stop sharing. Let's keep going. So I want to start with the central dogma of biology, which is very important. So um, we will go through the IMAT past papers, some of them, specific questions. And uh, we will have one minute or two minutes to solve each question. And after each set of questions, we will solve questions together. And we will see using the steps what I did and we sh you should do in order to solve them correctly. And during this uh, one minute, one minute and a half of each one, we are going to keep uh, answering your questions on the Q&A. And we're also going to copy everything to the intermed school area. So let's begin. So we are going to show this next question and relaunch the poll again. So you can have one minute to solve it as well. I can see many, some of you can't read the questions. So I will send the PowerPoint file to the, to the group and open it. So just use it as well at the same time.
on it. It's going to take a couple of minutes, but uh, I'm saying the marathon PDF file to the group so you can use it. So we will share the result now. Okay, so many of you answered it correctly. It's a very basic question, but using the steps, you can see that I mark the important definitions and sketch step four on the actual paper in order to see that I can remove everything and have A. It's important, all right? Oh, okay. Uploading a large file can, okay, I see. So let me find a way to share the PowerPoint with you guys quickly. Let's see if it works. I can do it. Yes. With my router. All I right. disconnected from the Wi-Fi, so All right. I hope the connection will be more stable. All right, perfect. So uh, Sire will send you the file of the PowerPoint to the group. And we are going to wait a couple of minutes to keep going. For the meanwhile, I'm going to share the poll again so we can answer this one. And please don't answer the question on the chat, only answer it on the poll so other people won't be able to see. All right, let's, let's do it. All right, so soon the PowerPoint should be on the group. For the meanwhile, I'm going to end the poll and show you the result. As you can see, there is a mix between A and C. So the answer is C, and I will show you how to solve it right away. It's very important for the exam, and it's a trick they are usually do. So let's see what they're asking you. So the following table shows the transfer DNA associated to an amino acid. So we have the tRNA and the amino acid it's associated with, with which means the tRNA brings an amino acid together 
and you have the anticodon of the tRNA triplets that connected to the mRNA inside the ribosome in order to keep the protein synthesis. It's important that we, we know it by now. So we marked the transfer of the RNA triplet in order to use our steps to find out the reason behind the question. So if we draw the big picture, and this is the first trick, by the way, on the question paper, you can see that tRNA is co complete with mRNA, which completes with DNA. It's very important. So it goes tRNA, mRNA, DNA. But even the DNA, the DNA three to five, the template strand with the mRNA, which is five to three, with the anticodon of the tRNA, which is three to five. So an important trick for the IMAT is to see that the template strand of the DNA is the same as the tRNA, but the only thing that changes is the uracil instead of thymine. It's very important. So the mRNA 5 to 3 will be equal only with the uracil and thymine to the 5 to 3 coding strand of DNA. So we know the template strand is the template to the mRNA, and the coding strand is the other strand on top of the template strand. So usually on the IMAT exam, they will ask you to give them the sequence of nucleotides from one to couple of steps another. It means mRNA to DNA or DNA to tRNA or tRNA back to DNA. So you will have to write all the steps in order to find it. But in these specific questions, you can, yeah, you can just draw a simple one because as you can see, the nucleotides are all different. So you can just use a different amino acids like a specific one in order to solve it, which is pretty one. So to get DNA from tRNA, we just write down tRNA and extend you with T. What I did was tRNA, mRNA, DNA. Okay, so this is the trick. Let me answer it this one. The thing is on the IMAT exam, in order to save time, you have, let me show you the presentation. So we have the steps, we have the trick, we just moved it. And you have the template strand three to five, which makes the mRNA five to three, which attached to the tRNA three to five again, which means the tRNA and the template strand of the DNA equal to each other only with uracil instead of the thymine in the tRNA because it's the same direction and you just replace it twice. So it's complementary to the another one like the mRNA, the tRNA. So the tRNA will be equal to the template side of the DNA. It's a very important trick. So instead of going one by one by one, you can just jump. But it's important if they ask you about the coding strand, the template strand, and the direction. In future uh, presentation, I will show you the exactly how to recognize the DNA and the tRNA strands. All right. So before we continue, I would like to give you an, another question. So please take another one minute, one minute and a half to solve it. You can uh, stop sharing the poll and uh, run another one. Wait, I need to see. Oh, sorry. All right.
All right. So um, I will share the results now. And you can see that the answer is A. And using the five steps we just used previously, you can check the um, trick in this question. So if we go one by one, you can see that they are asking me about mRNA and about thymine. But what do we know about thymine in mRNA? Is just thymine is, was replaced by uracil, which is very important to remember. So the question, the answer is A. And this is again an, another example for the find the trick inside the question using the five steps. So if you do and write the definitions and mark all the definitions, you can remember that mRNA is, wait, well, it's RNA, so you will see it instead of timing, and then you mark the answer as well. It's so, it's a very important thing to do. And then once you delete all the other options, for example, I just delete uh, 37, I ask myself, why did I do that? Because, mRNA doesn't contain timing, for example. So make sure to use those steps and to find each one has its own trick. So try to dig and find the trick they are ask you about. Okay, so what do we know about RNA? It's a single strand, it's U, in, U instead of T. So once I do next to the questions and sketch and wrote what I know about RNA, I can answer it. Why did so many choose 37? I think because they confused and forgot that uh, thymine is not in mRNA and they only give you the amount of nucleotides to confuse you between double strand and DNA with the um, completing nucleotides for the two strands. So it's very important not to confuse, not to be confused because it's a good one could you please talk for a moment at the end of the presentation? I have a lot of questions about this. Yes, of course, don't worry. At the end of the presentation, presentation we are going to go through everything, of course. So um, the idea is a good question to see. They are going to always give you the answer you think is right, but it's not right. So they always will give you the question, the option to choose which was correct if you did it in the other way, which, you, cho which uh, you shouldn't choose. So it's a good example. They usually do it. This is why I highly encourage you to ask yourself why this one is correct or wh why this one is not correct and to dismiss it. And to, of course, draw as much as you can on the question paper, because this one is an example of, of what I would do on the actual paper. I would remember what RNA is, even if I think it's very basic, it's important to actually draw it and see it. All right, so let's recap the third one for Joe's as well, you asked me on the Q&A, so I'm going to recap it now. So we know by now that DNA turns into mRNA and mRNA is complete with tRNA. That of course holds the amino acid to make the protein itself. And the trick Cambridge loves to to do is to skip the steps. For example, what is the tRNA that you get for the coding state of the DNA? So a very important thing to remember is to not forget to check and write all the steps between. And if you are comfortable enough just to skip from the tRNA to the DNA coding strand and the mRNA, sorry, the tRNA, tRNA template strand and the mRNA, mRNA coding strand from five to three and vice versa. And to remember while also remembering the direction to five prime to three prime. So it's very important. The next question is going to be about this. This time, try to, you know, Josh, don't worry. I'm just, I'm a bit nervous. So I'm still not used to the chat and the, to talk as well and to talk in English as well, because it's new to me, all this stuff. So it's all good, don't worry. I'm just a bit nervous about this and excited. So uh, I will show the next question and uh, we will do it together after, but this time, try to actually use the five steps and each time remove and each time you remove tell yourself and ask yourself why you removed it all right so you can see the calling strand template strand the five to three five to three they are equal 
and 3 to tRNA, which you can see here. So these are equal, you only get uracil, and these are equal, again, uracil. It's very important. So make sure to remember the, the 5 to 3 and the actual coding and template strands. All right, so let's solve question number five together. We're going to share the poll again. <laughs> All right, guys. So let me share the results. So the answer is A. And uh, yes, Paris, you are absolutely correct from the chat. They want you to be stressed and then to speed pick the actual answer that is not correct. This is why they actually show you the wrong answer as an option to choose from. And this is why you should add this extra step in order to actually find the question. So it's important. And can you repeat what you were saying about the five to three? Yes, of course. So they usually ask you about the direction, which is five to three or three to five, which is the phosphodiester bond, of course, with the ribose. And they're asking you about the direction which you can write the nucleotide sequence, which means if they would give you in the past question, the same sequence, the same sequence, but up opposite, and they would ask you from five to three or three to five, they could give you the exact same nucleotide sequence in another options, option that is opposite, but it wasn't correct. So you have to make sure the five to three and three to five is also correct. And where you can find it, you can find it in the actual coding and template strand because the coding strand completes the template strand. So it has to be five to three and the complete strand will be three to five because it's not five to three, both of them. They have to complete each other. So once you use the template strand to make the mRNA, if the template strand is three to five, the mRNA must be five to three. And the tRNA, which you can see after, is also anticolon three to five because it completes with the mRNA. So the opposite way, it's, it's not correct. So make sure to know which way you are looking for. So in the next questions, you're going to see. Could you explain the start and stop coding questions too, if you don't mind? Yeah, of course. Of course. The one with the 60 minus three minus three. So you had 60 nucleotides 
And we know that start and stop codons and codons in usual are three nucleotides. So the gene itself, once you put aside the start and stop, which you have to have, are 54 nucleotides because it's 50, 60 minus the start minus the stop, which is 60 minus three minus three. It's very important to remember. All right. So in this question, we saw that you have DNA, plasmin, and a single restriction enzyme. A single restriction enzyme works on a specific sequence of amino of uh, nucleotides, which means it must be complete to the strand above. It has to be. So first of all, we have to dismiss all the all the answers with you, because you don't have you in DNA. So you can just B, C, and E. Then you have E and A, which are, like I said, just previous, previously, just opposite directions, which is very important to remember. So DNA plasmin is a circle, which means one, two, three, four, and five will completely be attached to A, A, C, G, A. So you can see if you take A, it completely fits to complete the circle of DNA, five to three on the template and three to five on the coding strand. It's important to remember as well. All right. So we can see we dismissed those answers. The trick, remember plasmids are circular and they did it a couple of times. On many exams, remember that plasmids are always circular. So if they give you, for example, restriction enzymes on a couple of points, you probably know the questions I'm talking about. And they ask you which point they, they cutted the plasmid, remember it should be complete into circle and not a strand of DNA. All right, let's do another question. All right, perfect. So I can see many of you got the question correct. So let's go through it quickly and skip to the next one because many of you got it correct, so good job. Let's go one by one using the steps I just told you before. All right. So first of all, like always, we mark the important definitions, always. Now you can see Phosphodiester bonds are between the nucleotides. 
So one and five are not, not two. So you can dismiss row one and row five. Okay. So you have tRNA, which has, of course, sorry, pentose sugar, because you have nucleotides pentose sugar. It has adenine as a nucleotide. It has hydrogen bonds, of course. The phosphodiester bonds we said between the nucleotides and not uracil, which is also important to remember because why? It's RNA. And this is why I asked myself, why am I dismissing this answer? Because you don't have a uracil in DNA, sorry. And in tRNA you do. And the question is, in both pure exact of DNA and tRNA, tRNA. So don't mix the two. All right. So this is why the row four is the correct answer because you can find the phosphodiester bonds, the hydrogen bonds between the complete, the complete, complete stems, adenine as a nucleotide and pentose sugar as the ribose that connect the nucleotides, of course, with the, the oxyribose and the ribose itself. All right, and uracil because DNA doesn't contain uracil. All right. Let's continue to the next question and continue to mitosis and meiosis. This is not an IMAT past paper questions, it's from the IB, and, but I took it because it's a very important question for the IMAT exam, because it represents the vast majority of tricks they are going to show you during the IMAT exam. So I'm not going to show you the answer immediately. I want to teach you how to find it first, and then we will go back and see how we are going to solve it again. All right. So as you can see from the stats, the answer is C. And it's an important trick, but let's learn how to actually do it. All right, so mitosis and meiosis and some more tricks. So you should know by now the actual steps of mitosis of meiosis. So we are not going to go through it today, only just a quick recap. But an important stuff that Cambridge loves to ask about is the number of chromosomes and chromatids that present during the various stages of meiosis and mitosis. So chromatin is the general packaging of DNA around the histones and the proteins. It's important to remember those definitions. During mitosis and meiosis, chromatin exists is an additional level of organization known as chromosome, which means by definition, 
chromosome is the most compact way to compact the chromatin and the genetic material in general. It's important to remember. And this is another trick you should know. So chromosomes can exist in the duplicated and the unduplicated states, mitosis, meiosis, etc. So first of all, during the S phase of interphase, the genetic material of a cell is duplicated. A human has 46 chromosomes, of course, a set of uh, 33 maternal, 30, 23 paternal. And after the genetic material is duplicated and condensed during prophase of mitosis, there are still only 46 chromosomes. So each contain two sister chromatids. So the chromatids are connected with a single centromere. We can count the number of chromosomes by counting the number of centromeres. So this one is an important thing to remember for the IMOT exam. You have two sister chromatids connected by a single centromere, which means you have a single chromosome right here. But as soon as they are separated, you will have chromatids by their own with their own centromeres. So now you have two chromosomes. We will see it in the future, but remember it as a trick for the IMOT exam. So after a duplicated chromosome splits, the chromatids are considered chromosomes because you have one centromere for each chromatid. All right? So you can see in this table that all the time you have the same amount of chromatids, but as soon as they are separated in the anaphase, you have the double the amount of chromosomes, but still the same amount of chromatids. Of course, you can memorize this table and it's very important to know the number of chromatids comparing to number of chromosomes. Right. So what about meiosis? Do we have the same one in meiosis 1 and meiosis 2? We will see it right now. So the genetic material of a cell is duplicated, of course, during the S phase, just, right, just as mitosis. So you have 46 chromosomes and 92 chromatids during prophase 1 and metaphase 1. So those chrom uh, chromosomes are not arranged in the same way in mitosis. They are now arranged in tetrads. But yet, those tetrads are lined up in the same metaphase plate, as you probably remember by now. So as you can see from the picture, these chromosomes are not arranged in the same way as mitosis, rather than each chromosome lining up individually across the center of the cells but you have homologous pair of chromosomes lined up together, forming the tetrad. Between the tetrad, you have a protein complex connecting them together, but you still have two centromeres, which means you have two chromosomes, which is extremely important to remember. As long as you have two centromeres, you will always have two chromosomes. All right, so as you can see, two centromeres win two chromosomes, but we have four chromatids. All right. As soon as you reach to anaphase one, which only separates the homologous chromosomes, neither the chromosomes number or the number of chromatids changes. Why? Because only the complex between the chromosomes disappears, but you still have the same amount of centromeres. So even metaphase one, anaphase one, same number of chromosomes, same number of chromatids. You see, same amount of centromeres, so same amount of chromosomes. Another good trick to remember, and very important one. All right, so after meiosis one, the cell will go through meiosis two. And meiosis two is very, very similar to mitosis, because now you have sister chromatids, separated, so you have double the amount of centromeres, therefore you will have double the amount of chromosomes in each cell. Let's see it. So meiosis 2, of course, is similar to mitosis, yet the number of chromosomes and chromatids is half. Let's see it in the table. So 
meiosis one, which we talked about previously, 46 chromosomes all over the way until you have cytokinesis, which split, split the cell into two. So we have at the end 23 chromosomes, but the chromatids will stay the same all over until of course cytokinesis, 46, 46 chromatids. Then you have meiosis two, which is very similar to mitosis, but as you can see, you have the exact half of mitosis, which means because we have one N at meiosis two, it means 23 chromosomes, 23. Then you have the separations of the centromere. So we have 46 and 46 for meiosis two. This is the reason you can go for two N for two cells of a single N, then to four cell of a single N, because you have the separations of the centromere into two centromeres, therefore you have double the chromosomes that can rearrange into the four cells. It's very important to remember, all right. Of course, you can use this table and memorize it for the AMT exam, all right. So let's practice some questions now, now after we know. And of course, if we can go back to the actual question, so I can see in the chat, many people are not sure about the answer. So let's go through it quickly. Mm -hmm. All right, so you can see the central muse over here, which are connecting the sister chromatids. You can imagine the protein complex between the two and the four chromatids, but you have two chiasmatas and two chromosomes. It's very important. Why you have two chromosomes? Because you have two centromeres and you have two chiasmatas because you can see two chiasmatas from the picture itself. This is why the answer is C, all right? And yes, Stephanie, chiasmata is not the result of crossing over, but because in the picture we could see it because it's the physical link, you can see how many chiasmata you have. Right. So I'm going to show you now uh, 10 questions, uh, sorry, three questions, which we are going to solve together after the five or six minutes try to use what I explained right now to apply to the three questions. All right, so question number eight, nine, and 10. Perfect.
we will have a break very soon after a couple of more questions, like uh, 20 minutes, I think. Don't worry, guys. But uh, this mitosis meiosis part was very important because the idea to know and to differentiate between the number of chromatids and chromosomes based on the number of centromeres is very important because uh, on the IMT exam, this is the tricks they always do. So make sure uh, to follow it. All right, so let me share the results with you guys. Perfect. So question number eight. Yeah, perfect. I see many of you answered correctly. Question number nine was a bit tricky. So we will explain the confusion very soon. And question number 10, it's a hard one, but uh, we'll explain it as well. All right. So before I'm going to explain the questions, let's just quickly recap the what we know about mitosis and meiosis and about the cell cycle itself. So the cell cycle is a course before the M phase. Of course, it's part of the cell cycle, but you have G1, S and G2, which are very important to remember. At G1, you have the cellular content that duplicated the organelles and the cell growth. But at S phase, you have the actual chromosomes being duplicated, the genetic material in this case, because you still can see the chromosomes. And at G2, you still you have the cell check for duplication errors, making repairs, and still go a little bit and go the cellular content again. All right. So important checkpoint to remember is near the end of G1, at the end of G2 and 2 transition, and during metaphase itself. So the cell checks that all the chromosomes are aligned together and nothing is disconnected from the kinetochores and centromeres. All right. So we are talking now about the interface, which is G1, S, and G2. The steps of mitosis, of course, we have in prophase the breakdown of nuclear membrane, chromosomes condense, so we will start to see them, centrioles migrate to the opposite sides of the cell, and the mitotic spindles appear. Prometaphase is when the microtubules attach to the centromeres on the kinetochores, of course, which is a protein on the centromere for the imant. All right. So the metaphase is the chromosomes align along the equatorial line, which is very important. Now you have the separation of the chromatid, which means you usually in mitosis and meiosis too, you have the double of the chromosomes in anaphase. And then telophase, you have the microtubules that disappear and the nuclear membrane reforms again. And of course, cytokinesis. Now you have this important difference in cytokinesis because in animal cells, you have something called cleavage follow, but you don't have cleavage follow in plant cells. And it's another good trick for the animal to remember because you have this ring, the cleavage follow, that eventually will split the two, have the two cells, the cell into two cells, but plant cells will also have this one cell into two cells, but they don't use the cleavage follow. They have something called cell plate. All right. So let's go through the questions we just answered. So DNA condensations happens in prophase, separations of chromatids anaphase, removal of centromeric cohesin anaphase, fragmentation of the nuclear envelope of prophase, and DNA duplication happens in S phase, the interface. All right, now nine was a bit tricky, so let's go through it. Which of the following occurred during interface in a human stem cell? This is an example of information. They just add you extra, which is not really necessary for the animal because you know it's a somatic cell or even if it was not a somatic cell, a germ cell, still those processes will happen in specific time in the cell cycle. So you can answer the same thing by reading it by here anyway. They usually will do it with liver cells, sperm cells, testis cells, human stem cells, you will see it all over, but usually you can answer it without knowing the exact definition and role of this specific cell. So DNA replication is S phase, mRNA synthesis is G1 phase, and cytokinesis is of course the end of M phase. 
So you have one and two correct. The last one is anaphase, and it's a very important question. So let's look at the question itself and think and assume what we are going to see here. So when do we know the DNA and the genetic material will duplicate? During S phase. And what do we know happens after S phase? G2 and then M mitotic phase. So we'll have this one as our mitotic phase. So all the processes of the R phase of the meiosis or mitosis will happen during R to S. And then you have the cytokinesis, which then splits the cells into cell into two new cells. So you have here the cytokinesis, and now you have still a single genetic material other than the duplicated one. So does the IMAT ask about prometaphase or just prophase and metaphase? Mm, they can ask you about prometaphase, pro, uh, but they will condense it together with prophase as one. Mm, but it's, it's good to know. Like you shouldn't know the five steps of prophase one by names, but you should know what happens in general in those five steps in order to go and to understand what actually happens in prophase one. It's good to study it as well. But in the next five days, don't study new study material. All right? So let's now try a new question when you actually understand now how to divide the cell cycle and the end phase. All right, I see that almost all of you answer it very quickly. So I can also see that many of you want me to explain question 10 again. So let's do it quickly. Okay, so the idea behind the cell cycle and the M phase is in S phase, in the interphase, is where happened the double, the duplication of the genetic material. So if you have the quantity of the DNA on a graph, the only place you will see the duplication of genetic material is during interphase, S phase. So you can see it over here. And then immediately after the S phase, you will see the G2 and mitotic phase, which were the anaphase, uh, prophase, metaphase, everything occurs. So you will see it right after, which are R to S. And then you will see the division into two new cells from S to T, because you have cytokinesis. So now we go from the double amount of nucleotides, the double amount of genetic material into one back. And then we have a new cell cycle over here. All right. So let's have another question.
I will answer 11 after a couple of questions and then we will go through everything together because the next few questions are very similar to each other. So it's important to understand the topic first and don't worry, we'll go through everything. All right. So yes, guy, the quantity of DNA doubles, but the number of chromosomes, as long as you have the same amount of centromeres, it will say the same amount of chromosomes until anaphase. It depends if mitosis or meiosis too. Yes, it's important. And increasing this graph means double amount of nucleotides, the genetic material in general, so once you hit cytokinesis, you will have the half of the graph itself. But this is why you didn't see the um, half of the graph after anaphase, it was in cytokinesis. Because still the genetic material inside the cell is the same until you hit cytokinesis when you have two cells. All right, so let's solve now the questions. After this one, let me run a new poll and we'll uh, solve the three questions together.
All right, perfect. Let's recap quickly meiosis as well, because we did mitosis, and then we will answer the <coughs> question number 11, 12, and 13. So meiosis is divided into two main steps, meiosis 1 and meiosis 2. So we already know how to calculate the amount of chromosomes and chromatids in each state, but let's go through some very important steps in meiosis as well. So a crucial point during meiosis 1 is prophase 1, of course, when you have all the important stuff occur. You have the prophase, the chromosomes start to condense. Let me zoom in a bit. The complex, the protein complex we talk about that separate during anaphase is also starting to build. You have the crossing over, the chiasmatas, and the prophase that ends. Those are very important steps to remember. You shouldn't memorize the name of the steps for the IMAT exam, but knowing that you have five steps during prophase one, it's very important to actually memorize and helpful to memorize the five steps. So of course, like I said, remembering this name is not necessary, but you should memorize the events. Okay, so let's check the answers. So 11, the centromeres divide. In meiosis 2 and mitosis, the chiasmata I call in zico 10, which is prophase 1, and the chromatids are present in lepto 10, which is also prophase 1. So we have 1, 2, and 3. For 12. All right. So you have two pairs of centrioles at 1. But don't confuse them with centromeres and centrosomes. It's very important to know. So one tetrad for each allele is not correct because you have the tetrad that represents both alleles for the mater maternal and the paternal, which we can see at number three. Two pairs of each allele, which is of course in meiosis one. So one and three is correct. And those are very important tricks to remember. So you should differentiate between the centrosomes and the centromeres, and you should differentiate between how many amount, what is the amount of alleles in the tetrad, which is of course two alleles because you have the paternal, paternal and the maternal. It's very important as well, all right? So 13, semi-conservative replication of DNA always occur in A space. Lining up of the chromosomes at the equator of the cell is metaphase. Increase in cell membrane for cytokinesis. This is an important one. The increase of cell membranes happens during the interface. You have the cell organelles that grow. You have the actual cell membrane that grow in order to prepare for the end phase and cytokinesis. But you don't have it usually for the AMAT exam during the actual end phase. So this one is interface, G1, G2. DNA molecules are moved by spindles fibers. It's the definitions of anaphase. Also, it's a good one to remember as the definition of anaphase in one sentence, all right? So let's try to solve those two next questions. I will show you the poll right now. Mm -hmm. Five. Five, yes. So use 25 as 14 and 26 and 15, because there is a typo in the poll. So 25, 26, just 14 and 15. There is a typo in the questions. Question number 25 on the poll means 14, and question number 26 means 15. So use it uh, accordingly.
All right, perfect. So now we have another question. You can solve it as well. Let me share the next question. All right. All right, so I think this one is a crucial question to go through because most of you answered A, but actually the answer is C. So um, let's discuss it again. It's a very good trick for the IMOT exam. So primary oocyte mean the first step of meiosis, which means you have to end at the beginning, then you have two cells with N, and then you have four cells with N. All right. You are being told that you have 64 chromatids at this stage of meiosis. So it means you have half amount of chromosomes. Because do you remember that I showed you the table? That means you have 46 chromosomes and 92 chromatids, and then you go into half, but the chromatids stays the same. So in this case, you have 64 chromatids, which means you have 32 chromosomes, which is your N, which means if 2N equals 32, so N equals 16. And it's a very important thing to remember. So the answer is C. All right, so let's read this question. You have the DNA present during G2, and you are being asked what is the amount of DNA, the genetic material in general, present in metaphase two, which means half Y, because you have two cells sharing the same amount of DNA you had previously, so you have half of the amount of DNA you had in the first cell. Let's say you have one here, then you will have half and half. So is your answer. This one, most of you got it correctly. So if the elephant n 2n equals 56, it means the number of chromatids is doubled, which means 112, which you can see from this table and you should absolutely memorize this table. Mm -hmm. All right. I can see a lot of you ask me about question 12. So during the break, we will go through question 12 again. 
And if you need anything that from the previous questions as well, just write on the chat, in the chat. So we will do it as well. But this one is very important trick to remember. Once you have X amount of chromatids, you have half X amount of chromosomes. You can see it here and here. But as soon as you have the, double the amount of cetromeres, you will have equal the amount of chromosomes against chromatids. But at the beginning for this metaphase, 112, and in general until the end. So remember this table for the AMP exam. All right? So you can see a um, quick example from the table from spermatogenesis and oogenesis. We will, we will go through it in the future, but now you should know you start from 2N at the stem cell, then you have the stem cell 2N gives you two cells that equal 1N, and then you have four cells that give you 1N. And if you have 64 chromatids, you will have 32 as your 2N. Because half is the amount, half the amount of chromatids, amount the, of chromosomes. Perfect. So you can also look after and see the amount of N and compare it to the chromatids on its stage, stage. And you should memorize this table as well. It's a really good one. All right. So let's have a break. Great. So if you have any question, it's your time now on the actual uh, chat. And I want to repeat some question. How long is the break? Um, let's say 10, 15 minutes, depends on the amount of questions we will have and we will repeat some stuff because I guess not all of you uh, completely understand me because of my amazing English skills. So uh, let's go through it again. Um, so question number 12. Perfect, all right. So we can see that between prophase and metaphase of meiosis one, when we still have the chromosomes and chromatids, everything correctly until the end, we have two pairs of centrioles. Do you remember that? Let's say this is your cell. You have centrosome that contain a pair of centrioles on each side from which the microtubules go outside in order to attach to the actual tetrads in this case. So don't forget to remember what is centrosome, centriol, centromere, chromosome, and chromatids. It's very important because they know it's very confusing, so they are going to confuse you over those words. So let's do, do it again um, slowly. You have a centriol, which two of them equal to a central zone, which is your microtubule organization center. You have the chromatids, which and two of them usually during mitosis equal to a chromosome because you have a single centromere between them. So the, all of those are very important to remember. So chromosome equal a single centromere, chromatid equal a single sister chromatid or a separate chromosome with one centromere. Centrosome equal the mitotic uh, microtubules organization center, which contain two centrioles. All right. So you have two pairs of centrioles. This is correct because this is the microtubules going out from one tetrad. This is correct. But for each allele, it's not correct because the tetrad equals two alleles because the genetic material in meiosis and mitosis is for two alleles if it's a dipole, it means the maternal and the paternal. So you have to, the tetrad, the tetrad is the two chromosomes, homologous chromosomes that come in together with a complex in order to be separated eventually into half an amount of chromosomes because you have the preparation of sex cells. So you have to attach them differently. So you have this complex of two homologous pairs, which gives you a tetrad out of the row tetra, which is four, which means four chromatids. But you have 
two centromeres attached. So it means two chromosomes, like we said. So you have alleles, two of them, and you also have, so one is correct. So this one is not correct because you have two alleles and two pairs for each allele. This one is correct because you have these pairs inside for each allele. So one and three. So yes, one tetrad for each two alleles because in general, in dipole animals, you have two N, which means two alleles, one paternal, one maternal. And eventually you want to reduce it into one N, so you have to use it in pairs, in tetrad, other than mitosis, which you just duplicated into two N as well. So we can say two alleles equal four chromatids and one tetrad. We can say two alleles equal four chromatids equal one tetrad in meiosis one until anaphase, because once they are separated, the complex is being separated, you don't have the tetrad anymore. You just have homologous pairs that are no longer attached to each other. You still have the same amount allele and chromosomes and chromatids in this exact cell until you have cytokinesis, which will split the two cells and then you will have just the same as mitosis. But you still have two alleles in this new cells, the maternal and the paternal. Can we say alleles are visible? Chrom chromosomes are visible, but the alleles, it's the actual DNA sequence, so it's not visible. Aren't the alleles in the tetrad at four? They are not four, because they are only a mixture of the paternal and the paternal. They are new, but they are still called two alleles, but uh, recombinant alleles, yet two alleles. All right. Can you tell us about ogenesis? Yes, of course, we have ogenesis um, a few hours in. Don't worry. We will go through the female reproductive system and the male reproductive system as well. So are the centrioles in the centrosome are visible? Uh, yes, under an electron microscope, you can see them. So yes. So if the question is asking about visible structure, why is point three correct? It's not visible as in under a chromosome or in the naked eye, but it means what you actually have inside a cell at this exact moment. So one allele contains two chromatids. Uh, you have a limb recombinated between the homologous pairs. That means you have an homologous pair which recombinant with another. And now the alleles are different, but you still have the same one on the homologous pairs. In the end phase of meiosis 2, the chromosomes are aligned at the center and didn't yet split. The answer is actually diploid. So the thing is about meiosis 2 is it's very similar to meiosis 2, but because you are only having one end at this stage, let's say you are in a human cell, so at this stage you will have 23 chromosomes and not 46 chromosomes, but you still have this half of the amount of chromatids. I know it's quite confusing. This is why I added all the tables to the actual PowerPoint, so you can uh, skim through after the marathon, but these are the tricks that they are always asking you on the IMAT because they are not the centrioles, centromeres, centrosomes, chromosomes. People are always mix them up, so it's very important. All right. Can we read do question 14? Yeah, why not? Let's do it. All right. So if in a diploid cell, the amount of DNA present during the G2 phase, of meiosis is equal to Y. It means G2 comes after S phase, which means you have now Y as your double amount of DNA. So the cell is ready for M phase. So what is the amount of DNA present in each cell after F? Because you cytokinesis it. So we have now F amount and half amount of genetic material. What is the difference between the centromeres, centrioles, and centrosomes? All right, <clears throat> let's get ready to explain. Okay, centromeres 
are the protein that attaching two sister chromatids together. A single centromere means you have a single chromosome. Centrioles are the structure you can find in the centrosome, which is your microtubule organization center, which the microtubules are going out to attach as spindles to the actual chromosomes. But you have two of them, the centrosomes, and inside each one you have two centrioles. All right? So you have centrioles, you have centrosome, you have chromosomes, you have centromeres, and you have chromatids. Any more questions? Yes, sir. Can you explain again why the alleles are visible? They are not visible. They are just exist in the, um, what they are asking you about because they didn't ask you visible in the naked eye or under electron microscope. They just ask you visible as persist inside a cell at this exact moment. Um, an allele is a variant of a gene. So you cannot distinguish genes between the, in mm -hmm. the chromosome or in the chromatid. That's why you can, allele are not visible. Yeah. You have to sequence the DNA to actually know where are the genes, so where are the alleles. Yeah, exactly. Can you please go through the cow question again? Yes, of course. It was a good one. I think it was the only question um, people got wrong because the rest is, was like 90%, but this one is a very good one. Okay, so a primary oocyte, and we will talk about it later, is the first stage of the actual meiosis of the oocyte. Eventually, it will be an ova. So in meiosis, in general, at the beginning, you have two N. And from the table I showed you a, pre a previous slides, you can see that two N, number of chromosomes, means you have double the amount of chromatids because you have 60 more, 64 chromatids that aligned in sisters, which have one centromere in between, which means you have the half amount of chromosomes. Because like we said, we count the amount of chromosomes using the amount of centromeres. So now we have 32 equals 2n. And then we skip, you keep going to the meiosis 2, and we remember that meiosis 2 is n and n, which means n equals 16 because it's half of 32. All right. Any more questions? Or you want me to repeat some question you didn't understand? All right, so let's take an actual break of a couple of minutes. And um, we will keep going to the next one. By the way, guys, thank you for being so supportive on the chat and on the Q&A, because it's the first time I do this live streaming stuff and everything. So it's very new to me, but it's very important to me to go and understand all of them and all of the tricks on the IMAT, because I know many of you will score a few points more only from this marathon, because as you can see, some of those tips and tricks are just being asked all the time. So thank you again. I'm going to take a couple of minutes 
and um, I will be come back and then we will do respiration and um, like what is this?
All right. Yes. So if you are here, please raise your hand so I can see everyone is here so we can continue. Perfect. 13. Okay, so we still have some people that are not here, so we'll wait a couple of minutes and um, let's see if we have any more questions. So general knowledge part, all right. So what we did, of course, we are going to talk about the general knowledge part as well at the end of this uh, playlist, this uh, marathon. And um, we analyzed all of the exams, including the Italian version of the exams. And we saw this uh, common de denominator between all of them that is they are asking about specific things all the time. So uh, I made this uh, 500, 600 cards anti deck based on all past papers, which, which uh, you can find on the donators only subject and um, on the website. And I would like to, uh, for all the new people that joined, um, if you don't have this contributor uh, badge on under your account name on the website, you won't be able to see the actual uh, recording and everything. So make sure to private message me on the website. So I will add you this badge and you will see all the materials we worked on today, including the PowerPoint, the chat and everything. So we can revise everything until in this four or five days until the end exam. All right, so again, if you are here and just join, raise your hand using this feature on Zoom. This is a nice question. I can't help but to feel like I'm going to fail. Um, do you have any advice for motivation? Yeah, all right. So it's a good one. Uh, personally, uh, what I did in the last two weeks before the actual exam was completely disconnect myself from the social medias. And I felt like it was resetting me because the WhatsApp groups are all, everyone is so stressed. So it's very easy to feel like you are going to fail because of the stress of everyone. So it's good to take a step away from all the social medias and just relax a bit and you will see you have much more motivation on the IMAT uh, day itself. It, it really helped me and I think it will help you as well. All right, so let's continue. How long do you have to provide DOV to university? I think this year it's going to be a bit longer than usual. Last year it was a month. I believe because of COVID it's going to be a bit more like one month and a half, two months. But don't worry, because uh, we are currently in Pavia. So if you need our help or uh, any, anything from us, just tell us and we will go to the university for you and we will do whatever you need to do. It's very important to do everything on time, especially in Italy when everything <laughs> takes so long. So it's important. Okay. So just ask us and we will help you. All right, so let's continue. So uh, the second part I would like to talk about is uh, cell biology respiration. Uh, on the IMAT exam, they are going to ask you usually 99% of the time about carbohydrate metabolism, which is usually what happens when glucose enters the cell under different situations. Aerobic respirations, anaerobic respiration, fermentation, ethanol respiration, alcoholic fermentation, etc. So we are going to skim through and recap the study material and then we are going to do a couple of questions in order to make sure you understand this carbohydrate metabolism. And let's begin. Okay, so we are going to solve some challenging questions. And then after solving the questions, we are going to actually understand what we did using the previous uh, slides. Okay. So, all right. By the end of this section, we should cover almost all the metabolic pathway we should know for the actual respiration for the IMAT exam. Of course, there is they are saying on the syllabus biochemistry in general, but you should know specifically specific metabolic pathway and not the entire metabolic pathway, of course. So it's not very, it's low yield to study everything. So you should only focus on carbohydrate metabolism, in my opinion. All right. So I want to start with an actual question. It's first to see what is the general, like where the wind is going. And then we will go to actually study the study material. All right. So I'm going to relaunch the poll now.
Yes, it is the website logo. I just it was the first edition of the shirts I made a few months ago, and then now we are thinking about actually making some merchandise. So we will update you later. But this one is the first edition I have for a long time ago. All right, so let me share the answers. And yes, the correct answer is B, but I see some confusion between A and C. So we will study some metabolic pathways and then we will go through the question again to make sure to see what exactly is going on. And um, thanks for the compliments about the shirt, guys. Yeah, and uh, when will the marathon material will be avail available to us? Immediately after, I'm going to download the recording and edit it a bit. And also, I'm going to share the study materials we just prepared. I guess today, maybe two, three hours after the actual marathon. But in order to see it again, please send me a private message on the actual Entermed School website, and I will make sure to assign you to the donator only sub forum. It's very important. All right. So let's have another question before we answer this one. All right, so let me share the results. As you can see, there is some confusion between B and D. B is the right answer, but um, I will do my best to explain all the different parts of this question soon in the respiration itself, because it's crucial for the element. So let's start. All right, so I would like to give you a couple of more questions to solve again, so I can get an idea about what should I teach first? So let me share again a few questions. You can skip the old one. You will see there are a couple of them. So 19. Every two minutes, I'm going to skip to the other uh, question, but make sure to use the steps we used before in order to solve them perfectly. And we will actually get into metabolic pathways very soon. Yes, 
You can uh, write your answer from question 18 um, in order to complete this poll, but it doesn't matter. You can just pick whatever you want in order to complete this poll. It's fine. Just start from 19. And uh, in a minute, I'm going to skip to the next question. So I just want to see the statistics of 19, 80, and uh, 21, 20 and 21. And uh, Veronica, the flashcards are the flashcards I posted a few months ago. They were like 11,000 of them, but we made them only 500. So it's, it's more highlight for the IMAT in the next five days. Makes more sense. All right, so I'm going to skip now for the next to the next question. Yes, I you can just put a random answer for 17 and 18 because I already saw the statistics for the previous ones. All right, 20 seconds, and I will move to the next slide. Yeah, no 80, no 20. Might be a mistake. Yeah, 19. There is no 20, so just pick random, random answer on 20. Don't worry about it. All right, so I'm going to move to the next slide. Twenty is missing. Uh, I think I just by mistake maybe skipped a number, so don't worry about it. Just do a random uh, answer to twenty. Pick a random answer, and as well for uh, eighteen and nineteen because we already did those, so we can uh, solve the rest. Uh, please raise your hand if you want me to move back to the. 
question number 21. All right, I see many ones. So let's move again and solve it. All right, perfect. So let's start to solve and actually study what we should know for the metabolic pathways for the AMP exam. All right. So first of all, we have glycolysis. Once the glucose enters the cell, it will most likely, if you need glucose available to the cell and energy, will go through glycolysis. Glycolysis is the most, I think, the most ancient metabolic pathway, and it is found in the great majority of organisms alive today because a lot of them, the vast majority, use glucose as energy. So glycolysis is divided into two steps. The energy requiring phase, when we use ATP, and the energy yielding phase, when we get ATP. For each glucose molecule, we invest two ATPs, and then at the end, we get four ATPs. So glycolysis also requires NAD plus in order to keep oxidizing some metabolite inside glycolysis. So you always, you, are, you have to get NAD plus to keep glycolysis in order. So without NAD plus, glycolysis will stop. Okay, so assuming we have a cell, and we need, a, we need a way to get glucose in the cell. So we have something called a GLUT receptor. You don't need to know the different kinds of GLUTs, just need to know you have a receptor, a protein, that takes glucose from the outside and take it inside. As soon as glucose enters the cell, you have a phosphorylation glucose uh, process on the glucose. So now we have a glucose with a phosphate group on, on top. So we invested one ATP in order to phosphorylate this glucose. Then we have a series of reaction, which at the end of them, we will get two three carbon metabolites with a phosphate group on them. The second phosphate was acquired by another ATP. So we invested another ATP. This is the energy taking part. Now you have the energy yielding part. Each one of those will go into the glycolysis to the, until the end, and you will have NAD plus that will turn into NAD. H reduced NAD plus, and you will also get two ATPs for each molecule at three carbon that go through the other steps of glycolysis, which means glucose at six carbon will give you two times this amount. So eventually you will get a net of two ATP, two pyruvates, which are just a three carbon metabolite that you get at the end of glycolysis, comparing to glucose, which is at six carbon, and two NADH, which you will have to find a way to oxidize back to NAD plus in order to keep glycolysis running. When we have oxygen, this NADH will most likely go to the mitochondria, to the Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain. When we don't have, assuming it's an animal cell, let's say a muscle cell, this NADH will take this proton and two electrons, which is the part you see here, 
the reduction part, and it will put it on the pyruvate. Once NADH unload the electron, the two electrons and the proton, which is the H, into the pyruvate, you get lactic acid. So we just talked about between aerobic respiration, once you have the NADH go into the mitochondria, or anaerobic fermentation respiration, once you have the NADH unload the proton and two electrons on the pyruvate in an animal cell. The pyruvate itself, which is the end product of the actual glycolysis, can go into different places. So this is glycolysis, it's glucose 6-phosphate. This is the name of the product we get once we phosphorylate glucose once it enters the cell. And we have all the steps here of glycolysis and we get the pyruvate. For the IMOT exam, you should remember the three following pyruvate phase. In aerobic respiration, it will enter the mitochondria and it will create acetyl-CoA using another number of uh, processes once you have oxygen, this is one. If you don't have enough oxygen, it will, the NADH, in order to be NAD plus again, will put the proton and two electrons on top of the pyruvate and it will become lactate or lactic acid. Or if you have yeast, for example, you will create ethanol, which is a double carbon with OH, you will release carbon dioxide, but you also, on the way, you will get NAD plus again, because you have to regenerate NAD plus in order to keep glycolysis going. There is no situation when you can keep glycolysis without NAD plus. So it's crucial to have pyruvate turn into different stuff to keep glycolysis going and NAD to become from NADH to NAD plus again. It's very crucial. All right. In aerobic respiration, if you have enough oxygen in the mitochondria, pyruvate will enter the mitochondria through a specific shuttle, and in the inner membrane, you will have this protein called pyruvate dehydrogenase. You don't need to remember the name, just remember it has a protein in the inner membrane of the mitochondria. Pyruvate dehydrogenase role is to take pyruvate, which is a three carbon compound and to make it into acetyl-CoA, which is a two carbon compound connected to a CoA, which is a coenzyme. All right, so once pyruvate answer, enters through this protein, you will get the release of carbon dioxide because the third carbon has to go somewhere from three carbon to two carbon. So the carbon dioxide will be released and as well, you have the reduction of NAD+. So if you have a single pyruvate, you will get one carbon dioxide and one NAD plus reduced NADH. If you have two pyruvate, which are the products of a single glucose, you will have two carbon dioxide and two NADH. All right? So raise your hand if you are following me because it's pretty important, I can return back. All right. Good. Yeah, I can see almost all of you raised their hands. Perfect. All right. So for the people who didn't raise their hand, you had pyruvate, which we had to take to somewhere. In this time, we had enough oxygen, so you can put the pyruvate inside the mitochondria. In order to put it inside the mitochondria, we move it through a protein called pyruvate dehydrogenase and from, as the name suggests, dehydrogenase. He takes the hydrogen, put it on NAD+, reduce it, and you also get carbon dioxide as a metabolite, an extra product, because you need to take the three carbon pyruvate and to turn it into two carbon acetyl CoA. So eventually remember the products, two carbon dioxides from two pyruvates, and two NADH from two pyruvates, a single glucose, all right? Once the, let's assume this is the mitochondria and this is the inner membrane and PDH was here. 
we are inside of the mitochondria and we have a process called the Krebs cycle. Now, each acetyl-CoA, which we just received from the PDH, is going through the Krebs cycle to produce the following. Each one, two carbon dioxides, a single ATP, one FADH2, which is a similar molecule to NAD, and three NADH, which is extremely important to remember. So for the IONOT exam, you should remember the products, not the enzyme names of glycolysis, PDH, and the Krebs cycle as well. This molecule, this, and this one, and this one, are coenzymes and electrons carriers that can take the electron to the electron transport chain, which we will see in a minute. But just memorize the following table in order to remember how many NADH, FAD, ATP, and carbon dioxide do you get from each acetyl-CoA, and you double it when you have one glucose, because you have two cycles for each one glucose. So it's important to remember. All right? So once you have the electron carriers, which in our case are NADH and FADH2, you can take the electrons and shuttle them into the electron transport chain. In the electron transport chain, you have a sequence of different proteins when you can unload the electrons and the proton and the power of the electrons, once they go down to the last one, give the protein enough energy in order to take protons from one side to the other side of the mitochondria, which will create an unbalanced proton gradient. So once the, each electron is going through and jumping from one protein to another, it will release energy because it's going down its energy levels until it will reach protein number four, when it will meet oxygen. And using this reaction, we will get as a product water. But the proteins are using the electrons from the NADH and FADH2 to pump protein against the gradient into the intermembrane space. And what do we know once we have a lot of protons in the intermembrane space? You will have one, a charge because it's proton, which is positively charged. And you also have a pH change because protons are the definition of the acidity. So it's more acid here and it's more charge here. So in order to balance it, the protons will want to go back into the matrix of the mitochondria. But the inner membrane is not permeable to almost anything. So the protons will have to find a different way in order to come back to the matrix of the mitochondria. Our solution is to take the protons and to move them into ATP synthase. Once they move through this protein, which allows only the proton to pass through, it will spin, generate enough energy to take ADP and to create ATP. If you follow me, raise your hands. <laughs> All right, perfect. Okay, okay, good. Because it's pretty complex and I know it's a lot of stuff if you hear it for the first time, but it's important. So we had glycolysis to NADH, two ATPs for each glucose. Then we pass through the pyruvate dehydrogenase in order to enter the matrix of the mitochondria, more to NADH and carbon dioxide. Then we had the Krebs cycle in order to generate more electron carriers, more carbon dioxide, ATP, FADH2, and NADH. It's very important. Memorize the amount of products you have from each part. And electron transport chain, once we use those electron carriers, we take them to electron the electron uh, shuttle and the e ETC, we move them, it will release enough energy to charge those protein in order to take protons from one side to the another side against the gradient, because it's against you have to invest energy. The energy comes from the electrons. And the only way 
for the protons to go from one side to the other side is through the ATP synthase, which will allow us the rotation of it, allow us to take ADP and to regenerate ATP, which is our energy of the cell. All right. Now we can answer the actual questions. So a sample of mitochondria was isolated from an animal cell and provided with a substrate its enzyme can act on. Which of the one of the following reaction would not be able to take place? Which means which of the following metabolic pathways occurs outside of the mitochondria? So we said decarboxylation reaction that produce carbon dioxide, it's the PDH, because decarboxylation is once we take a carbon and we do take carbon for the pyruvate and we make carbon dioxide out. So we make acetyl CoA, which is a two carbon. It's a decarboxylation process. So we have decarboxylation. It happens in the inner membrane of the mitochondria. So it's not an answer. The phosphorylation of glucose happens once glucose enters the cell. So because it's not happened in the, it not happens in the mitochondria, this is our answer. C, the oxidation of reduced NAD, it's very important. NADH goes into the mitochondria, unload the protein and electrons into electron transport chain. So this one can occur inside the mitochondria. The formation of acetyl-CoA, the same, it's PDH. So it's the same one, the decarboxylation reaction occurring and you get acetyl-CoA. Also the dehydrogenase reaction in order to charge the NAD plus to NADH. And the synthesis of ATP from ADP and organic phosphate is the ATP synthase when we saw here, which is of course inside the mitochondria. All right. So which one of the following produces pyruvate during respiration? The cytoplasm itself, because the phosphorylation of glucose occurs inside the cytoplasm. This one can confuse you as I was talking about the GLUT receptor, but the GLUT receptor only facilitated the diffusion of the glucose into inside the cytoplasm. And with a different enzyme, the glucose is being phosphorylated but this one doesn't phosphorylate it. So don't mix between the two. The phosphorylation happens inside the cytoplasm. So it can be in the nucleus, not in the mitochondria, and not in the raffia. So B is our answer. Okay. Photosynthesis in green plants include which one of the following? Fermentation, it's animal cells. Glycolysis, it's not photosynthesis. Oxidative phosphorylation, inside the mitochondria, not related to photosynthesis, the Krebs cycle inside the mitochondria again in the matrix, and the Kelvin cycle, which you have to know for the IMAT exam, as well, only the products, NAD, NADPH plus and ATP for you get from the um, reactive, the Kelvin cycle and the dependent light reactions, you should memorize them as well. So we know the answer is E, because it doesn't happen in the mitochondria. It happened in photosynthesis. It does. And 21, which one of the following are final products of glycolysis? So we get ATP and pyruvate. We don't get NAD, we get NADH, which have to go to the Krebs cycle or to the fermentation. And phosphorylated triose is an intermediate, like we said, in glycolysis in the middle, but it's not the final products. So four and two, all right. So this one is very important. You get two and a half ATPs for each NAD, H, you take into the, into the electron transport chain. This is ju just a general thing you have to know. Let me show you the electron transport chain again. This one, NADH will give you two and a half ATPs for each one. FADH2 will give you one and a half ATP for each one. And you will get one molecule of water as a final product. So I just added this picture for you to memorize and know exactly what happens. So you can see FADH2 launch two electrons to house number two. And NADH will launch two electrons to house number one. 
All right. If you follow me, raise your hand. <laughs> Perfect. All right. If you want me to repeat something, please say it in the chat. It's very important. I will again say it from the beginning. It was pretty quick. Why only one water and not two? Because you have half oxygen. It's a natural state of oxygen, which you eventually will get you O2, but you use half oxygen in the reaction. You can see it here. So once you use half oxygen, or it means just oxygen by itself, you get a single water for each coenzyme electron transport you unload onto an electron transport chain. The last thing about the numbers, could you explain H2O again? Why two and a half ATP, the Krebs cycle said two? It depends. Some books say three ATP, some books say two and a half ATP. So it's very different. But um, the common idea in the books, in the Pearson, Cambridge and stuff, it's two and a half ATP for each NAD and one and a half ATP for, for each FADH2. Because if you think about it, FADH2, put the electrons later on the transport chain. So because you are only starting, not from the beginning, from, but from the middle of the electron transport chain, you have less power of the electron because it will have less levels and less opportunity to go through to share its energy. So this is why you spend, you get only one and a half ATP from FADH2 and two and a half NADH from NADH2. ATP, sorry. All right. one H2O for both or each one, you can see here, the reactant happens when NADH and FADH2 combine together. And you have this shuttle that takes both electron for NADH and FADH2 together. So eventually you will be able to use two electrons at each time to get H2O. Because if you think about the stoichiometry of this equation, you have H2O, a single oxygen. So in the other side, you have to react with a single oxygen. So it's half H2O, which means just O. So two protons, one O, two electrons, one water. It's very important to remember this equation. NADH is reduced NAD plus. Yes, Maya, NADH is reduced NAD plus because the H, the proton, comes with two electrons. Look exactly, one and a half ATP for each FADH2 and two and a half ATPs for, N for NADH, exactly, perfect. It's pretty complex, but it sums up everything you should know for metabolism for the amount. The number of ATPs, the proteins, the electron transport chain, uh, glycolysis products, PDH and Krebs cycle. All right, if you want me to explain anything else, just this is your time before I move on to the more questions or next subject. Sure, Omar, you can ask. In the Q and A. All right, so eventually, using the ATP synthase from the power of electron transport chain, the common idea agreement is that you produce from a single glucose 32 ATPs at the end, comparing to only anaerobic respiration, where you get only two ATPs. So you can see the difference between two ATPs and once you have oxygen, which is 32 ATPs, it's extremely different. Can you repeat the numbers again for FADH2 and NADH for water? Of course. So if you can see, let me delete some of my mess. All right. So NADH unload two electrons to the electron transport chain, as well as FADH2 unloads two electrons to the electron transport chain. 
they will shuttle through the different proteins. You don't have to know them for the IMAT until they will reach house number four. At house number four, you have oxygen waiting for you. Once you have protons and electrons reacting with oxygen, you get water. But for each one, each single water, you have to take only two electrons and a single water because water contains only a single oxygen. So at the end, you will have two protons react for a single oxygen with two electrons to get water. This is why from a single NADH, you get a single water molecule. All right. NADH is oxidized on the electron transport chain. Oxidation is the loss of electrons. Because you have one proton but two electrons, NADH is reduced, it's NAD plus reduced. You put those electrons on the electron transport chain and you get NAD plus, which is oxidized NADH because you remove the electrons. Is it a single water molecule also for the FADH too? Mm, I think so because it's two protons, yeah. Two electrons, it's the same because you need for the two, two electrons for the stoichiometrical equation for the H2O. Also in the glycolysis, two water molecules are produced, right? In the middle, yes, but it's not necessary for the IMAT exam. They never asked on it. Do you mean Krebs cycle or ETC? No, the Krebs cycle, wait, for one Krebs cycle, one water molecule is made and two are consumed, therefore an eight water molecule is one, this. Yeah, perfect. I can't follow the chat. Yeah, it's like oxidation is losing, reduction is gaining electrons. Perfect. The thing about Paris, the thing about this question is that it asked the electron transport chain. So in my opinion, and uh, size as well, they are talking about this reaction when you get water from the actual electron transport chain at the end. All right, I think we can continue. Yes, of course, Paris. In my opinion, because they are talking about the electron transport chain, because the end product is water as well, just the net water production. Yeah. Yes, exactly, Jacopo. Yeah. Yes, exactly. It depends on the amount of NADH because usually one Krebs cycle gives you three NADH and one FADH2 but they are talking about a specific single NADH. So it will give you this equation because a single one gives you two electrons and in order to get water, you have to put two electrons. So at the end, the products are H2O with half oxygen. All right, perfect. So we answer this, 19, 20, yeah. All right, we finished. So we will take a couple of minutes off and then we will start physiology and we will solve some questions from past papers from BIMAT, IMAT and IB as well. All right. In question 22, does the number of ATP molecules produced matter or affect the answer? No, it isn't, only the water because it's you should know the number of ATP from each NADH and from each FADH2, which is two and, a, two and a half and one and a half. So it's important. So we are going to have a 10 minute break now, and then we are going to continue to physiology. And if you have any more questions, just write them on the Q&A. I will do my best to answer all of them. So one mole water molecule, you get two electrons from each FADH or NADH. In order to create 
water from oxygen and protons, you have to reduce it with two electrons to get H2O. So because NADH or FADH2 gives you two electrons, at the end, you are going to get a single H2O molecule on the electron transport chain from two electrons. All right? Do we need to know about the Calvin cycle and, and the uh... light dependent reaction? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, you do need to know about the Calvin cycle and the light dependent reaction. Uh, in the Italian admission exam that was taken two days ago, there were a couple of uh, questions about plants, Calvin cycle, and in general about plants. So uh, technically, two different organisms are writing the exam. The Cambridge is mm -hmm. different from the Italian government, but this might be the new tendency of this era. So uh, I think it's a good idea to revise a little bit of that. Yeah, absolutely. You do need to know the light independent reaction, which is the Kelvin cycle, of course. Why does FADH2 gives a lower ATP generation than NADH? Because it unloads its electron in a lower state on the electron transport chain. So the electrons have less, let, let's just say it unloads here, but, but NADH unloads here. So you have less potential you can take from the electrons. You have less direction. So it means less ATP production. Then we have question 22, please. Yeah. And they also want you to repeat the what did your friend say topic this year Sorry. to revise for. Um, there were two, uh, a couple of questions on the Italian admission exam of this year, which, is, uh, which took place a couple of days ago, about the plants. Um, the Cambridge assessment is writing the IMAP, uh, which is a different organism of, from who is writing the Italian exam. Mm -hmm. But still, it can be the new tendency of this, this year. So I think it is a good idea to revise the plants, the Calvin cycle, light dependent reaction, yeah, and stuff like that. Yeah, it's a good idea. All right, so let's have a couple of minutes off. And it's now 1 p.m. at 1 and 10 minutes, we will come back. All right.
All right. Okay. So let's start again. If you are there, if you hear me, if you see me, please raise your hand. Nice. Okay. So I'm gonna teach the next part, which is the first half of physiology. The second half will be teach by Ari. Uh, now Ari will be doing what I was doing. So answering questions, taking control of the poll and stuff like that. This is my very first time teaching for such a big audience. So I'm pretty nervous, but I will do my best. Please, oh, my accent is very bad. My English is what it is. <laughs> so if you don't understand me, if you don't hear me for anything, please um, write on the chat. So I saw that there were a couple of questions about the Italian exam. The Italian exam is made by the Italian government while the IMAT is made by Cambridge. So they are two different organisms. Uh, despite that, the content is pretty similar. Um, for example, I just studied mainly for the Italian exam, but also took the IMAT and passed it. So um, the content is more or less the same. It is different logic and critical and um, general knowledge. But for example, biology, chemistry, math and physics are really similar. So I suggest you, if you find any uh, Italian past papers, to study on them as a, use them as a simulation. And we will publish as soon as possible yeah, so the we, paper of this year, translated. So we have some more questions to welcome. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's start with the nervous system. We will start with a question. Um, this might be a quite difficult question, but let's try it. Let's see if you get it right. I am opening the um, IMAT group chat so we can talk on it. Also, I'm using the mic now. All right. Okay, so most of you guys got it correct. The answer is D. Uh, but first, let's get to uh, the nervous system in general. The nervous system can be divided into somatic, uh, which is uh, the voluntary system, uh, like muscle contraction, contracting a bicep, or walking, or touching something. Um, and we have, of course, the efferent part, uh, from the brain to the muscle and uh, from the muscle to the brain, uh, which is the sensory part. Um, so what you feel. Mm. And then we have the autonomous nervous system, 
which is from the brain to the organs, uh, the involuntary organs, for example, the heartbeat, um, respiration, digestion. The autonomous nervous system is divided into three uh, subsystems. The first one is the sympathetic one, uh, which is the stress response, fight or flight. Basically, everything that happens in your body when you're chased by a lion. So the heartbeat rise, um, more oxygen is delivered to the brain, muscle contracts, uh, and so on. The parasympathetic system instead is rest and digest. So everything that happens when you're not chased by a lion. Uh, it's homeostasis control, it's relaxation, digestion, uh, defecation, sexual ar arousal. And finally, we have the enteric nervous system, which is the most particular one of the three. It's a semi-autonomous system, which means it's not completely autonomous, uh, and it, is, uh, it consists in a series, series of nerves and plexuses that are found between the walls of the digestive tract. So it regulates um, contraction of the digestive system, um, secretion, um, there's a hormonal control, blood flow control of the, digestion system, of the digestive system. So um, the nervous system can also be divided into central nervous system and peripheral, peripheral nervous system. Let's see, this is a human body. The central nervous system is the brain, but not only the brain, also the spinal cord. While the peripheral nervous system is from the spinal cord or from the brain to the organs. So all around the body. I think you should zoom in a bit because some people say it's a bit blurry. Okay. All right. Like this. The red one, the brain and the spinal cord are the central nervous system. Remember that the spinal cord is part of the CNS. While the nerves from the spinal cord to the body or from the brain are the peripheral nervous system. An important difference between these two systems is that the central nervous system is myelinated. Some nerves of the peripheral nervous system are also myelinated, but most of them are not. Um, so uh, when the impulse, uh, let's say we want to contract a muscle. We have an impulse from the brain traveling to the spinal cord, and then it switches and it is the, the impulse is passed to another nerve of the peripheral nervous system, the green one. Um, there are many ways of transmitting the impulse from the brain to the effector organ. In the somatic nervous system, this one, it's a direct connection. So there is a nerve passing from the brain to the spinal cord, and then uh, one from the spinal cord directly to the muscle, to the myoneural jun junction. Same for the sensory nervous system in uh, still the somatic system. So in this case is from the muscle in this, di in this direction, um, the nerves goes into a dorsal root ganglion and then it directly passes uh, to the brain. What is a ganglion? A ganglion is a collection of cell bodies. So it's like a relay station. And we, found, we find them in the autonomous system. In the sympathetic nervous system, the fight or flight reaction, we uh, find a ganglion uh, very close to the spinal cord. They form a, ch a chain that is parallel to the uh, vertebral column. So from the brain to the spinal cord, from the spinal cord to the but, uh, to the sympathetic ganglion chain. And then another nerve enters here, exits, and goes to the effector organ. The important thing is that this ganglion is found near the spinal cord. So the pre-ganglionic fiber is very short while the post-ganglionic fiber is very long. 
The opposite happens in the parasympathetic nervous system. So we have from the brain to the spinal cord, then from the spinal cord to a ganglion, which is very close to the effector organ, we have a long preganglionic fiber, and then another exits from this uh, ganglion uh, to the effector organ. The postganglionic fiber in this case is very short. So let's see our options. Um, the first one is, I don't think that this exists. In the B, this is clearly a somatic motor fiber because we have just one long fiber from the spinal cord to the effector organ. From the, for C instead, we have from the organ towards the brain, the central nervous system, and we see a dorsal root ganglion. So it is a somatic sensory fiber. The D, this is the correct answer of the question. We see from the spinal cord through the ganglion, which is very close to the organ, and then the postganglionic fiber. This is a parasympathetic fiber. The last one is a somatic sensory fiber from the organ towards the brain through a dorsal root. Um, Actually, the E is same as C. I'm sorry. Would you mind uh, zooming in a bit? Because some people have no connections. Okay. Perfect. Can All you right. see it now? Yeah, good. good. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. All right. Let's move on. Next question. If everyone, if anyone can see the question, just raise your hand. We will zoom a bit more. Yeah, okay, so we zoomed in a bit more, all right. Great, I'm going okay. to share the results. Mm -hmm. right. Great, um, the correct answer is B. Most of you get it correct. Even there is some confusion with A. 
But before that, I'm going to answer some questions. So can you read them to me? Yeah. What is the difference between a dorsal and ventral root? OK. So in this picture, you can see this is, um, OK, this here is part of the spinal cord. Here you can see a nerve exiting from the spinal cord to the, um, to the muscle. And uh, this is the... You have the motor neuron, yeah. this one, mm -hmm. right? This one, and for sensation, the, the dorsal one. one. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so the motor one is the ventral root, while the sensory one, this is exiting, is the dorsal root. Um, basically, sensation is coming from the behind. dorsal. Yeah, exactly. Uh, while ventral. Dorsal. Sensation is entering from behind while um, the impulse from, for muscle contraction are exiting from um, ventral root. Yes, you also should remember the ganglion itself. You can see it in the dorsal section. It's very important to remember because you can see it on the actual drawing yeah. of yes, the no. question itself. So it, this is the division between the dorsal and the ventral. And dorsal is usually for the back, ventral is for the inside, like dorsal, ventral. Yeah, it's a good way. Uh, there was a question about myelination. Mm -hmm. The central nervous system is entirely myelinated. It means that nerves are covered by a myelin seed. Uh, and this means that the propagation of the nerve impulse, which we will see in a moment, is um, saltatory. So mm, let me draw it here. Sorry. If this is a nerve, those are the myelin sheets, and there are some spots like here where the nerve is not covered by myelin sheet, and this is where the action potential happens and is propagated. Um, in the peripheral nervous system. Most of the fibers are found, are found like this, so not covered by myelin sheet. Um, the action potential has to travel all this way to get propagated. Why in the central nervous system, the impulse is much, much faster because it just has to do this. It's important to remember that the myelination caused the speed of the actual transmission. There were a question about it in 2011. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And right. this is saltatory conduction. Where in the body is not myelinated uh, in most of the peripheral nervous system. Yeah. So dorsal is afferent, yes. Uh, it gets sensory um, data yeah. from the body. Mm -hmm. And you could see in the reflex arc, for example, you had some questions. They were asking about the reflex arc. You could see the sensory, once you hit something hot by mistake, the dorsal root got it. Then it was transmitted between this part. Can you highlight this one? You have a neuron yeah, you can in the middle. Yeah. And then the ventral root immediately used the skeletal muscles in order to move from the hot part but it wasn't transmitted into the brain. It was just moving from the dorsal sensory, CNS, and PNS again to the ventral. So this interneuron connects the uh, afferent to the efferent system. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, and meaning is a component of meaning. Yeah, yes. he's explaining. Thank you, yeah. Paris, for the explanations. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yes, Abdul, a reflex, I just gave a general example. When you don't have the CNS to go into your brain, just in an aff afferent stimulus, let's say you touch something hot, you have an interneuron in the middle with two more dendrites to get and to send new uh, neurotransmitters. Then you get the efferent one that's going to go to the muscles to move your hand as soon as possible from the actual danger. So if it was moving to the, to the head itself, to the brain and then back, it would cost more time and you wouldn't be able to actually survive the situation. 
So this one is the reflex of, and it was asked a few times on the amortism, just an example. So we have the dorsal and ventral. And no, you also have sensory neurons in the autonomous nervous system, of course. Um, sensation, autonomous sensation includes, for example, the blood pressure, um, how much oxygen there is in the blood, this kind of um, sensation to control the, how your body is doing. Yeah, and so reflex arc in form of dorsal roots. There are dorsal roots and ventral roots together because the ventral roots are going to control your muscles and the dorsal are going to sense the danger. And you have an intermembrane in between inside the CNS itself in order to transmit it from the dorsal to the ventral as soon as you can. You don't want to go up the CNS and to tell your brain what is going on. It happens anyway, but you move your hand before, before you can think about it because you have this intermembrane in between that immediately um, cause the ventral root to move the muscle from the danger. All right? Good? Okay. So most of you got the question number 24 correct, so I'll be very quick. But first, let's see how the nervous system, uh, how the nerve impulse um, is propagated. So this is a drawing of the cell membrane. Uh, this is out and this is extracellular and this is intracellular. The resting potential is minus 70 millivolt. It means that the inside of the cell of the neuron is negatively charged. Along the membrane, we have many uh, ion channels. When the stimulus comes, um, the sodium channels opens. And we have a depolarization until minus 55 millivolt. The sodium channel opens, so positively charged sodium channels flows in like this. So the membrane inside that was negative is less negative. From minus 70, it goes up to minus 55. This is called the threshold level because uh, together with these uh, sodium channels, we have voltage-gated sodium channels. Voltage-gated channel means that it is a channel that opens only at certain voltage levels. In this case, uh, those channels open when uh, the voltage is minus 55 millivolt, so at the threshold level. They open and a lot of sodium ions, positively charged, charged start to flow in and the membrane inside start to get more and more uh, depolarized. We have a lot of positive charge until we reach the polarization peak of plus, plus 30 millivolts. And this is called the action potential. Um, to remember which ion, we have sodium and potassium here, which ion, ion flows in and which flows out. Uh, nice mnemonic that I use is nine, count. So sodium flows in and potassium flows out. We'll see this in a second. When we reach the action potential, the polarization peak of plus 30 millivolt, we have two events occurring. First, the closing of the voltage-gated sodium channels, so the sodium doesn't flow in anymore. And then we have the opening of the voltage-gated potassium channels. So the potassium that was inside starts to flow out. Positive, charge, positive uh, charges are escaping from the neuron. So in, the membrane inside starts to get polarized, starts to get negative. And we have actually a hyperpolarization until minus 90 millivolt. You can see that this is uh, below the resting potential of 70 millivolt. This happens for uh, one main reason, and it is to make the propagation unidirectional. It means that the membrane is too polarized uh, to restart the cycle. Uh, it, the neuron cannot, be, um, cannot receive a nerve impulse right after it has just received one. There is sometimes, uh, this is called refractory period, where if, even if you give an impulse, 
the neuron wouldn't uh, won't receive it. Um, the other uh, the other event that causes that makes the propagation unidirectional is that also the sol the voltage gated sodium channel uh, are not able to reopen uh, after they are closed. They are they're closed, not right after. So there is still this refractory period where they are closed, they cannot reopen um, until we reach the resting potential of minus 70 millivolt again. The propagation is unidirectional because after closure, the voltage gated sodium channel cannot reopen immediately. And this is the refractory period. And it is saltatory. It's what I explained with the myelinated axons. In the central nervous system, the conduction happens only at the nodes of Rambia. So it's not along the whole nerve, but it's only along the nodes of Rambia, between the myelinated sheets. So let's answer the question. The first that the first event that happens is sodium ion diffuse into the axon. Then the inside of the axon starts to be more positively charged than the outside. We have the opening of the uh, sodium uh, of the yeah uh, sodium voltage gated channels. Then we have uh, then we reach the action potential. The sodium voltage gated channels close and the potassium voltage gated channels open. And then the axon becomes hyperpolarized until it reaches uh, the resting potential again. Mm -hmm. Good. So next question. These are two questions, yeah. 25, 26. Maybe try to focus even more to zoom in. Yeah, perfect. Can you see them? Okay. Can everyone see the questions? Yeah, all right, perfect. I'm going to give you an option to answer them. No, all right. Let's do it in like uh, three and a half minutes. Mm -hmm.
All right, so we are going to share the results and we have some questions to answer before we proceed. So Guy asked if the action potential is unidirectional. Okay, so you have many types of neurons. You have bidirectional neurons and a lot of different stuff. It's very complicated and you can get the action potential start from a specific point of the neuron and to go to two directions at the same time. But for the IMAT level, you should know it starts from point A and finish at B. Also, it's very important to know that once the threshold, the minus 55 milli millivolt was hit, the voltage gated ch uh, channels will keep going until you reach 30 millivolts and it's only binary completely, it's one direction. So you can stop the action potential in the middle until it's completely stopped and only then you can start a new one. So action potential are very binary, it's either zero or one once it's reached and it can be, can't be on top of each other. You can't have a couple of action potential on the same time. It's only binary, zero or one. So it's very important for them as well. Mm, let's see more questions. Theoretically, can the action potential travel the wrong way? I mean, like I say, you have some types of neurons, but... Yes, but yeah. you don't have to know it. Yeah, it's knowing the types of cells, the bipolars, mm -hmm. it's way too much for the IMAP. So saying the, um, it's the wrong way, it's a bit complicated. So can you explain the values between which the yes. refractory period takes place? Yes, of course. The refractory period is between, let me show the graph, uh, is here. From the hyperpolarization to the resting potential. So from minus 90 millivolts to minus 70 millivolts. This is the refractory period. Mm -hmm. When it's at minus 70 millivolts, it's again here. So it means that it can start a new, a new cycle and it can receive a new impulse. Before that, even if you give a new impulse, um, it won't happen anything. Yeah. Could you please explain acetylcholine, please? Yes, the questions you mean. Yeah. Of course. Uh, but first, we will answer to the no, it's not this one. Sorry, yeah. we will answer to the first question, number twenty-five. Mm -hmm. So we've seen how the potential gets propagated; is propagated along the neuron. Let's see now how, from one neuron, it passes to another neuron. Um, the space between one neuron and another neuron is called the synaptic cleft or the synaptic bottom. So we had uh, the positive charges of the action potential traveling along the neuron until they hit uh, this, uh, calcium, uh, these calcium channels, voltage-gated calcium channels. So when, plus, uh, when the membrane around this channel becomes positively charged at plus 30 millivolts, they open and they let uh, calcium ions in, as you can see in the drawing. Calcium ions in triggers um, neurotransmitter vesicles that are stored here in this region of the, of the neuron. Uh, the neurotransmitter vesicles bind, with, uh, bind to the calcium start a process called exocytosis. So they start traveling towards the end of the neuron until they, um, and then the vesicle, like, um, diffuse with yeah. the membrane. Diffuse mm -hmm. with the membrane, so the neurotransmitter in this case is acetylcholine, but it doesn't matter, um, gets released into this uh, space. Yes. The neurotransmitter travels through diffusion, diffusion until the second neuron, uh, and it binds to these receptors on the other neuron. The receptor or the target cell. The receptor is uh, also an ion channel. So when they bind, they, uh, bind to the uh, neurotransmitter, they open and they let positively charged ions in, creating again an action potential that will diffuse with the same um, in the same way that we've just seen. 
So the answer, what channel plays a role in the release of neurotransmitters into the synaptic cleft is clearly the T voltage-gated calcium channels. What about question 26, the acetylcholine one? It is very important that after a neurotransmitter molecule has been released by a postsynaptic receptor, uh, is quickly removed or chemically inactivated to prevent constant stimulation of the postsynaptic cell. This is, by the way, what happens when you do drugs. Um, you are constantly giving neurotransmitter to your receptors so that they get kind of used to them and they don't react anymore. That's why it is crucial uh, to remove the neurotransmitter. Otherwise, the second neuron or muscle or whatever is constantly being stimulated. Mechanisms of removal are several. Actually, I don't think you have to know them uh, for the IMAC. This was a question that I took from the Humanitas exam, which is very similar to the IMAC, but it was kind of tricky. Um, anyway, we have diffusion, enzymatic degradation, which was the correct answer for acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is degraded into acetate and choline. We have more common the reuptake of the RAN neurotransmitter. This is the case of norepinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin. So it is taken back into the axon terminal to be reused again uh, at the next impulse or removal by astrocytes. Mm -hmm. That was the answer. Okay, if the nervous system is clear, we will, I'd like to move into the skeletal system. Let's see how the impulse is transmitted from the nerve to the muscle. All right, so before I start this poll, do you have any question, guys? Let's see. All right, so we can uh, continue to the next question. All right, let's share the results. Yeah. Good. Um, before answering the question, again, let's get to what happens inside the muscle. We, uh, so we saw until the, when the acetylcholine is released into the synaptic cleft. Um, 
This is in this picture, you can see myofibrils. Those are the red ones are myofibrils. Um, this blue one is the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is the endoplasmic reticulum of the muscles. And calcium ions are stored inside it. The T tubules, this structure that you can see here, are a prolongation of an invagination of the cell membrane. They are very important because when acetylcholine is released into the myoneural junction, um, they bind to receptors. The receptor are ion channels, they open, so positive ion starts to flow in, not in them along the uh, cell membrane here, but also they travel along the impulse, travels along the T tubules. Um, between the sarco uh, between yeah the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So uh, when the sarcoplasmic reticulum is stimulating by this action potential by these positive charges, um, it releases calcium ions. Calcium ions is the key actor of the muscle contraction. Um, in the, inside the myofibril, as you know, we have actin, this is actin, the pink one, and myosin. Um, imagine like a person pulling a rope. The myosin is the person pulling, the person stays still, stands up and doesn't move, and the actin is the rope. The rope is pulled, so it gets moved. Um, the myosin, though, cannot bind directly to actin to pull it because the actin is covered by this, the tropomyosin, this line here, that covers all the binding sites of the actin to the myosin. The tropomyosin is bind to the actin and also to the troponin. The calcium ions released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum because the action potential um, traveled along the T-tubules so the calcium ions binds to the troponin. The troponin, these ones, the troponin are bound to the tropomyosin, and when they bind calcium ions, they move. They move, um, discovering and exposing the binding sites of the actin of the, to the myosin, these things here. So calcium ion binds the troponin, the troponin moves the tropomyosin, Binding sites are exposed. Myosin can bind to the actin, to the binding sites. And then we have muscle contraction, like a rope that is pulled. So the correct answer was C. Um, this question was very tricky. You have to read very car careful because the names are very confusing. In the first A, we have calcium ions binds troponin. This is true, causing the movement of the tropomyosin, yes, and exposing the binding site of myosin to actin. This is not correct. The binding site of the actin. Remember, the myosin is the person and the actin is the rope. Second one, tropon, um, calcium ion binds actin. This is very false. C is the correct one. Let's see B. Calcium ions bind tropomyosin. No. Calcium ions bind troponin. Um, calcium ion binds tropomyosin. This is again E also is false. Myosin mm -hmm. binds to the binding sites of active. Yes, so you have this troponin. Yeah. Imagine you have like two hands, three hands of the troponin. One of them is holding like waiting for the calcium, and the other two hands are like holding the actin and the tropomyosin. Once calcium attached to the troponin, it releases the tropomyosin from the troponin, so the troponin can get the myosin attached to it. So uh, it's a, this is cycle. Now you have the next cycle, which is the actually muscle cycle. So I hope it answers your question. And also, let's see what else. So acetylcholine removes the neurotransmitters? No, 
Acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter, and it's been degraded into acetate and choline, which is vitamin B4, which is necessary in your diet. So um, the body not to reuse it usually, it just make from this B4 and acetate, neuroacetylcholine. Yeah. And neurotransmitters that are removed are, for example, serotonin, epinephrine, dopamine, yeah, and so on. Yeah, exactly. Can you repeat what you said about cultures? What about the excitatory and inhibitory neurotransmitter for autonomous nervous system? Okay, so in order to have the action potential, you have to reach usually in the muscles minus 55 millivolts. But some neurotransmitters cause a negative and some neurotransmitters cause plus. The combination of those, because the uh, neuron system is very complex, will um, sync with each other until the point when you reach the actual sh threshold, which is minus 55 millivolt. Only then, then you will have the actual action potential. But until then, you can have different neurotransmitter playing with the millivolt until you reach this minus 55. And uh, about the calcium ions, yes. So you have sacroplasmic reticulum inside the myofibrils, which stores the calcium itself. Once you have acetylcholine, for example, depolarized and attached to the uh, uh, proteins on top of the myofibrils, it will, the sacroplasmic reticulum will release the calcium. The calcium is positively charged and also will cause the actual tropomyosin to be removed from the actin. So now the actin are being exposed for the myosin to attach to the actin. All right? So if you got it, Sandra, let me know. I can explain it again. It's very important because they are mixing between the troponin, trop tropomyosin, and um, actin rods. Yeah, exactly. Thank you for the help, Paris. It's very helpful. So guys, if you want to follow Paris, <laughs> uh, use the chat because he has some really important notes. Thank you, Paris. All right. Good. Next. Wait. Can we say that this process causes rigor mortis? Yeah, because yeah. you have a uh, calcium staying inside the yeah. cytoplasm and it's the muscle just contract all the time. You don't have the reuptake of calcium inside the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Yeah, good one. Good. All right. Questions? So I'm going to start now. Um, Do you see the questions? Yeah, guys, can you see the question? Yeah, perfect. All right, so it's 30, 29, 30, right? Yep. Let's run it. Perfect.
Okay, I stop the poll before seeing the results. Let's see what we are talking about. Uh, Cambridge loves asking about the sarcomer. They, about muscle, they always ask about troponin, tropomyosin, because they know it's confusing. And also about the sarcomer, because this is also very confusing, at least it was for me. Uh, the sarcomer is the functional unit of the myofibril of the muscle. And it starts from the Z line to the Z line. In this picture, the red one is the myosin and the blue one is the actin. The myosin is the thick one and the actin is the thin one. Um, I said that the myosin is like the person and the actin is the root. So the myosin stays in place, it doesn't move, while the actin, as you can see, is pulled toward the center. Uh, how to remember all the bands and the lines? I put here a cool mnemonic. Zahir is a hungry man. This is in order. So first, first we have the Z line here. Then we have the I band. Then we have the A band. The M line is the middle one. Um, yeah, and that's it. Z line is the final of the alphabet because it represents the end of the sarcomere. M stands for middle, I because it is a thin letter, so it's the band where there is only actin. You can see that when muscle contract, the I band, um, the I band uh, decreases, so um, it contracts, it gets narrower. The H, uh, the H band is a thick letter, so the H zone is uh, the one with only thick filaments, uh, the one with only uh, myosin at the center, this one. This is the H-band. During contraction, the H-band disappears because the actin filaments are pulled toward the middle and they overlap and H-band disappears. Finally, the A-band, um, it's the band with both thin and thick filaments. Uh, the A-band covers the, length, the entire length of the myosin. Um, it's a hybrid of I and H, so it contains both thin and thick filaments. The A-band during muscle contraction does not change because it's myosin, it's the person, it doesn't change. Let's see our answers. First question. In a human skeletal muscle, how will the appearance of a contracted sarcomer compare to its appearance when it is relaxed? A band is narrower, this is false. A band is myosin, so it doesn't change. H band, H zone are of the same width, false. They disappear. The H band is the one with uh, only thick filament, so it's the band in the middle. I band is narrower. This is true. The I band is like where the actin attaches, this part here. Um, so yeah, it gets narrower. It's pulled also toward the center. Zeta lines are close together. Yes, of course. Zeta lines are in the middle of the I band. And this is the zeta line. So yeah, if the I band are narrower and pulled closer together. Of course, the zeta lines are also closer together. Number 30, which of the following regions within a sarcomere remain unchanged in length when a healthy human cell, muscle cell contracts? A-band, I-band, H-zone. The A-band. The A-band is the, uh, the length of the myosin, so it's one only. I-band, as we just said, um, gets narrower and H, H on H band, same. Do you have any questions about it? Zeta lines are also known as zeta disc. Yes, thank you, Faris. All right. Okay, good. Next topic is the heart. Can you explain 30 again? All right. 
Okay. Um, the question, so, sir? Yeah. Uh, which of the following regions remain unchanged? We have A band, I band, and H zone. You can see A band remains unchanged because A band is the length of the myosin. The length of the myosin doesn't change. The myosin stays still. It's the person pulling the rope. The person is not moving, the rope is moving. What about I band? I band is the one, is this area here, where there are only actin filaments. The actin filaments are the rope and they are pulled toward the center, this way. So they get narrower because in this space, this space gets filled by myosin, okay? You have to imagine them shifting, moving toward the center. And then we have the zeta line, I think. No, was it the H band? Sorry. Okay. Uh, the last one was the H band. The H band is the one in the middle, this one, and it disappears during muscle contraction. Because as you can see, actin filaments here overlap, and there is no more uh, area with just myosin filament. Is it clear now? Also, the I band is the distance between the thick filaments. So because the filaments itself get shorter, so the I band will get shorter as well. Yeah. Perfect. Can you repeat 29? Okay. So uh, maybe a good, uh, a good trick to do in those kind of questions is to draw the sarcomere because it's really easy to get confused. So we start with the Z line. We have um, the I band, mm -hmm. so like this. These are the actin filaments. I will change color, draw the myosin. Okay. So we have Zahir is a hungry man. So Zahir, this is I band, A band. H band and M line, okay? Uh, sorry for my terrible drawing. The A band is narrower, false, because the A band is the myosin, it does not contract, it doesn't change. The H band are the same width during contraction. H band are those here in the middle, um, in yellow. Those are H bands. They disappear because imagine those green lines, the actin filaments contracting. They contract, they contract like this until they overlap. And you can see there is the H band is the area where there was only myosin filament. During contraction, there is no such area. area. In the, uh, what was before the H band, you can see both the myosin and the actin. Now, I band is narrower. Yes, contraction means, like if you contract your arm and your bicep, you can see that the muscle moving and actually shortening. So if the muscle has to be shortened, uh, the zeta lines and the I band that contain the zeta line are pulling close together. That, that's the way the muscle shortens. Zeta lines are closer together, yes, because they are inside the I band. All right. Okay. So next topic. The heart. Can everyone see the question? Perfect. Yeah. All right. Oh, sorry. Last, last question. I band is the distance between different biosyn strands. No. I band is the area that contains only actin filaments. But I band, yes, it's the distance between the thick filaments. So it gets shortened after you oh, yeah. contact. Okay. So yeah, it's a different way to say it. So it is, I band is the distance between different miles and strands. So miles and strands are the thick filaments. This is what you mean, right, Guy? This is what you meant? Yeah, perfect. Okay. And is the H line in between the M? No, it's the opposite. The M is in between, uh, is the line in the middle of the H band. 
Mm -hmm. You really should memorize this chart on the yeah. PowerPoint for the IMAT because it basically covers everything. It's necessary. If we have um, questions about the muscles, it's usually on the contraction itself or the sacromere, the Z disc and everything. Right, only 20% of people answered the questions, so we will wait a, another minute. Smooth muscle contraction is not necessary for the amateur, in my opinion. It's too complicated. Um, I didn't see any question in past papers, not the IB, not the BMAT, not the IMAT, and not even the Italian exam that weren't about, uh, wasn't about the muscle, skeletal muscle contraction. So it's not very high yield to go through it. You mean, Jacopo, you mean different uh, kind of um, myofilaments? The A, B, C, it's not necessary for the IMAT. Of course, you need to know the skeletal muscles, smooth muscles, etc. Yeah. All right, so 80% of people uh, answered. Great. Let's uh, show the results. Perfect. All right. Okay. Most of you got it right. Uh, so I'll be very quick in the explanation. Um, I'm gonna um, teach you some quick anatomy of the heart, the most important things. Uh, so first we have the vessels entering or exiting the heart. What we have to remember are the vena cava, we have the superior one and the inferior one. They collect uh, deoxygenated blood uh, from all over the body and they deliver it into the heart. They enter the right atrium. Uh, from the right atrium, blood flows to the right ventricle. Then from the right ventricle here to the pulmonary arteries to deliver, uh, to bring this deoxygenated blood into the pulmons, uh, to the lungs, sorry. From the lungs, uh, the now oxygenated blood flows to the pulmonary veins here, to the left atrium and to the left ventricle, and then it is pushed into the aorta to be delivered all around the body. Important are the valves. In the heart, we have four valves. The AV valves, atrioventricular valves, are between the atrium and the ventriculum. So uh, the triscuspid valve, which is called like this because as you can see in the picture, it has three cusps, divides the right atrium from the right ventriculum. The bicuspid or mitral valve, uh, which has two uh, cusps, divides the left atrium from the left ventriculum. And then we have the semilunar valves, which are another kind of valves. They don't have cusps, as you can see. And we have the pulmonary valve uh, dividing the right ventriculum from the, pulmonary, uh, from the pulmonary arteries and the aortic valve dividing the left ventriculum uh, from the aorta. Let's see the circulation in the heart. The first, uh, first step uh, blood, deoxygenated blood from all around the body is flowing through here, the right atrium, and then to the right ventriculum, passing through the superior and the inferior vena cava. So the tricuspid valve, these light blue ones, are open, blood flows into the atrium and a little bit into the ventriculum. Then we have atrial systole also called uh, ventricular diastole, diastole. The atrium contracts, pushing all the blood that is in, into the ventriculum. So all the blood is now into the ventriculum 
What is closed? The semilunar valves, because uh, blood fills the ventriculum, but thus cannot go here into the pulmonary arteries. Same thing happens in the left side, um, but we will see that in a second. So uh, the blood is all in the ventricle. At this point, we have ventricular systole. The AV valve closed here. They close because we don't want the blood to go back into the right atrium. We want the blood to go into the pulmonary arteries. So the semilunar valves, this one here, open and ventricles are contracted and the blood is pushed towards pulmonary arteries. From the pulmonary arteries, they are delivered into the lung where they are converted into oxygenated blood. This picture here. So like this, it becomes oxygenated. Um, then blood flows back uh, into the heart, into the left atrium, through the pulmonary uh, veins, this one's here, into the left atrium and into the left ventricles. So we are again into atrial systole, the atrial contracts to push all this blood, all this blood into the ventricle here. So the AV valve are, are open, the bicuspid or mitral valve is open, and the semilunar valves are closed. At this point, we have again ventricular systole, uh, the AV valve closed, the semilunar valve open, and the blood that was in the ventricles flows up into the aorta to be delivered all around the body, oxygenated blood. Uh, a quick, um, I want to point out that these are pulmonary arteries and these are pulmonary veins. It's, it might seem weird because usually arteries are red like the aorta and veins are blue like the vena cava. Um, it's like this because um, even, through the, even though the pulmonary arteries carry um, deoxygenated blood, they are called arteries because we, uh, the structure of the vessels is like an artery. It delivers blood from the heart to the body, to the lungs. While the pulmonary veins, they carry oxygenated blood, but they are, have a structure similar to veins because as like vein, they carry blood from the body, in this case, from the lung to the heart. Okay. All right. Good. Uh, we just saw muscle contraction, but how does the heart contract? Uh, specialized myocardiocytes are able to generate the electrical impulse without any external stimuli. So uh, we don't need the brain or the central nervous system to say, to tell to the heart to contract. The uh, central nervous system, the sympathetic and parasympathetic system, regulate the frequency of the heart contraction. So they regulate how fast will the heart beat but the heart can beat by just itself. Um, generating the impulse are those specialized myocardiocytes, this here, that are found here in the SA node, in the uh, sinoatrial node, which is found like just above the right atrium. The impulse is generated here and it is uh, transmitted into the AV node, which is found yeah, um, below the right uh, right uh, atrium, uh, between the right atrium and ventricle, more or less. The impulse, starting from the SA node, is transmitted to the AV node and also it diffuses along in the yellow area here, um, along the uh, right and left atria, so the atria are contracted. We have atrial systole here. Then the signal is passed along bundle branches to the heart apex and then to Purkinje fibers, which will make the ventricles contract. But the AV node is really important because it's 
like a relay station. It delays, it delays the impulse. So first the atria contract, the impulse is then transmitted to the ventricles. There is a delay and then the ventricles contract. I think it's very important to say um, Paris and Michaelis, it's very important for the amateur exam as well. Veins all over the body, except from pulmonary veins, deliver deoxygenated blood yeah. from the body to the heart. But pulmonary veins, only because of the direction, because body to the heart, deliver oxygenated blood. It's very important for the amateur exam because they can ask you, um, do all of the veins in the body deliver deoxygenated blood? It's not correct because pulmonary veins, oxygenated blood. It's important. Is it delays to fill up the ventricles? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like you cannot contract just all the heart in one time, so yeah. yes. Once the ventricles are in diastole, means relaxed, mm -hmm. they fill up. Once the, it reaches the bundle of his and the fibers, it will cease to and when you have the opening of the semilunar valves. It's important to know. And between the close of tricuspid and mitral and the semilunar, you have a state when all of the cups and the valves are closed until you have enough pressure in the ventricles to open the semilunar. So blood and in general all the fluids, so even the air in the respiration, flows from where there is a higher pressure to a lower pressure. Um, let's revise the um, heart circulation. Systole is when the heart contracts to pump blood out, as I just said, and diastole is when heart relaxes after a contraction. So first we have AB valves open and semilunar valve closed, which means the blood flows, the oxygenated blood from the body uh, through the vena cava flows into the right atrium and then into the right ventricle. Then the, S, the SA node generates the electrical impulse. We have therefore the atrial systole, atrial contraction, the uh, AV valves are open, semilunar valves closed, and all the blood is pushed into the ventricle. Why? Because the pressure of the contracted area, uh, atria is higher than the pressure of the relaxed ventricles. So the blood flows into the ventricles. Then the impulse generated from the SA node is um, is delivered to the AV node, atrioventricular node, uh, that delays the electrical impulse. Uh, so ventricles are filled in. Uh, Purkinje fibers transmit the electrical impulse into the, to the ventricles. And we have ventricular systole, ventricular contraction. The AV valves are now closed. The semilunar valves, because of the high pressure in the ventricle, open, and then blood is pushed out from the ventricle to the pulmonary arteries and to the aorta. Pulmonary arteries contain deoxygenated blood from the vena cava, while the aorta contain oxygenated blood that was just delivered through the pulmonary veins uh, from the lungs. It, uh, why? Because the pressure of the ventricles is higher than the pressure of the aorta in the pulmonary veins. Okay. So now we can answer the question. Which of the following statement is correct? During inspiration, the pressure within the chest cavity is lower than outside the body. What happens during inspiration? If this is a human, uh, we have air from outside flowing inside. It means that the pressure outside is higher so because the air is moving inside the inside, the chest cavity, must have a lower pressure than outside. So this is true. Two, during ventricular systole, the pressure in the atrium is lower than in of the ventricles. Yes, uh, of course, during ventricular systole, the ventricles are contracted, so they have a high pressure. Ventricular systole also mean atrial diastole. So the atria are relaxed and then they definitely have a uh, lower pressure. So if one and two are correct, the only option available is E. That's why the E is the correct answer. Um, this question was taken for, uh, from IMAP 2017, 
and some of you might think that three is also true. During ventricular systole, the pressure in the aorta is lower than the pressure in the atrium. Um, yes, uh, like actually nobody really measured the pressure in the aorta uh, and the pressure in the atrium during ventricular systole. So um, it's quite controversial, but it's not really important. Uh, the reason why three is false in this case is just because we don't have this option in the answer. So always, uh, after you read the question, always uh, check up the options because it helps you a lot. From seeing the available answers, you can already um, solve half of the problem, let's say. Mm -hmm. yeah. You don't have to think about whether three is true or not. Uh, if you're sure about one and two, then E is the right answer. And that's how also you gain a little bit of time. Okay. So, next two questions. Right, we have a question. Okay, so Can you repeat why three, three is uh, false? Um, it's not really important. Um, Okay, so during ventricular systole, ventricles are contracted, so blood flows from the ventricle into the uh, aorta, from the left ventricle to the aorta, because ventricle, so let me draw the picture. Okay, so this ventricle here is contracted, this one too, and blood flows from here to here. Here we have a high pressure, and here we have a low pressure. But what else has a low pressure? The atrium. Because ventricular systole means atrial diastole. That's what you should know. Um, the detail about whether this low pressure is lower or higher than this other low pressure in the atria, it's not really important. I think it's too much for the IMAT. Uh, you can exclude this question, uh, this uh, sentence, just knowing that one and two are true. And because you don't have here uh, an option where say one, two, and three are true, you have just one and two only. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you can deduce that three is false. Also, in this time period, once the ventricle contract, you have the closure of all the different uh, cups and the valves until the point the semilunar will open up eventually. So as long as the semilunar is closed, also the aorta doesn't get blood. So it's a very difficult to answer and tricky, yeah. tricky question. Basically, you are not being expected to know for this uh, level. As, as I said, it's very easy to find the actual uh, question from the options you have. And like we said in the beginning of the marathon, you can just remove options to see which one is correct eventually. So three, it's, it's pretty complicated, I have to say. And yes, bundle of his are before Purkinje fibers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. you have okay. Good. SA, AV, bundle of his, fibers. Yeah. All right. So questions time. Everyone can see the questions or should we zoom in and do one by one? Raise the hand. If you think we should um, zoom in and do one by one, raise your hand now. All right. Okay, okay. Yeah, many ones, no problem. So let's do this one first. I will run the poll. All right. All right. We launch. Perfect.
online so we can see that 90 percent of you answer this question so we are going to give like five more seconds and then move to the next one perfect all right let's do the next one all right I think we are going to give uh, 30 more seconds because it takes some time to many of you. So let's do it. All right. Good. Mm -hmm. Let's see the answers. In the heart, the systemic circulation originates from the left ventricle. Um, systemic circulation is the one delivering and uh, collecting blood from the body and to the body. This is systemic. Pulmonary circulation It's the one about the lungs. I'm not gonna draw lungs. <laughs> okay, so the lungs, let's see the uh, pulmonary circulation. We have um, right atrium, right ventricles, um, pulmonary arteries, lungs, and then, yeah, that's. Yeah, no, that's so, a big sorry, question. sorry. Um, sorry. Let me give, okay. Systemic circulation is this one, the vena cava, so uh, from the body to the heart, from the body to the heart, and then from the heart to the body, so the aorta, this yes. one here. This is the systemic circulation, from the heart to the body and from the body to the heart. Mm -hmm. uh, while pulmonary circulation is from the heart to the body, uh, to the lungs here, so the pulmonary veins and the pulmonary arteries from the lungs to the heart. It's easy because they are called pulmonary veins and pulmonary arteries, so they are for sure pulmonary circulation. The other two, vena cava and aorta, are systemic circulation. So, arteries, heart, pulmon, and uh, veins to the back. Uh, systemic circulation, the aorta originates from the left ventricle, 
That's why uh, the systemic circulation originates from the left ventricles. Mm -hmm. Let's see question number 33. In a healthy human at rest, which is the correct order of some of the events that occur during a heartbeat? The first thing that happens is, uh, the correct answer is C, two, five, and six. So first we have four. The SA node transmit the electrical impulse. Then we have atria contract, Mm -hmm. together, almost together with two, um, the atrioventricular node delays the electrical impulse. Then we have um, Purkinje fibers that transmit electrical impulse. After the bundle of his, but uh, yeah, they didn't mention it here. Then we have ventricle contraction because of the Purkinje fibers. And then ventricle contracts, so blood leaves the heart into the aorta and pulmonary artery. This is the order. So we have two, two five, 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 and six. Mm -hmm. You have any question, guys, about the pulmonary and systemic? So where does the pulmonary circulation originate? From the right ventricle. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right ventricle, lungs, lungs. comes back to the left atrium. What's the function of the bundle of his from the AV to the progenic fibers? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Any more questions? All right, Good. let's continue. The circulation started with one. Yeah. Okay. This is a very good question. All right, so everyone see the question? Maybe you can zoom a bit, a bit more. more. Yeah. Right. Let's sign it again. We are going to give it another 20 seconds because only 50% answer the question.
that I'm curious from, right? Yeah, wait. It's time I, now. I know, it's <laughs> the time on the iPad is not correct. Okay. All right, guys, so let me show you the results. Also, about some answers. Um, are we going to continue tomorrow? There are 300 more slides. Okay, so we have math and physics slides, which I'm not sure we are going to do, if at all. It depends if you will like it or not. We have like 50 questions of math and physics, but we will run a poll to see exactly who wants to participate in math and physics. Um, if we will do it, you might, if you don't take, a, if you don't want to take place in math and physics, you can take like a one hour and a half uh, break. After it, we have a, a very important part of critical thinking, general knowledge, and a, a bit of um, more uh, all the skills of critical thinking, so it's important. So um, maybe, you know what? I will run a poll now to see exactly which one of you wants to run the math and physics as well. So I'm running this question as well. Uh, again, uh, pick A if you want to participate in the math and physics, and pick B if you don't want to see math and physics. All right. So <laughs> it, it looks like all of you want math and physics. <laughs> yeah, 100% answered in like uh, five seconds. All right. Okay, okay. No problem. We <laughs> will do doing? math and physics. Uh, it's like 50 questions. We will, we will try to go through them as quick as possible. You will be able to take them after to the PowerPoint and solve them by yourself. But um, on physics, we have some uh, important uh, topics to talk about based on past papers, because there are some topics that they're always asked on. So maybe it's good to uh, talk about it as well. So all right, I can see almost all of you want to math and physics. All right. Yeah, good. Let's talk about this question. Okay, let's go back to the question. This is a very good question. I really like it. Um, from what I just explained, you know only what the pulmonary vein is. The pulmonary vein is the vein that delivers oxygenated blood, fresh oxygenated blood directly from the lungs to the heart. So it must have the highest oxygen level, right? because the oxygen is coming directly from the lung. It, it isn't, uh, hasn't been delivered to anywhere yet. If you are sure that the 91 oxygen level correspond to Z, that is the pulmonary vein, that Z is the pulmonary vein, you have just two options. None of those can be true. So if you have no idea of what a portal vein and what a renal vein is, Still, you can reduce it into two options, A and E. And at this point, I think you could guess it's the probability is at your side. Anyway, I will explain now why uh, the correct answer is E and why the uh, renal vein is X and the portal vein is Y. First, the portal vein. Uh, the portal vein is a vessel uh, coming from the gastrointestinal, from the digestive tract to the liver. And the liver has a pretty weird circulation. We have the normal hepatic artery, uh, which is, like, comes from the aorta, delivers oxygenated blood into the body, and the hepatic artery is the one that deliver is, delivers it into the liver. And then we have the hepatic vein. This is another normal vessel uh, that finally at the end goes into the vena cava, the inferior vena cava, uh, and uh, collect the oxygenated blood from all over the body, in this case from the liver, and it delivers it to the heart. We have a third important vein in the liver, which is the hepatic portal vein, uh, which connects the digestive tract to the liver. Uh, and the digestive, so um, when we eat, the food uh, is, uh, goes through uh, from the mouth into the digestive tract and it is degraded. So all the, um, Toxins all the yeah, food. substances mm -hmm. absorbed by the gastrointestinal tract are delivered to the liver 
uh, for removal, if we are talking about toxins, alcohol, drugs, but also for metabolic conversion. Uh, in liver, there are a lot of metabolic uh, processes happening, for example, uh, glycogen synthesis. Uh, glucose is accumulating into the liver and converted into glycogen. So you must deliver glucose directly from the digestive tract to the liver. And this happens in the hepatic portal vein. That's why the hepatic portal vein is the one that has the highest level of glucose. Should also remember that the hepatic portal vein has pulmonary bed on both sides. So you have a pulmonary bed, bed of veins, vein, and then suddenly you don't have, it doesn't go to the heart, you have another pulmonary vein bed inside the liver itself. So it's important to know, capillary bed. Yeah, thank you, yeah, Paris. Yeah. What about the renal vein? The kidney, uh, which Ari will explain you this afternoon, I think, uh, function as the blood's filtration point and water balancing system, means that it removes metabolic wastes and excretion. So it's like um, blood with uh, metabolic wastes and excretion is collecting from all, all, all the body and, uh, and delivered into the um, kidneys when it gets filtrated. The renal veins, so blood is delivered to the renal artery. It goes into the um, kidney, into the nephrons, which are the functional unit of the kidney, uh, where the blood is filtrated. So here is the blood. Um, all the wastes, I'll draw them in green, are uh, removed. Um, actually not there, sorry, are removed here. They are converted into urea. The wastes are correct, collected in, uh, they are converted into urea and they are delivered along the ureter until they are uh, excreted. So the blood, the deoxygenated blood that comes out from the kidney is actually the filtrated blood. So that's why the renal vein is the one that has the lowest mm. level of urea of the three uh, vessels um, of the exercise. The filtrated blood, so the blood that we find in the renal vein has less urea, less water and solute ions, less glucose and oxygen, and more carbon dioxide. So, um, what has the highest level of glucose? This one. Why must be the portal vein? Which one has the highest level of oxygen? Z, 91. This must be the pulmonary vein, which has the lowest level of urea. X, this is the renal vein. So the correct answer is E. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That's, yeah, absolutely. We that's just, the end of we my just part. reached the break. Someone so, else, can you give it a break? <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. If you have any question on these physiology parts, please ask now. Okay. I'm going to run a poll now. Uh, I think we are going to have a longer break now. So if you think we should have a longer break for about 30 minutes, answer A. If you want a shorter break for like 10 minutes, answer B. All right, a long, a long break it is. <laughs> so okay. um, we will come back at uh, 3.30 for us mm -hmm. in uh, 37 minutes. So um, I will, we will see you after lunch. Yeah. Okay. Last slide, yes, sure. What time do we finish? At about uh, five and a half, six. six. Yeah. Eight hours, yeah, six. Israeli time? No, Pavia time. <laughs> the Pavia time is now uh, almost three o'clock. So Italian time. How long is the break now? Until uh, 36 minutes, until half. How many hours passed? No chemistry. Yeah, we will do chemistry after this part. So um, we just did almost five hours. We have about three more. 
we'll do some chemistry, math and physics, and uh, critical thinking. All right. Bon appetit, everybody. We'll see you in uh, 30 minutes or so. Yeah. Come back in um, 3.30 Italian time. Chemistry is waiting for you. Yeah, the fun. <laughs>
on the right. So we are back. If you are still here, please raise your hand so we can start the lesson. Great. Perfect. All right. So many. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, we still have a couple of more people that should come back. So we will start in a few minutes. Also, I think we, from this part and beyond, because we are a bit uh, late on the schedule, I think we are going to decrease the amount of time for each question because the chemistry questions we are going to do now are easier than the biology questions. And from now on, we are going to have less explanations and more actually solving questions. And to see based on the statistics of the actual questions, which part you are, uh, are the weak spots. So we will talk about it as well. All right. So we are going to talk about stoichiometry, gases, and, and more. The first question we are going to do, but first of all, we are going to solve questions together. And each time we'll see a new type of questions, we will try to provide a simple, time-efficient way to solve it. All right. So let's solve together. After you will solve it by yourself, this question. Let me know if everyone can see it. I will share the poll as well. All right, perfect. So I'm running the poll again. Perfect, all right. Okay, so Michaelis, thank you so much. It's very important to us as well to make sure, and we can't wait to see all of you in Italy next year. So it's so nice to hear it. Thank you. And Ella, um, I think it's not relevant because it's, uh, it's based on uh, past papers exams and we are not going to go through the actual study material. So um, it is important. To know chemistry for this part yeah all right i see that not many of you answer the question so i'm going to give it one more minute It's a bit blurry, all right. The chemistry part will be around one hour, yeah, one hour and a half maybe, mm -hmm. until five o'clock. Then we will have one hour of math and physics and one hour of critical thinking and uh, general knowledge. All right, so. Let's see how we are going to solve those kind of questions. It's an important trick for the IMAT exam. You should solve it by knowing the molecular mass, 
by calculating it from the atomic masses. Then you know how many grams you have, and grams divided by mass equals moles. So you can see how many moles you have. And then you compare the number of moles. Because you know the moles, one liter, one mole equals to 22.4 liters. So it's pretty easy, just con always convert it to moles. And for moles, you can see the uh, actual amount of liters you have. So this one is in already in liters. So you can compare it to moles again and compare the amount of moles to the others. Okay. So the answer is one, three, then two. How did you calculate number three? Um, you know that 22.4 is one mole as a variable, they give you it. So 1.12 divided by 22.4. It looks complicated, but if you think about it, you can round the numbers to see it's about 0 0.05. Yeah, exactly, like Smyro said. Yeah, 1 is 0. Right. Absolutely, yeah, you're correct. Number of molecules in number of moles. Don't you need the Avogadro number? Okay, so you have this whole molecule and in ideal gas, one mole equals this amount of number because the size of the molecule isn't matter, only the number of particles. So you can just calculate all as a single unit and to see how many moles you have. All right. Let's do another question. Yes, number of molecules is the number of moles. You don't need to use the, you don't need to separate them. Can everyone see the question? Yes, perfect. All right, so let's do it again. So I will zoom in so you can read it, and then I will zoom out to see the options. You can also use the PowerPoint and the IMAT Marathon group on WhatsApp to see it by yourself. It's uh, slide number 191. All right, perfect. I can see many of you answer it correctly. So we will go through it pretty quick. Always, I like to use for uh, ideal gas and gas in general, the PV equal NRT, the ideal gas flow equation. And you can see that it does not undergo thermal expansions. So V is not relevant. The temperature of the gas in the tank rises. So this one rises. So we have to see that P also rises because you have the same amount of N and R is not relevant in this situation because it's a constant. So two and four. Kinetic, by the way, kinetic energy is important for the IMAT because the kinetic energy of the molecules represents the temperature. This is the definition of the temperature. So they usually do it, they just compli um, complicated temperature with the kinetic energy. So remember it as well. Anyone uh, has questions? Does N decrease in this case? Because it's a sealed gas, the number of moles can escape. So the molecules can escape, it's the same amount of uh, N. Because it's constant, I removed it. 
for R as well and V as well because it's, it does not undergo thermal expansion. All right. Perfect. Let's do another one. All right, so I can see a lot of confusion between C and E. Uh, it's important to remember that the units of moles are divided by mole. So these are the units of the Avogadro number. Of course, one is not relevant because you remember that carbon is not 12 kilo. You have one mole equals 12 gram exactly, not 12, ki not, uh, 12 kilogram. So it's not relevant. So this one, this one, is this one is not relevant. And this is the units of moles and three as well is correct. This is why many people uh, confuse C and E. So it's important as well to remember for the IMP exam. All right. Let's do another one. All right, so I see many of you answer it correctly. Uh, it's a good question to remember because ideal gas, you can just follow the coefficients to see the ratios between them, to know exactly what is the volume on each side. 
So you are being told that this one is 600 milliliters and you have the two months on this side and they're asking you about the complete, the, all the products. So you have four months, the two plus two. So you have two, two times the volume on the product size. Is the conversion of volume to moles is necessary? Um, not in this case. No, I wouldn't use it because you can see only the number of moles just from this documentical uh, question itself. Yeah, of course, I will explain it again. So it reacts completely with the oxygen to make four moles on this side. Because it's ideal, if the gases were not ideal, would the conversion be necessary? Uh, it depends on the constant of the gas and a lot of other things. For the IMAT exam, usually, not usually, even all the time, they ask you about uh, ideal gases. Only for gases, you can use the ratios, by the way. Yes, Abdul, exactly. Because ideal gases, the pressure is not relevant. So the volume equals to the number of moles. So you can see you have two moles on this side, which we create products that are four moles. And it doesn't matter how many oxygen you have. You just have four moles on this side, therefore 1,200 milliliters. Why don't the three moles matter? Because the products are what's important in this question, because you are calculating only the amount of two products, the volume. So the gas, the oxygen gas is not important to this question specifically. Why is it wrong to think two plus 600 plus three divided by two plus 600 equal 1500? Because you're not, you shouldn't take into consideration the oxygen because they are asking you only about the products. So when it says gas are ideal, we only look at the moles numbers. At this specific case, when it's only ratios of volume, yes, you can do it when the gases are ideal. All right, any more questions? In this case, yes, the volume decreases, but it depends how much you have for this side. Can you explain again? Yeah, Lucas, we will get uh, back to different questions again later. All right. Let's do another question. Perfect. Well, I can see like 99% of you answered it correctly and it is, it's pretty easy question. All right. So I don't think we should um, explain it because it's pretty self-explanatory. Let's do another one.
All of these all past exam questions. Many of these questions are from Humanitas and BMAT, not only the IMAT, but the actual tricks you can see inside because this one is a very good example of knowing they're asking about the same ratio and not the same amount. Again, just to read the question very carefully so you can find the actual answer. Those tricks are pretty repetitive on the IMAT exam, so it's pretty important to go through those questions as well. All right. So you can see each carbon gets four connections. So if you have two already, you have this, this one. And the trick is to see the same ratio and not the same amount. And if you use the five step I showed you in the beginning of this marathon, you would see and mark this one as well. So it's very important to use those. All right. Let's do another one. I think for this one, we are going to have uh, another minute. It's an important question. They are not always going to give you the uh, molar mass. Yeah, it's 23.99, so 24. Um, but um, you should memorize the periodic table, the atomic masses. So it's very important to know the, the masses because some questions are without the molecules. Yes, in these questions, you are being expected to know. Yeah, usually, but not always. For example, NA is 11, but it's 24. Yes, the most important uh, periodic table to remember is group one, two, seven, and eight, and periods one, two, three, and four, including the first D block, to remember it by heart. Yes, Alex, I actually included the um, mnemonics for the periodic table in the next, so you can use it 
in the next four days. It's pretty easy. Okay, I think we are going to solve it together, this one. All right. So using the masses, you can see that this weights 288, which is around 300. You have 7.15 washing soda. But, ah, by the way, it's an important thing to remember that when you have an hydrated molecule, you count the water also in the molecular mass. It's very important to remember. This is the trick with this question because they are expecting you to think that when you have in water, the water will be separated from the molecule but actually you are counting the water molecules as the molecular weight, all right. So once you reach the 300, yes, I will repeat it. When they give you an hydrated molecule with water molecules inside attached to the main molecule, the water molecules are part of the core molecule. So you need to count the molecular mass, even though you are going to put the molecule inside water, you need to count the molecular weight and mass with the water molecules. It's very important for these questions, especially because it's solubility. So if we count the entire molecule, yeah, Sandra, we will repeat 40, of course. So you have around 300 and you have 7.15 of it. You know 7.5, this is a quick math trick I used to do a lot. 7.5 is a quarter of 30, and 30 is 10th of 300. So you know you have about 1 point divided by 40 moles of this. Everyone got this math trick? I can repeat it because it's pretty important for the exam. Uh, all right, so raise your hand if you want me to repeat it again. Yeah, all right, everyone. Okay, so usually on the IMAT exam, like on in the previous question, they gave you 1.12 liters, and they also told you that 22.4 liters equals one, equals one mole but it's pretty weird without calculator to divide 1.12 into 22.4. But if you multiply this number, you can see it's pretty close to 2.24. I mean, it's exactly 2.24, which is one tenth of this number. So you got the, do you got the answer? How many moles do you get from 1.12 liters? of gas, of ideal gas, it's this number times two, which is you know, this number divided by two because it's half the amount. So one over 20. So I just can see it's a very um, easy number to divide by the main number because I remember the number of liters divided by the STP, which is 22.4, gives you the number of moles by the equation. So I use this as well to just multiply and find and divide by to find easily and uh, the number of moles. Uh, I think I should repeat it again. So if you think I should do it as well, raise your hand. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's do it again. <laughs> let's try a different way to explain it. Okay, so usually, I mean, all the time on the IMAT, they will give you easily dividable numbers because you don't have a calculator. So in order to see how many moles you get, we just use the known equation. In our case, we know the grams divided by the molecular weight will give you the number of moles, right? So if we take the grams and the molecular weight, which is 288, in this case, we will get the number of moles. But it's pretty weird to divide 7.15 uh, divided by 288 without a calculator. But you can see these numbers are pretty close to other numbers. For example, I can round it up. 
288, I can round it to 300. And 7.15, I can round it to 7.5. So how many times 7.5 enters 300? 40 times, it's, you can just multiply it in your head. So you know the number of moles are one divided by 40. It's very important. Is it clear now? Please raise your hand if you understood about uh, what I'm saying. All right, perfect. Okay, okay, good. So almost all of you raised your hand. You can use this trick anywhere on the IMAT exam. And they are expecting you to do this, this specific mathematical trick. They won't give you how they divided, like hard numbers, never, because you don't have a calculator. All right? So once you know you have one above, one over 40 months, you can see the actual question. So you are being asked, is this solved in water to form 250 milliliters of solutions? So if you have, if you have one over 40, divided by 250, or in our case, the number of months, because you need to find the solubility, you will get 0.1, because you need to find the molarity. Let me clear the screen because it's a bit of a mess. All right. I will do it again because it's important. Okay, so we know we have one over 40 moles around that. So if we divide it over the 250, we will get the solubility, the molarity, because we have only 250 milliliters. If we take one over 40 and put it in a liter, we will get 0 0.02. But if we take one over 40 and divide it by the actual milliliter, because we don't have a liter, we will get five times and 1.1, 1 .1, 0 0.1. So which is roughly 40, why not one, why one divided by 40? Because in order to find the moles, let's, let's do it again, it's important. You have 7.15 grams. And you know in order to find the number of moles, you divide it by the molecular weight. We got the molecular weight, all right, 300, about 300. So if you divide 7.15 by about 300, it will be around more or less 1 point over 40. Not exactly because you can't count it on the IMAT without a calculator. So I'm just rounding the numbers to see the general wind, like the overall, overall picture, it's important. Now I'm taking this one over 40 and I want to put it in water, but I know one liter with solution will give me the, the molarity, the general molarity, but I only have 250 milliliter, which means the molarity it's 140 over the actual milliliter we have in liters, which will give us 0 0.1 moles per liter. All right? Yeah, the right answer is B. Cool. If you understood, raise your hand. Okay, good, good. It's a bit complex one. The idea is you need to take and to find the molecular weight to remember to, ca to count the water molecules as well in the molecular weight. And then remember you have to count the solution from 250 milliliters and not one milliliter. So it becomes from 1.40 all the way for one over 10 because it's quarter of a liter, all right. Let's do another one. It's the same style, but uh, a different one. Okay.
All right, so I can see most of you got it correctly. We will go through it um, quickly. So you have the solubility of in 100 grams and they usually confuse grams and milliliter, but remember grams of water equals milliliter as well because the volume is being decided by the actual water. This is the definition of volume. So you have 38 at 100. It means at 200, you will have two times, which means 76 because you have 100. So 100 minus 76 equals 24. This is your answer. Exactly. These questions always get me nervous. Yeah, don't worry, just look complicated, but it's very simple. All right, let's do another one. You know what, this one is, it's okay. Let's, we will skip it. Okay, this one, all right. Good. All right, so let's quickly recap the idea of the atomic number and atomic mass. The number below is the atomic number. It represents the number of protons. The atomic mass is the protons plus the neutrons. And the charge means how many extra electrons you have or minus electrons you have compared to the atomic number, which means in this case, you have eight, plus two electrons. So in general, you have 10 electrons in this molecule. So the answer is E, all right. I can see many of you got it correctly, so let's keep going. Electron configuration, all right. Let's do uh, three questions about electron configurations. So if you can see all uh, three questions, please raise your hand. Mm, I see. So we will do it one by one and then we will solve it as well. So 46, I will give two, two, uh, one and a half minutes for each one and I will just move it uh, each one and a half minute. So let's share.
All right, I can see many of you got the question correctly, which is very important because these are the kind of uh, periodicity questions that will pop up on the exam. Let's share the result. All right. So periodicity, I added to the PowerPoint some important things to remember. Transition metals, probably not, of, not all of you know, form colored ions. Metals are shiny, malleable, ductile, electricity, high densities and solid. And non-metals non are usually otherwise. So the atomic radio strength is to the, the bigger down and to the left. This is the first trend we should remember. The other one, you have electron affinity, ionization energy, and electronegativity. All three of them are to the right and up, which is important, except, of course, the noble gases. that uh, ionization energy is relevant for them from the lowest at the bottom to the highest at the top. And the answers are of course one, like we said, you go to the right, you have more electronegativity, which forms colored ions, transition metals, which now you know because usually you don't know about it, but they asked about it in the IMAT in the previous past papers. And you can easily find, based on the number of electrons, you can see here, the atomic number and therefore the elements. So if we have two, two, six, one equals 11, it means we have sodium. And four here, it means we have beryllium. All right. You can see the trend, which means three only. All right. These are a good app and monomics to remember. You have this uh, periodic table quiz. You can memorize all of the specific elements you should know. The one we are showing here are a good one to remember, including this one and the Nobel gases just by the names. All right. Let's do two more questions. Isn't the electronegativity of nitrogen higher than that of helium? Yes, of course, the noble gases are out of the electronegativity chart, only until F, fluoride. Wait, go back to the mnemonics issue. You can take a picture if you want. All right. Also, I send the other side. Okay. <laughs> All right. No problem. Let's keep going. 49 and 50.
all right so let's recap quickly the actual uh, vcpr theory so linear it means 180 degrees trigonal planar 120 tetrahedral 109.5 but if the main atom is very electronegative it's less than 109.5 like nitrogen and water for example you have 107 it's important to remember so you can see it here 107 104.5 because they are very electronegative yeah um the free electron pairs i you can see them in the picture are like pushing the hydrogen atoms down, they are bending the structure. Mm -hmm. That's why it's a three-dimensional structure and not planar. Yes, because the electrons have even more power than the yeah. regular bond. All right, so SO2 and three, which most of you got correctly. Are these the only shapes we should know? Um, the exceptionals are NH3 and water, which means you have 107 and 104.5. Wait, I'm reading the questions. What's E? All right, okay. Okay, so you got it now, good. And no lone pairs, exactly. Yeah. The no lone pairs play the roles. Mm -hmm. You have the electrons domains still, so it's tetrahedral, but the electrons are stronger than the actual regular bonds. So it's important. Calcium hydride, Petra. All right. 49 explanation. All right, let's see. Things. All right, let's see more questions. Perfect, all right. Let's do two more questions. All right.
All right. I think these two questions are very important. This one, I think it's pretty straightforward. Let's see if we can get the actual. CO, you should know by now it's linear. So because it is linear, the vectors cancel each other and it's not polar. Also, you don't have permanent dipole moment. And a guy asked, can you explain the difference between induced and permanent dipole? Yes. Once you have a difference in electronegativity lower than 0.4, for example, carbon and hydrogen, 0.5 and 2.1 or lower, you have induced dipole. It means the electrons just randomly go around in this cloud of electrons. And from time to time, you will get this polar and non-polar sites. For example, you have more here or more here randomly. But once you have completely different electronegativity, for example, NaCl, for example, you will have the vast majority of electrons on this side and not on this side. So you will have permanent dipole. For this negative, this is plus, other than this one. It's very important. So once you have, in the next question, for example, two very similar atoms, hydrogen iodide and hydrogen bromide. They are very similar in electronegativity and they are both, all of them are non-metals. Non so you have HI and HBr. Because both of them have induced dipole because the electronegativity is pretty small, you should focus on which one of the molecules is bigger. Because if it's bigger, it has more electrons to make this induced dipole, more probability to make induced dipole as it's bigger. All right. Did everyone understood that you count when it's non-polar? All right, good. Aren't those molecules how can make them electronegativity? It depends, it depends on which one. But still, once you calculate halides with halogen, with hydrogen, it's important to remember the size itself of the molecule is what matters the induced dipole induced power because you have more electrons. So let's show the correct answers. This one is two and three, of course, the electrons. And this one is D. It's very important. You don't have hydrogen bonds because obviously it's only with O, N, and F, and you don't have them, so it's D. The electronegativity is pretty similar. So only ionic and bent molecules have permanent dipole? No. If you have enough difference in electronegativity, you will have permanent dipole. Exactly. It depends. If it's 1.4.5, it's still very close to each other. It's pretty, it's pretty much uh, the same. If it was completely opposite, I think about 1.8, it's ionic bond, and 0.4 to 1.8, it's covalent bond. Yeah, exactly, Paris. Do you have to memorize electronegativity values? No, you don't. I'm just crazy. Would it be right to say permanent dipole of HBr is stronger than HI? Mm, it depends because, because it's induced dipole, you have bigger cloud of electrons and bigger probability for them to interact with each other. Why not A? The HI covalent bond is stronger than the HBr covalent bond because the covalent bond is um, intramolecular and the high boiling point is uh, based on the fact that you have intermolecular forces, not intramolecular forces. So the covalent ionic or regular stuff, it just doesn't matter. You have to have intermolecular forces. All right, please can you answer the previous question again? Of course. 
These are very important for the IMAT, by the way, guys. So make sure to understand the permanent dipole, induced dipole, and everything, and the difference in electronegativity. All right. So CO, the structure is like this. Because it's linear, the vectors will cancel each other. Therefore, it's nonpolar. H2O, I'm oh, sorry. is extremely polar, makes also hydrogen bonds, and you have free electrons. So you have this permanent dipole on this side, I'm referencing to the other question, and plus on this side. NH3, it's NH with two free electrons. Still, you have permanent dipole because you have three, two electrons. And once you have a pair of electrons, you also have permanent dipole because this side will be negative and this side will be positive. This is the uh, polarity of the molecule. All right. What is the difference between intra and inter? Okay. Intra is inside. It's between the actual atoms of the molecule and inter is between the molecules in space. For example, N, a O H between them you have ionic and covalent bonds it's the intra molecular forces and between other N A O H in the area you have intermolecular forces does hydrogen bonds imply permanent dipole not always it depends on the actual structure because you can have for example Mm, let's say, what can we give as an example? Like if uh, is if the molecule or not the molecule, but the uh, group of molecules that you're considering is symmetric, it will be apolar because the charges will compensate with each other. Yeah, exactly. If it is asymmetric, it will be polar. Yeah, like yeah, C, like my thing. You have hydrogen. Yeah. Yet the covalent bond, it's, you don't have a difference in electronegativity, but in general, if you had, let's say, something else in the middle, still, because it's tetrahedral, it cancels each other. So it doesn't mean necessarily that you have polarity inside the molecule. Yeah, exactly. Anyone have, uh, has any more questions? All right, perfect. Okay. Okay. So let's do this too.
All right. Did you see the smooth transition, guys? We just switch places. All right. Let's end the poll and share the results. Okay. Uh, so. For uh, question number 53, the correct answer is C, as most of you got. Uh, why? This is a question about oxidation numbers. Uh, element Z react with water at room temperature and hydrogen gas is released. The oxide of element Z is solid. Now, but the important thing is the formula that is given here, ZO. Um, the oxidation number of oxygen is minus two. So the oxidation number of the element Z must be plus two. Uh, that's why the answer, the correct answer is group two. Uh, oxidation number of element of group one is plus one. Of group three is plus one or plus three. Group two is plus two. Group seven is minus one. And transition metal, transition metals depends. So that's the answer. What about the second question, number 54? The correct answer was four. Uh, this should be a pretty easy one. Uh, chloride is tricky because it has a lot of oxidation numbers, as you can see. In the first case, we have minus two of the oxygen. So the chloride together, uh, two um, yeah, atoms must be uh, plus two divided by two. So each of them, by, um, the value of each of them is plus one. In this one is plus one, so it is minus one. We have plus one, minus two, so it's again plus one. Here we have plus one, minus two, so uh, plus five. Here we have minus two, this means all the oxygens are minus eight, uh, plus one, plus seven, minus two, and plus six. Um, are you familiar with what I did or did you understood what I just did? No. Do you want me to explain this? Please raise your hand if you didn't understand. If you did understand, I think many people just uh, answered it correctly. So yeah. it should, yeah. should be All easy. Right. Okay. So Perfect. I'm not going to explain oxidation number at this point. I think all of you know already uh, just the important oxidation numbers to remember alkaline metals group one Highly nasty kid group cat four is the mnemonics value plus one alkaline earth metals plus two. Third group is usually plus three. Fourth group, remember the carbon is the most important plus two plus minus four uh, in inorganic compounds. In organic compounds, it really varies, but I don't think you are required to know uh, the oxidation number of carbon in organic compounds. Fifth group plus three plus five. Sixth group, remember oxygen is always minus two. Sulfur minus two plus four plus six. Seventh group, it varies a lot. The uh, chlorus is the most difficult one because it has a lot of oxidation numbers. And then transition metals. Those are the most difficult to memorize because they're not really regular. Try to remember the uh, ferrous, ferric atoms, uh, copper, and nucleus. Okay. Uh, don't worry, guys. We will get to all the questions. Yeah. Yeah. What? Good. Again, later. Don't worry. Even if we won't manage to solve everything together, you can open a thread on enter med school and we will answer you as soon as possible so we can we can see you next year in Pavia or in Italy as well. All right, let's move on. Okay, next two questions. Which number? You can relaunch re this. 50, 50. Two questions, yeah. Yeah, 55 and 56, all right.
All right, so 30 more seconds. I see 52% answered, so we are waiting. And we fixed some text on the question. Yes, sorry for the misspelling. I yeah, we were tired. <laughs> Sometimes we miss words. Okay, so most of you got it correct. Uh, the first answer is D. Let's see why. Um, lead 2 means that the oxidation number of lead is plus 2. Um, iodium is minus 1. So this is the only one, uh, the only equation that is balanced and has the correct oxidation numbers. What about the second one? The second one was definitely more difficult, so I'm really happy that most of you got it correct. Um, you had to draw the structure uh, from the names given. So sodium sulfate. Um, sulfate, you see, okay, uh, ADE, 8 means sulfuric. It comes from the sulfuric acid. So it is, sodium is of course Na, but how to make the sulfuric acid? You start from the anhydride, uh, you use the highest oxidation number of sulfur, which is plus six, because it's sulfuric acid and it's sulfate that you wanna make. So SO3 plus H2O, water, and you have this one. And yeah, that's it, uh, you add, um, sulfuric acid plus Na, uh, you use two and no, yeah, yeah. You use two Na mm -hmm. uh, to compensate the two hydrogens, and you get Na2SO4. You have four oxygen atoms, so this is not true. Uh, then you have ferric phosphate. In this case, again, we have ATE, so it's phosphoric. Uh, and you have to use the highest oxidation number. So we have P2O5 because the oxidation number of phosphorus is plus three, plus five. In this case, you use plus five. Plus water, then we have H2, P2O6. You can simplify this. Um, and then we have ferric. Ferric means also the highest oxidation number, plus three. And we have FA. Uh, PO3, three, three times. And we have nine oxygen atoms, definitely not two. So we can eliminate already uh, all of the uh, possibilities. And that's why A is the correct answer, even if you just solve the first two um, chemical compounds. Mm -hmm. I have to ask something, guys. Please raise your hand if you already saw the both question in the IMAT and this is why you chose D. Yeah, I knew it. <laughs> okay. So raise your hand if you didn't manage to solve it in the first time you saw it on the IMAT exam. Okay. So maybe it's good so we'll explain it. You see the iodine? Yeah. It can be minus two because iodine is group seven, so it's minus one and you get the oxidation lead in a parenthesis you have two, it means the oxidation number of lead is two. It has to be Pb plus two and two iodine minus. It's very important because iodine can be minus two, so it has to be stoichiometrically Pb plus two, two iodine minus equals Pb I2, which is lead to nitrate or lead iodine in this case, all right? That is a double lesson right here, boys and girls. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Raise your hand if you can. Uh, we can keep going. Oh, wait. Why is C wrong? Okay, I will show Perfect. you uh, three and four both. So, carbonate ion. Again, you have eight, it means ic. So, it's the highest oxidation number of carbon. So, we have 
carbonic anhydride. It's plus four. Plus water again, and we have H2CO3. Uh, carbonate ion. So we just have to remove the hydrogens, and we have CO. Yeah. Wait. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's fine. Sure. All right, guys, um, we are going to upload this PowerPoint as well with all the sketching and stuff to the intermed school so you can make sure to move through the question. Even if you are not going to solve everything today because we have about two and a half hour, hours left until six or seven, something like this. And we will send you all the questions and we will help you with everything, so don't worry. Those specific questions are very good. We took a couple from each subject and you can see the tricks from each one. So it's very important to know those tricks. All right, so okay. let's keep going. Yeah, and finally, copper sulfate is pretty much the same as sodium sulfate. So this is the formula. Uh, why is G wrong? Because G says one and three and one, we have uh, sodium sulfate, which has four oxygen atoms. So it can, it's wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, then I saw, why do you add water to get polyatomic? Yes, I will show you in a second. Um, I made here some summaries about oxidation, um, sorry, about nomenclature of various chemical compounds, but I think you know them, so we will go on. Uh, important is salts. Mm, binary salt, salts are formed by uh, two ways, metal plus non-metal, like sodium chloride, Na plus Cl, or hydroxide plus hydroxide. Uh, as cubic iodide or ferrous chloride. We have um, cubic oxide, uh, hydroxide and um, hydro, uh, yeah, HCl or HI. Mm -hmm. Ternary salts, which are polyatomic salts, are formed by hydroxide plus anhydride. That's why you have to add water, because you have to form an anhydride. All right. Okay. So let's move on. The next topic is redox. Redox reaction. Um, those are reaction that involves the transfer of electrons between two species. So we have a change in oxidation number between the reactants and the product. Um, the first thing you have to do to solve re redox is to write the oxidation number. Mm, so here we have fer, uh, FA3O4. Uh, In the first case, uh, it, this is a fer, ferric atom. So we have, sorry, ferrous. So we have plus two. And then we can see that in the second half of the reaction here, we have zero because there is uh, an iron atom alone. Uh, atoms by themselves has always oxidation number equal to zero. From plus two to zero, the oxidation number is decreasing. It means that he's in, um, the iron is gaining electrons. The mnemonic is here, oil rig. Oxidation is loss, reduction is gain. So uh, the iron is gaining electron, reduction is gain. It means it is a reduction. It is, uh, it's getting uh, redu reduced. Uh, by how many electrons? It's gaining six electrons. Mm -hmm. Why? From plus two to zero, we have a difference of two. So it's gaining two electrons, but we have in total three atoms of iron. So two times three is six. Same thing for the, uh, for the H, from the, for the hydrogen. From zero to plus one, uh, in this case, it's losing electron because the charge is becoming positive. Oxidation is loss. It's losing electrons, so it's getting oxidized. Mm -hmm. Can you zoom in in the red table to show them the oxidation number to remember? Zero. Yeah, it's important. It's the same one from previous slides. All right. Okay. So that's it. Um, there are uh, several type of redox reactions. I don't think it's important that you know how to classify all of them. 
but there are two uh, important ones that you should know. The first one is combust combustion. Mm -hmm. Combustion. Um, it's always always ask on the island, and it's the reaction that uh, you add fuel and oxygen to get an, uh, carbon anhydride, carbon dioxide, water, and energy. Okay, that's it. So just remember, if you have oxygen here, carbon dioxide here, and water, that's a combustion reaction. Mm -hmm. The second one, which is might be like kind of tricky, is decomposition because it has, for me, not a, the, uh, not an easy name. It's simply when you are uh, decomposing uh, a molecule. So A B, it's becoming A plus B. Very easy. Let's now um, balance some redox reactions. Those are different kind of questions. They are not like IMA style but I think still there might be quite important. The first one should be easy for all of you, while the second one is quite difficult, mm -hmm. but it's fine. I will show you uh, how to solve the second one in particular. Um, if, you, if you don't follow me, it's fine. Um, if it will be present on the IMAT, it will be at most one question, so. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so we are going to give it like three minutes. Yeah. Maybe four, and then um, okay. we will continue. Uh, but before we continue, I would like to have another poll to make sure, because I want to make the critical thinking and general knowledge part before the math and physics. So people that won't study math and physics with us can um, exit after the critical thinking and general knowledge. So if, let's say, please answer A, if you don't want the critical thinking and problem solving to be postponed to the end, and answer B, if you do want it to be at the end. Okay. Okay, okay, good. So we are going to do it after this section, and then we are going to do math and physics. Perfect. All right. So just uh, raise your hand as soon as you finish the balancing redox so we can see how many of you did.
I, I know how to say. Am I explaining? Mm -hmm. yeah. I think so. You should. Okay. Okay. All right. So many of you saw it pretty quickly. So uh, we are going to only show the explanation yeah. quickly and then continue to the next subject. Okay. So the answer for the first one is this. To be easy. So uh, aluminium goes from zero to plus three. So it is losing free electron because it's getting positive. So it is oxidized. While for the um, copper, copper uh, from plus two to zero, so it's gaining electrons because it's getting negative, it is reduced. How to balance it? You have to, first of all, uh, balance the number of atoms, which is already done, because you have one aluminum, one copper, you have uh, for the uh, reactants, I mean the product, you have still one aluminum, one copper. Uh, you have to balance also the electron load. So we have minus three and plus two. You have to find the uh, minimum common denominator. The monumental. Yeah, no, the monumental. <laughs> yeah. yeah, English is hard, yeah, guys. Sorry, English is really hard. <laughs> this one, uh, so you multiply um, aluminum um, by two and copper by three, mm -hmm. and you obtain the following reaction. The second one is much more difficult. I wrote down the steps you should follow. Let's see them together. First, write the oxidation number, identify, identify the reduced and the oxidized agent. Uh, magnesium from zero to plus two is oxidized, while um, nitrium from plus five to zero is reduced. Mm -hmm. Second step. Write the two half reactions, balance them except for the H. What are the half reaction? The oxidation and the reduction reaction, separate it. So oxidation, we have magnesium plus two HNO3 uh, equals to, uh, to produce magnesium NO3, two. Um, yeah. The oxidized element is magnesium, so we have this. We have to balance these elements, so we cannot obtain from magnesium all this compound. We need also this one, so that's why the reaction, the half reaction is like this. And then we balance it. We have two uh, nitrium, so two here. Same thing for the reduction. Reduction is, I'll write it in red, HNO3 to obtain N2. And then you might ask, where is the oxygen gone? So you have to add also water. You balance the reaction and you obtain this. Um, and this step, remember, don't balance the hydrogens. Now we will add the gain and lose electrons in the formula. Magnesium from zero to plus two is losing two electrons. So we will add them here because they are used. Um, from the reduction reaction, the nitrium from plus five to zero is gaining uh, five electrons, but actually we have two mo uh, atoms and molecules. So it's 10 electrons gained, and we will add them here. Now we balance, uh, as we did previously, we find the MCM, we have um, two and 10. So we have to multiply the oxidation reaction by five and the reduction just by one. This is what we obtain in blue. And finally, we uh, balance the charge between the two half reactions, what we did, and we join the two half reaction. We just sum both of them. So we have five magnesium from here, 10 HNO3 plus two, so it's 12. Then we have 10 electrons from here. We have five feet, um, nitrium and sodium, and water. The charge are balanced. We have 10 electrons in between the in the reactants and 10 electrons in the products. 
so we can cancel that and then if you count all the atoms in the formula uh, you can see that it is balanced mm -hmm. it is too much work for one and a half points yeah yes it is i agree yeah. uh, so if you love chemistry uh, if you have a lot of fun with redox if you feel confident about it mm -hmm. it's 1.5 points more so i would do that yeah but if you only five days before the exam and you yeah. don't know how to do this it's, it's better okay. to go yeah it's okay yeah skip it skip uh, it it's learn something more useful mm -hmm. okay yeah yeah like in the ib exam all right good uh, so this is uh, another difficult oxidoreduction reduction reaction we won't do that now um in the powerpoint you will find the correct answer so if you have fun with chemistry and redox you can try it at home by yourself and then check the correct answer all right let's have a three five minutes break yep. until the 5 15 for us and we will continue to the next section okay i have a question here can we fail any subject like math or do we need at least one point in each subject? No. Um, the only thing that matters is the total score. Yeah. But yeah, Michael is right. Some schools want a specific score. Really? Yeah, For in bio and chem, not in math and physics usually. Yeah. Oh, you jump to the end. It's the other chemistry, the other chemistry part. Mm -hmm. I think we are going to do the uh, critical thinking. Now? Um, guys, if you want to do the critical thinking now, raise your hand. Mm, yeah, many want, all of you want. All right, so we will do it now. After it, we have a bit of chemistry and more biology, and uh, we are done for the day. All right. So let's have a couple of minutes and uh, we will come back in uh, three minutes, like 16. When we back, yeah, three minutes and we back. Don't go for too long. <laughs>
All right. So if you are here, yeah. stay with us. Raise your hand. <laughs> hey, everyone. All right. Perfect. Nice. Yeah. Everyone is here. Perfect. The master is here to teach you guys about critical thinking. <laughs> All right. I'm, I'm new to this, though, so I'm just going to help me figure out the Zoom stuff. Okay. So I just do it here and they can see. Mm -hmm. All right. So you're just getting going. Shalos, <laughs> happy to have you. Nice. It's really great to be with you guys. I'm happy to help. Um, we'll do physics and math after, right? Yeah. We'll do critical thinking. And general knowledge as well after this part. And then we'll do math and physics. So if you don't want to stay uh, for the math and physics, you don't have to. But um, it's fine. And I would highly suggest you to stay for math and physics because you most likely score a few points. Like even if it's 1.5, it's important. So I would suggest you to stay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. With, from what I remember with math and physics, even though I didn't study physics in high school, I was studying it anyway because there are some really easy questions that you can get free points on basically. And that could be the difference between getting in and not getting in. Mm -hmm. All right, well, let's start with critical thinking. So just to begin with, um, in case, I, I'm pretty sure everyone knows this, but just in case to have a clean slate, the, the first part of the IMAT, there's going to be critical thinking, problem solving, and general knowledge. So the critical thinking questions are these types of questions. And I'll get to that in a bit, but then problem solving is more of the shapes and, and you know, kind of um, probabilities. probabilities, work problems that you have to work through and kind of use your brain in different ways. This is mainly they give you an argument and a question about the argument, and then you have to answer it based off of what they give you. So these are the types of questions they can give you, and they can't give you any other types of questions because this is what's on the syllabus. So I'll go over what each of them is um, one by one. Okay, so overall tips for, general, uh, for critical thinking. So if you divide the number of questions in the IMAT um, by the amount of time you get, you have around two minutes, right? Like two minutes? Yeah, something like, something like two minutes. Yeah, 100 minutes. 100 seconds. Yeah. But actually, for critical thinking, you want to be around 60 seconds. And even like, if you're really good, you should get around 30 seconds. Because these are the parts where you can get some guaranteed points. And you can save more time for problem solving, which is what's going to give you an advantage. So when I was taking the exam, I didn't do this. I actually spent too long on critical thinking because I was like, yeah, I'm really good at this. I'm going to get all the points. And then I didn't have enough time for problem solving. So the point is you're going to understand these tricks uh, and these tips um, as well as possible. Use them in the exam. And then you're going to have more time for problem solving, which there is not really much we can teach you about problem solving. It's just about getting your own kind of ways of doing it and getting comfortable doing them. Mm -hmm. um, but overall, the main way you're going to answer these questions is you're going to read the prompt. The first thing you do is you're going to skip the part where they, there's like a paragraph um, about the, like some paragraph explaining something, skip it. Go straight to the prompt, which is going to be um, which of the following is an, a flawed argument or conclusion or whatever. Read that first. And then read the passage. Then you're going to go to the answers, discard the ones you don't think are correct, and then find the ones that you do think are correct. And then I'll go over it in, um, in the next couple of slides where sometimes it's better to read the prompt, read the passage, identify your own answer, and then look for it in the multiple choice because that way you're not going to be tricked by their answers because that's the whole point. They're trying to put things that could be true but aren't necessarily true. Um, but we'll get to that in a bit. So the reason you're going to read the prompt first is you want to get into the mode when you're first reading it. So that means when I'm looking at the prompt, it says, um, which of the following is a conclusion that, um, is the conclusion of the passage? Then I'm, okay, I'm reading it for the first time with the idea that I'm looking for the conclusion so that I don't have to read it twice. When I was doing this, I didn't, I didn't actually implement this strategy. Um, when I was taking the IMAT and I ended up reading it once, looking at the prompt, it said, oh, I need to look for a conclusion and then reading it again and then looking for the conclusion. But that's just a waste of time. Um, that goes back to what I was talking about before. Uh, and if I'm speaking too fast, let me know because some people, yeah, yeah the tactics are pretty similar to SAT tactics. Um, so the next couple of things you can do 
this is also based on personal preference and if you have enough time, but underline the sentence in the passage that matches what you're looking for. Um, you can also underline the conclusion, underline the reasons. Um, the one disadvantage with this is it takes a bit more time. So if you're going to be going through uh, underlining things, it's gonna take you a bit more time, but you're gonna be more sure of the answer. So that, those are the general tips. The first type of question, oh, so this is just what I was talking about before. Um, oh, and actually it's not. So the overall general structure of the argument in the passage is they're gonna have a conclusion, which not always, there's one type of question where there's no conclusion, but I'll get to that. There's gonna be reasons and assumptions. So I'll go through what assumptions are, I'll go through how to find the conclusion. Um, but that's just the general structure. Usually you're gonna have a conclusion, the reasons for the conclusion, and the assumptions which bridge them. So we'll start with a very simple example just to give you um, the general idea. So this is the example. I heard a door open and close. I can't see Ari in the apartment. Ari left the apartment. So this is very simple, but I want you guys to, to come up with your own answer to this. Find the conclusion, the reasons, and the assumptions in the argument. So I'll give you a, a, a bit of time. It, sh it should be pretty simple, but it's just going to show you what I mean. Um, with conclusion, reasons, and assumptions. Mm -hmm. So let's have like 30 seconds. We'll give it like 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, it shouldn't be too hard. It's not an actual question. I don't know when 30 seconds is up. All right, we can continue. So the conclusion is obviously Ari left the apartment. That's what I'm, that's, yeah, the conclusion is Ari left the apartment. You're right, Petra. Um, the reasons I heard a door open and close, I can't see him in the apartment. And the assumptions, this might be a little bit trickier, is I'm assuming that Ari is the one who opened and closed the door. And I'm assuming that if I can't see him in the apartment, that he's not in the apartment. And we'll get to that in a bit, what it means for this, um, what it means to find an assumption or what an assumption even is. But you'll see that without, these are the things that I'm accepting as true that I haven't written down. So it's kind of like my mental bridge between my reasons and my conclusion that have to be true in order for my conclusion to hold. But we'll get to that in a bit. Um, so we'll go over the first type of question. So the first type of question is finding the conclusion. Um, this is kind of the, the most popular question they're going to ask you is which of the following is the conclusion of the passage. And basically what a conclusion is, it's the most important uh, sentence of the paragraph or it's the author's biggest opinion or a call to action or a judgment. So it's basically the reason they wrote the passage. And um, the only time you're not going to find it is in the next type of question, but in all the other ones, there will be a conclusion and it's gonna be a very strong statement. Um, and it's, there's multiple ways you can find the conclusion. So there's gonna be certain indicators, like thus, therefore, in conclusion. So obviously they probably won't use in conclusion because that's a bit too easy, but there's gonna be, these are very strong. Uh, can they see my mouse when I'm circling? Or should I use the pencil? So these are very strong, um, should, must, and could. These are saying that this, this is the author's opinion about something. And usually that's, if it's a strong opinion and what all the other uh, reasons lead to it, then that's probably the conclusion. Um, and these are also possible, but they're less likely because that's pretty obvious. Um, so how do you find the conclusion? Basically, you're looking for the most opinionated sentence and it doesn't necessarily have to be at the end. This is a common misconception is that the reasons are in the beginning and then the conclusion will be at the end, but they can trick you um, by having the conclusion in the beginning and then justifying it with reasons. And that's gonna, that's a easy way that they can trip some people up. So don't rely on the fact that it's gonna be at the, at the end. And also if they're really tricky, they can have an, a conclusion, like a mini conclusion within it. So it makes sure that it's the overall conclusion and not just one conclusion based on one thing. Um, so it has to be the strongest overarching conclusion, not just a conclusion that's in there. 
And that's where some of the wrong answers are going to show up. And we'll talk about that later too. So this is, a, this is also another simple example. Ari has a crush on Sarah. He gets nervous when she's around. And there's another trick where you can do, which is, it's called the therefore test. So here I put the conclusion in the beginning on purpose because I want you guys to see that this is the conclusion. Ari has a crush on Sarah. It's pretty obviously that's the conclusion. That's the most opinionated sentence in the two sentences that I wrote. And then this next sentence justifies it. And even if it's in the beginning, it's still the conclusion. And I can do the therefore test where I can switch it around. So I can say, he gets nervous around her, therefore he has a crush on her. And you can do this. <laughs> yeah, what an example, it's a good example. Um, but you can do this with other, it, it can be a lot more complicated. There's gonna be lots of reasons, but you can just kind of strip the fat away, go to the main reasons that are there. And then, yeah. He gets, he has a crush on her, therefore, no, no, no. Other way around. Other way around. He gets nervous, therefore he has a crush. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that's, um, so what you're doing there is you're saying he has a crush on her, therefore he gets nervous. And your conclusion is there that he gets nervous, but that's not the actual conclusion. Um, it is possible, but it's misleading because it's not that he has a, it, it kind of is true that he has a crush on her, therefore he gets nervous. It does work, but the main thing is that um, because he's nervous, then my opinion is that he has a crush on him. But yeah, it can be a little bit tricky. But basically what, what, I, what I meant is within, this is a very simple example, so it could work. But in the IMAT, there are going to be multiple reasons and they're going to lead to a conclusion. And in order to see if that conclusion makes sense, take the reasons in the passage and say, therefore, and then the conclusion. This is a very simple example, so maybe it does reverse, but that's what I meant. Um, so this is, this is a BMAT question. I, I didn't want to use an IMAT question because you guys are probably pretty familiar with the questions in previous IMAT papers. So this is the first um, example question that we have for this type of question. I'll give you guys, let's say, I'll give you a minute and a half because this is the beginning. Yeah, but, but I think you should focus a bit. Guys, raise your hand if you can't. See the question? Tell me if you can see the question. Yeah, many can't. Can you please zoom? Okay, can you oh, zoom? Wow. Yeah. Maybe more. Can you guys read it? Can you go down a bit to see the DNA? Yeah, but first they have to read it. All right. All right. Can you guys read it? Let me wait. Yeah, but they need to see it. Yeah, let me All right, nice. All right. So. Okay, if you can see it, please raise your hand. If you still can't read it? Yeah. Oh, there's a couple who can't read it. All right. Mm. Guys, you should use the, because you have a um, slow internet connection, you should use the PowerPoint we sent on the group. Itself yeah. yeah, yeah. And open a presentation number 460, I think. Yeah, yeah. 60. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to open the poll now. OK. So you can answer the question. We are going to give it uh, one minute and a half. All right. I think it's been a bit. Um...
All right. All right. I think that's good. So. And I'm going to show the results now. Yeah. So we can see. Right. It seems like most people got it right. The answer is E. Whoops. The answer is E. Um, so let's see. Is luck of draw this for sure increasing? Skim, wait. So basically what I have to do is skim this passage and find the conclusion in 60 seconds. Yes, not, yeah. So you, this is what I'm doing when I'm reading the question. So I'm saying skip first, skip the question. Which of the following best expresses the main conclusion? I'm underlying that. I'm saying I'm looking for the conclusion. Evidence suggests that whatever, whatever. I, will, I read it already correctly, but I'm just going to skip it for now. Um, so basically, there's evidence that children who have parents that are married um, fare better. So the government is proposing a tax break for married couples. So they, they give them married couples money. And this is the main sentence that's showing me that this is the conclusion because that is a very opinionated sentence. The, the author is saying this idea is flawed for several reasons. That's the conclusion. And they're gonna justify it with their reasons further on. So first, this is the first reason it punishes whatever. Secondly, whatever. Thirdly, whatever. Um, and then this is absurd. Finally, it makes a bogus assumption. So basically that's the most opinionated sentence. Um, yeah. And it's, and it seems like most people got that right. So I think that's, um, so A, B, and C, no one, no one said D. But, so the reasons why it's not A, B, and C. So a poor relationship could be more damaging for a child than separation. Welcome back, Paris. Um, that's not necessarily the conclusion. A poor relationship, it, it could be true, but that's not the conclusion. That's not what all the paragraph is pointing towards. Um, if you're looking for the conclusion, it's the thing that all the other reasons and sentences are pointing to. Um, so B and C are the same. It's children whose parents are married tend to fare better than unmarried parties. That might be true, but that's not the conclusion. Uh, the last sentence could be used to make another question of assumption. Finally, it makes a bogus assumption that, yeah, we'll get to that in a bit. We'll get to that in a bit. All right, so we have another question. No, so, um, we'll zoom in again. so I'll zoom it in. This one's a short one. Yeah, so it's so like yeah. one minute and a half maybe again. Yeah. You use all your brain cells. Um, yeah, this is this sentence. Um, this paragraph is quite simple. The whole thing revolves around the fact that um, the I, that the idea of a seven day NHS is flawed. So this we should reevaluate the practicality of a seven day NHS is basically the only one that could be the answer. Um, so I see that. Three people said, A, we are entitled to a seven-day NHS. That's actually the opposite. 
of what's happening in the paragraph. Um, political parties have been pushing, they made people believe, while it may seem good at first, we need to consider the impact that this will have. So they're questioning, they're not necessarily saying that it's bad, but they're saying we should reevaluate how practical it is. But every, uh, most people got it right, it's like 90%. So yeah, it's basically it's just find, um, it, this one, th the sentence that will give you the answer is we must consider the impact that this will have on our NHS staff. And that's just saying reevaluate it. Yeah, it's the we must. Yeah. There's another one where I was, where one of the previous slides had said, we must is a very strong statement. Mm -hmm. And it's a pretty simple one. Later on, they'll have some, some more difficult questions. GPs can provide identical Medicare, medical care to hospitals. Nikul is asking, is E a reason? It's an addition, but it's not necessary in the text. So they're saying since 80% of cases in ED in weekends are issued, issues which could be dealt with GPs, how beneficial GPs can provide identical, but that's not the conclusion. Even if it were the case, and it kind of seems like that's what the paragraph is talking about, like it seems like it's a, a reasonable continuation of it. It's not the conclusion. That's not what the author is saying. Someone's asking, will we continue chemistry today? Yes, we have some more chemistry at the end and also math and physics. All right. Um, yeah, it's intense there, I know, but it's a good one before the IMAT five days. Should we have the important study materials? But we are basing our conclusion on E. No, not really. We're basing our conclusion. Oh. <laughs> uh, we're not really basing our conclusion on E. The conclusion is just that we need to reevaluate how practical it is. Because um, they're saying that the NHS staff will be have an impact on them. And on top of that, GPs could also help, but it's not really what we're basing it on. Yeah, it's also an assumption. Yeah. All right, that's D is the correct answer. Um, okay, so this is a, the second type of question. I was talking about this a little, a little bit before. Drawing a conclusion is slightly different. I mean, it's pretty different from the previous type of question. So this question is where within the passage we'll have reasons, but we won't have a conclusion. So in the previous type of question, it was the conclusion was in the answer, we just, it's just reworded slightly in the text, like here, for example, we should reevaluate the practicality. And in, this, in the paragraph, it says we must consider the impact. It's just rewording it. But in this case, the conclusion is not in the paragraph. You're giving a bunch of reasons and you gotta um, extrapolate what the conclusion of the author would be from the choices you're given. So we need to uh, come up with our own conclusion. So in this case, the method is, you're, first of all, this is for every question. You're going to read the prompt. You're going to look at the prompt. It's going to say, drawing a conclusion. You're going to read through the passage. You're going to find the reasons for that the author is giving. You're going to understand the author's reasoning, because this is important. You have to understand their perspective. Come to your own conclusion based off of the author's reasons without being biased. So you're not trying to put in your opinions or anything. You're just thinking, these are their author's reasons. What do I think the author's conclusion will be? And then to look for the answer that um, is associated with it. The fact that the whole thing is a question. Is it then an assumption? I'm not sure what you mean. Okay. Um, so I looked at some IMAT questions and I noticed that within the answers, usually they'll have conclusions which are just incorrect. Just you can't conclude that from the, from the paragraph. And then the trick is you have to find the difference between the answers that can be concluded from the paragraph, but aren't encapsulating all of the reasons and aren't the conclusion for the whole thing. Sometimes they'll give you a conclusion which is based off of one reason, but there's another one which is better, which is based off of all of the reasons and encapsulates the conclusion as a whole better. 
Um, and this is what I was saying before, you don't use your previous knowledge. If you're saying that, um, if you're finding the conclusion which you agree with based on your previous knowledge, that's gonna mislead you because you're trying to think of the conclusion that the author would give. So for example, if you had someone that believes that fish is amazing, I love eating fish and you don't like fish, it doesn't matter. The conclusion fish is amazing is still the conclusion that the author would give. If you see what I mean, it's not gonna be that obvious, but that's just like a simple example to understand it. Um, was clarifying the previous question. Oh, got it. So are we assuming a conclusion from the given reasons? So based off of facts, kind of, but not necessarily. So the, re the, the reasons that the author gives can be facts, but they might be flawed. That's the problem. That's where they might trick you. So they might be flawed reasons, but it's still the reasons that the author is giving. So kind of, yeah, based off of the facts in, that are present in the argument, you got to think what conclusion would the author come to? Just accept the passage the way it is. That's right. Um, and I'll give you guys an example. This is the first um, example that we're going to do. And let me know if you can't read it. If you can't read it, then you can use the PDF that's shared in the group. Yeah, just zoom in a little bit and just go down for the first question so they won't see the text, the first question. Yeah, exactly. What do you mean? Like this. Ah, okay. All right. Okay, so one minute and a half again. Oh, wait, wait. this is quest slide number 467 for Arshita. So it's a tough one. I think we are going to give them another minute for this one. So keep going. All right. All right. Okay, share the answers. So about 50%, 55% got it right. The answer is C. Politi politicians should give proper rationales for their decisions, not glib sound bites. And the wrong answers are pretty evenly split between A, B, D, and E. You're about to press send. I know that you got the right answer, Lucas. I trust it in my heart. Sorry, guys. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it was like over two minutes. So. This is how it feels, you know, we wanted to give you the actual feeling of what it's going to be like to do these questions quickly. Mm -hmm. But basically, an intensely irritating fashion among politicians is to use the sound bite. So I'm not sure if you guys know what sound bites are, but they're basically snippets of what people say 
and or like a, a catchphrase and the catchphrase is doing the right thing and they're using that to justify whatever action they're going to make um and what they're saying is it implies that if you don't agree you're an immoral person so basically this is saying there's no real argument to what my opinion is because you should do the right thing i'm implying that if you're not going to agree with me you're an immoral person and because people don't want to be immoral then they're going to want to agree with them but what this is saying is that if you continue that with you can if you continue with this logic then all you need is a politician who has some amazing ability to figure out oh what the right thing is and then there we go we can trust them and we don't really need um any accountability just like oh this guy knows what the right thing is so they know there we go um that's what paris was talking about with hey presto presto is not a person it's just like oh there we go um it was over two minutes yeah <laughs> Um, but yes, yeah, so if you go through the answer, sound bites are used to avoid proper explanations for decisions. This is not the conclusion. This is not a conclusion we can draw because that's not what the author is really saying. It could be true, but it's not really the point of the passage. The point, so it, without looking at the answers, I would say, look, the author is not agreeing that we should use sound bites. And they're saying that it's a logical fallacy. A fallacy is like a flaw in someone's argument. To, to use this soundbite and politicians, um, and they're giving a reason which is, oh, we just need to find someone that really knows what the right thing is. So we'll look through the answers. Politicians always think they know what the right thing to do is. That's not what the author is really concluding. Politicians should have proper rationales for their decision, not glib soundbites. That's what they're saying. The, the author is saying that these soundbites aren't enough. You can't just say, you should do the right thing by agreeing with me. You need to have a real reason for your argument. Um, drawn would mean not the direct conclusion, but what could be taken or drawn out of the conclusion. Not, not, not really. No, no, no. Drawn means that there isn't, the conclusion isn't in the paragraph. You need to come up with your own conclusion based off what you think um, the author would conclude or based on their reasons. So here, the reasons would be, so basically um, the reasons would be you can't use these sound bites. You need to actually justify the phrase is, implies whatever. If you conclude, if you continue with this thinking, that happens. And then those are the author's reasons. I'm going to use those reasons to think what would the author conclude based off of these reasons. My show, let's see. If I can conclude from the bottom. Okay. I, um, I, I think you guys got it, right? Yeah. I don't want to dwell too much yeah. for the people right. that didn't get it. All right, this is the next question. Same type, what conclusion can be drawn? Maybe zoom a bit more. Yeah, I'm going All right. on.
All right, so this is kind of a tough one. Um, did you share the poll results? Yes. So you can see that, yeah, the answer is D. D is the correct answer, 50% got it. A is another tricky one. So I can see that 23% picked A and it's kind of understandable um, because A seems like it's true. It seems like, although everyone knows the uh, Olympics are caught up in politics, no one is brave enough to admit it. That kind of seems like what the case is, but that's not what they're saying. If you look here, this is the word they use, foolish. So they're saying that people are foolish to believe that the Olympics are free of politics. They're not saying that they know it, but they're not brave enough to admit it. That would, they're not saying that they're not brave enough, they're saying that they're fools. Um, and national interests are ruining the Olympics. That's not what the author is saying. Uh, just because the Olympics have been politicized doesn't mean they should be. That's also not what the author is saying. Just because the Olympics have, um, have been, they're not saying they're. How, okay, so guy asks, how is this exposing a myth? So we'll look at question D. If some countries use the Olympic uh, movement to further their own ends, they're guilty only of exposing a myth. The, the reason this is tricky is because what they mean by myth isn't necessarily always obvious. What they mean is the myth that the Olympics are, um, are free of politics. So that's why one of the foolish but persisting fantasies of the Olympic movement is that they ought to be completely free of politics. And they're saying that this is a foolish belief. And another way to say foolish belief is myth. So they're saying that if they do use the Olympic movements um, to further their own ends, they're exposing this fantasy. So that's where the trick is, where another way of saying fantasy is myth. And because they're saying myth, it kind of, it's tricky. The passage is saying that the Olympic Games have never been free of politics. It is thus a myth that they are, not, are free of politics. If a nation does further their own myth, movement, I think they mean movement, it exposes the myth. Yeah, I think you got it, Ivar, or Ivar, I'm not sure how you pronounce it. Yeah, but I think, um, and E is just not what the author is saying at all. We should do everything possible to ensure the Olympics do not become further politicized. That's not what the author is saying. So basically, B, C, and E are just not what the author is saying. A and D depend on if you understand, um, if you under, this, this is testing if you really understand what's going on, because A could be correct. It's almost right, but it's not really what they're saying. And then th I think they threw in the word myth to kind of throw you off. Because if they just said fantasy, then it would be pretty obvious because they use the word fantasy there. So that, those are the kind of tricks you want to be careful of. You want to understand, this is why I said, if you have the ability to come up with your own answer before looking at the with the answers that they give you because if you're ignoring this and you're looking for the conclusion you would say okay they're trying to say that um that the olympics that if they do use the olympics then they're only just showing people the fantasy or the realities all right okay third type of question this is finally it the assumptions. This is what I was talking about before. So first of all, what is an assumption? An assumption is something that the author must believe to be true. Uh, something that the author must believe to be true for the conclusion to follow from the reasons. So we'll, we'll say that these are the reasons one, two, three. In order to get to my conclusion, there's something that bridges it. There's something that I am thinking, I'm assuming in my head that I haven't written that is correct, that is not written, that, I, that needs to be the case in order for my conclusion to follow from the reasons. That's what an ass assumption is. So it is the unwritten link. It must be unwritten. If it's written there, it's not an assumption. And a common trap is a statement that the author could believe to be true, but isn't needed for the conclusion to hold. So, in these types of questions, a lot of the times the wrong answer will be something that makes sense, something that the author would believe. But if you, I'll show you on how to figure how to figure this out later. But if you actually figure it out, you'll notice that it doesn't have to be true for the conclusion to hold. That's the biggest thing. An assumption has to be true for the conclusion to hold based on the reasons given. 
Um, so for what is the conclusion I take directly from the text for drawing a conclusion, I paraphrase from what I understand. Yeah, pretty much it. All conclusions should come from the text, not from your personal opinion. That's also for every conclusion. It has to come from the text, not from your opinion for drawing. You come up with your own conclusion that you think the author would believe based on their reasons for drawing a conclusion. It's there already. You just have to find it. All right. So the method that you do, Number one, you can underline if you want. Underline or just find the conclusion. Find the reasons, and then you have to find the unwritten link that connects the reasons and the conclusion that the conclusion relies on. That's the important thing. It has to rely on it. And this is a very easy example. I like to use these simple examples to understand, to help you guys understand what I mean. So, Timmy is fat because he eats a lot of cake. So, obviously, this is a reason Timmy is fat. No, uh, Timmy is fat is the conclusion because he eats a lot of cake is the reason. Cake makes you fat. <laughs> so find the assumption. I don't think this should take too long. Um, if you guys wanna write in the chat, that could also be cool. So Timmy is fat, that's my conclusion. I've seen that he is fat. And the reason is because he eats a lot of cake. The assumption, eating cake makes you fat, okay. The cake made him fat because he eats a lot of cake. Cake is a lie. <laughs> Can you show the last slide again, please, really quick? Yep. Eating Timmy makes you fat. <laughs> All right. Actually, this is, I, I think I was wrong. This is a stupid, um, simple sentence, but the, I don't think the conclusion is written. Timmy is fat because he eats all of cake is the conclusion, but there's no reasons. But <laughs> that, 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 that's aside from the point. This is a very simple example. But so what I said the assumption was, is the only way you can get fat is by eating a lot of cake. So what, I, what you guys wrote is um, because he eats a lot of, uh, eating cake makes you fat. So there's a way we can test that. It's called the negation test. So this is how you test if you found the assumption. Take your answer and reverse it. So it means um, flip it around and negate it. So that means, I'll, I'll take Ivar's example, eating cake makes you fat. We'll say eating cake does not make you fat. So eating a lot of cake, this is my example, eating a lot of cake is not the only way to get fat. It's pretty much the same thing. If the conclusion no longer makes sense, then you found the answer. So Timmy got fat, be, um, is because of eating a lot of cake if there are other reasons he could have gotten fat right there's if the only way he got fat is by eating cake then that's the reason but if there are other possibilities then that's not necessarily true so let's reverse evars eating cake makes you fat let's say eating cake does not make you fat and then we'll take the question again timmy is fat because he eats a lot of cake but eating cake does not make you fat that makes no sense. So you got the right answer. So that's the assumption. I was just a little bit more specific. Um, so you make people fat is my assumption. You are what you eat. Kind of, yeah. You are not what you eat. Uh, that's, a, that's a tough one. These taxes and methods are awesome, but in order to remember them, I'll read them. No, don't read them at the last minute. So the point of showing you this is not that you just kind of read these tactics and then try to memorize them. That's not really the point. You want to try to uh, practice using them so that in the test, you're comfortable with doing them and it's kind of um, second nature. So by now, when I'm doing these types of questions, like I'll go back to this other example with this one, I read this part before I read this part automatically. I didn't even think about it. I just read it first and then went back to that because I've done it so many times. So you want to get used to doing this so that it makes sense. And it's just become, like, you don't want to be thinking about, oh, so, okay, Shalev said I should be underlined and then Shalev said I should read this first. It just becomes like, do practice so that it becomes easy. Um, if Timmy is fat from all the cakes, we <laughs> Okay. I think you guys get the point with assumptions, right? This is the first type of question. If you ever want to have any questions about assumption. Yeah, they're the hand is the same. Okay. Yeah, good. Raising the hand means they have a question, right? No, raising the hand means they agree with you. Oh, 
approving them. Oh, okay. Are you guys ready? Okay. I'll give you the first question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, like maybe zoom it in a bit more. Exactly. Okay. Like uh, two minutes? No, let's something. do two minutes. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right, guys, two minutes. So what I'm seeing is usually only two thirds of you guys are answering it in two minutes. So I would say you guys probably need some more practice with using these techniques and reading through these problems faster because at the moment doing two minutes is fine. Like you can, you can take the IMAT, do two minutes, but the way you get the extra advantage is by saving time in these types of questions, getting them right, and then using that time in other places. Okay, so did you show them the answer? Yes, I'm showing the answer. Okay, so the answer is D. Um, and most people got it right. 70% got it right. And we'll go through why that's the reason. So first of all, what I'm doing, what is an underlying assumption? Underline that first. So it's not always clear whether or not the doctors tell the truth. On one hand, whatever. So they can make an informed decision. It is simple human rights. But on the other hand, so they're weighing it. So they're saying on the one hand, um, it's the patient's right. On the other hand, a patient sometimes it is better served not knowing. They give an example. A doctor may believe that a patient's medical condition would be at worst. Therefore, there are cases in which the doctor has no choice. So without looking at the answers, I'm thinking, so they're saying on the one hand, it's the patient's right to know. On the other hand, the doctor, um, it's, sometimes it's, it's better for their health if they don't know. And therefore, the doctor, um, there are cases where the doctor has to deceive the patient. The connection between that, the thing that we must believe to be true in order for the, those two things to make sense, is that the doctor's responsibility for the patient's health is more important than their right to know. Because if, if it wasn't the case, then the conclusion makes no sense from the reasons. If we flip it, doctors have a greater responsibility for, no. The, the, pa the patient has a great responsibility. No, sorry. <laughs> the patient's right to know is more important than the, than the doctor's responsibility for the patient's well-being. If that were the case, then the conclusion would make no sense following the reasons, because in that case, the doctor should just always tell them the truth. So in that case, D is correct. But I've seen that the most popular wrong answer is A. Patients accept that a doctor has a responsibility to decide what will be in their best interest. 
This is the tricky part because that could be the case. That might be true. Patients accept that doctors give them the responsibility to decide what we mean. That's true. Like patients do have to accept that because that's the way it is. They might not accept it. It doesn't necessarily, like it could be the case, but that's not the point of the, that's not the assumption. Like let's take it the opposite way. Patients don't accept that a doctor has a greater responsibility. Does that mean the conclusion doesn't follow? No. The patients could not accept it, but still, if the, if the doctor has um, a greater responsibility for the patient's health, it doesn't matter what the patients think. So A is wrong if we do the negation test. This is a very good trick. So we'll cancel A. Doctors have a duty to conceal the truth if they believe it will frighten the patient. This is, okay, this is kind of two, there's two problems with this. First of all, it's kind of the conclusion. That's kind of what the conclusion is, just restated, but that's not the question, what the question is asking. And also, not necessarily true. It's not if they believe it will frighten the patient. Because that, it could frighten the patient and not harm their health, but they should still tell them the truth. But if it frightens the patient and harms their health, then they have the responsibility. So that's kind of a double whammy. It's like, yes, first of all, it's just basically the rewording the conclusion, but it's rewording the conclusion slightly incorrectly. Because it's not just about frightening the patient, it's about making sure that they're healthy or not harming them. Yes. Sorry, I wasn't really looking at the chat. Um, I guess A is wrong because whether patients accept that or not doesn't matter. It's a good distractor, yeah. So this is the conclusion and slightly wrong. Doctors have a duty to tell their patients the truth, even when the truth would upset them. That's just another, that's also not really an assumption. It's just kind of the conclusion. And then E is the responsibility of doctors. Wait, that, no, actually wrong. C is completely wrong because C is just the opposite. Doctors don't have a duty to tell their patients the truth, even when it would upset them. That's the opposite of what the author is saying. The author is saying, um, that the doctor doesn't have a duty to tell the, the patient if it would upset them to the point where it would harm their health. And then E is the responsibility of the doctor to respect the patient's human rights, whatever their medical condition, also wrong. That's not what they're saying at all. They're not saying that it's the doctor's responsibility to a patient's human rights. They're saying that in some cases, the doctor has the ability to overcome that or override that if they believe it's in the patient's best interest. And that necessitates that the patient's responsibility for the, uh, the doctor's responsibility for the patient's health is more important than the patient's right to know. I think you guys got that. Okay, we have another question for assumptions. This is a, this is a tricky one. So maybe we'll zoom in to see one, two, and three, and four, and um, wait with the answers later because it's too little in my opinion. Guys, can you see? Please raise your hand if you can see that. No, raise your hand if you can't see, no. <laughs> no, they can see it. They can, they can. Okay, stop raising your hand. Now <laughs> raise your hand if you can't see it. Okay, fine, I'll zoom in here and then we'll see the answers later. Yeah. All right, so let's start. Okay, I'll give you, I'll give you guys like a minute and a half and then I'll show the answers.
All right, this is a tough one. I'll let you guys have some more time. There's lots of answers. All right, guys, three minutes. So most people, 40% said A, and the answer is A. So this was pretty split, but most, a lot of people said C. So let's go over them. Um, so first thing I'm doing, what is the number of uh, assumptions of the argument? First thing I'm doing is looking at that. Then go to the question, praise an expression of recognition, Recognition and status are important. No matter how well paid someone is, nothing will compensate. By the same token, someone who feels recognized, whatever. The most valuable kind of praise is that which the recipient knows to be appropriate. And praise should only be given to the extent that it is deserved. These are the two important sentences. Let's analyze the first one. We'll do the negation test. So people can accurately assess the recognition they deserve. If we flip it, people can't assess the recognition they deserve. So if people can't assess the recognition they deserve, the most valuable kind of praise is that which the recipient knows to be appropriate. If people can't assess the recognition they deserve, that makes no sense. So one has to be the case. People who give praise can assess the level of praise which is deserved. Let's flip it. People who give praise can't assess the level of praise which is deserved. And then here they're saying, praise should only be given to the extent that it is deserved. If you can't know the level that someone deserves, then how should it be given at the extent which is deserved? So two has to be the case. So already we know that the answer is A. But for the, for the sake of the people who got it wrong, we'll continue. So promoting others' self-esteem is a duty we all share. Let's flip it. Promoting others' self-esteem is not a duty we all share. Does the conclusion still make sense? Do these last important sentences still make sense? The most valuable kind of praise is that which the a recipient knows to be appropriate, praise should only be given to the extent that it is deserved. Still, still applies. Even if it's not a duty we all share, for the people who do it, this still applies. So it's not necessarily true. This is where the negation, oh, okay, Alex doesn't understand the technique. It's what I'm, it's what I'm doing right now. So you kind of flip the reason, flip the assumption on its head and do the opposite. So if I say the sky is blue, the sky is not blue, that kind of that, like do the opposite of what the assumption is saying. So people can becomes people can't. People who give praise can't instead of can, and then see if it still applies. Because this is, this is the important thing with this. If you flip it and it completely makes no sense, that means that it was important for the arguments to make sense. It, it's important for the conclusion to follow from the reasons. When it's essential that the assumption makes sense, if you make it make no sense and the conclusion falls apart, then it means that it was in, important. Think about if you have a building which is based off of a couple columns. You break one of the columns and it falls down, you know that column was important. That's kind of what we're doing. We're testing the limits of these assumptions and if they don't stand it, yeah, I think Alex gets it. You guys don't let this uh, tough question demotivate you because the point of this marathon is to spot your weakness. Yes, exactly. You have enough time until the IMAT and you can solve everything and practice again, so don't worry. It's, we are showing yeah. hard questions on purpose to, so you can see exactly Thanks, which uh, critical thinking skill you should revise again. It's very important. And Harshita asks, aren't the assumptions similar to the conclusion? They're not similar to the conclusion. Um, because 
the conclusion is written and the assumption is not. The assumption is something that it is relied upon that is not written that you need to find. So my previous example was that Ari, um, I heard the door opening and closing. I can't see Ari, therefore he left the house. That, the, therefore that he left the house relies on the reasons, but I'm making connections. I'm, I'm assuming that if I can't see him, he's not there. And I'm assuming that if someone opened it, it was him. If I flip that, and if I say he wasn't the one to open the door, and just because I can't see him doesn't necessarily mean he's not in the house, then the sentence doesn't, the conclusion makes no sense. But it's not like the conclusion assumption are different. I think that kind of makes sense. I think we should move on. Um, okay. So four out of seven, we're almost there guys. So additional evidence. This is the type of question where they say, which of the following statement weakens or strengthens the argument in the passage? Um, in this case, the strategy is to apply each of the answer choices to the passage and ask yourself if it strengthens or weakens the conclusion. And the important thing is that it validates or disproves an assumption which the conclusion relies on. No, 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 no. The conclusion is not flipped. The, no, no, no. So flipping the assumption is just a way that I was using to test if the assumption is what the author is relying on. So think of it like this, right? You have a building and, you know, let's say you're playing Jenga and some of the Jenga pieces aren't really important. You can move them away and the structure is fine. There are assumptions that don't actually matter very much, but some of the pieces, you move them and the whole thing falls down. So what I'm doing is I'm flipping the assumption to test if the building or if the conclusion will fall down when that piece is moved, when I move that piece. That's basically what I'm doing. The conclusion is not the flip of the assumption. That's the, flipping the assumption is just a way to identify if the assumption is that or not. Thanks, Paris. Okay, so additional evidence. Um, so under, the reason I'm sticking on with this is because understanding the assumption is very important, not only for the questions with assumptions, which are pretty popular, but also for other ones like this one, because the assumption is the weakness in the argument. You know, when you're debating someone and they have a flawed assumption, that is, the, that is where you have to strike at because the flaw in their argument is the weakness because it's something that they're not saying which the conclusion relies on. And if the thing that the conclusion relies on is incorrect or flawed, then the conclusion is incorrect or flawed. That's why this is really important that you guys understand how to find a conclusion, uh, an uh, assumption. And this is what this relies on because in the case of strengthening, if the sent statement increases the possibility that, that the conclusion is correct or makes it more valid or strengthens the assumption, then that will overall strengthen the conclusion. So an example would be if we, let's go back to the building analogy, right? We have a building and we have the columns. If I, me and Ari go and we want to strengthen the, the building and we go to one of the columns that doesn't actually matter. We go to some random column in the corner. If you break it down, the building is fine. And then we build it up and we strengthen it. The overall building is not strengthened. If we go to the main central pillar, which the whole building is foundation, like is built upon, and we strengthen it and we build upon it, then we are strengthening the whole building. We're strengthening the conclusion, which is the like the big the big part. So that's why finding the, the assumption is important. And so weakness is kind of the opposite. You're looking for the answer choice, which makes it either less likely, less valid, or you're de debunking, dismissing the assumption. So you deny the assumption, you question the evidence, you add evidence, which weakens the argument, or you question a claim of causation where there's only, uh, uh, where there's only, this should be correlation, sorry. This is, okay, kind of, this isn't really important right now because we'll go over that in, in the next one or in one of the next ones, which is about flaws. But basically, if there is a flaw in the assumption and then the sentence identifies that flaw, then it weakens it. I think this is gonna be easier to explain when we give examples. Um, so the method that you're gonna use, 
Identify what you're looking for, weaken or strengthen. You want to be in the mindset. Find the assumptions and the, and the conclusion. Ask yourself if each answer choice strengthens or weakens, and then discard and decide. So it's basically like the other ones. Um, you look at the answer choices and identify it. And in this case, ask yourself which one most strengthens or weakens, because some of them still strengthen or weaken, but some of them are not the most. Uh, I have to leave. Yeah, it's getting late. It's getting thank pretty you so late. much to stay for this long. Thanks, Abdul. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we are going to finish in about one and a half hours. We are going to do math and physics, and that's it. The rest of the presentation you, can, you will be able to see on the Endomed School. Uh, and again, if you can't access the Domatoes only sub forum, please PM me on the website, and I will open it for you. And thank you so much for staying. All right. Yeah, thanks, Abdul. We're almost done with logic, with critical thinking. Yeah. There's going to be seven, and then we're going to move on to math and physics, which shouldn't take too long, right? Yeah. And then, then you guys are done. Yeah, you can also solve it by yourself, basically, but we want to show some uh, simple explanations of uh, Ohm's law and stuff in physics. They are usually awesome. It's super easy. So mm -hmm. uh, it might be a good idea to stay a couple bit more, like one and a half. One yeah. And a half. yeah. All right. All right. Falling to cover for a couple of years. All right, we're gonna do yeah. the first type of question for this. Yeah, the amount of work I spent this year. Wait, how do you mean? This marathon is nothing, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll do what I did last time then. Yeah. We'll zoom in. And okay, you can mute it. Can you give me the answer choices? Yeah, let me just uh, start the poll so they can answer it. Okay. And, uh, we launch on the right. So two minutes. Mm -hmm. We are going to do general knowledge right after this one. Just showing you the general um, thing they are asked on usually, and we are going to provide an Anki deck on the website, which you can use in the next four days, which is very specifically for the AMP exam based on past papers. Oh, sorry. I'm not sure if you guys can see that. Most people got it right. Yeah. The answer is A. I'm surprised. This is a tricky one. Um, okay, if we go through, if we do what we talked about before, let's find the assumption. So in the UK, the accident rate for young people is high, more, more than whatever, passed the driving test in the first attempt, were killed. So to reduce the loss of life, the driving test should require a higher level of mastery and driving skills. 
than it does in the present. In this way, whatever, whatever, whatever. The assumption is that young male drivers are unskilled at driving. And that is why a lot of them died. He's saying we need to require a higher level of mastery. He's assuming that at the moment, the young male drivers aren't skilled. And if we look at the, the phrases, many of the young male drivers involved in serious accidents are highly skilled in driving techniques. This directly negates the assumption. If the whole assumption is, if the whole passage is based on the fact that young male drivers are unskilled, and then this is saying that they actually are skilled, you're completely destroying his argument. So this is true. Serious accidents are more likely to occur when young male drivers or when young drivers are accompanied by a number of young passengers. This is kind of tricky because it might be the case. It might, it kind of makes sense as a reason for why um, there, it makes sense as a reason for why young male drivers have a higher rate of injury, but it doesn't necessarily negate it doesn't really weaken his argument because his, his argument is about if they're um, skilled or not. So it's not too. And then the accident rates are lower in countries where dri young drivers are required to have 100 hours of driving experience before taking the test. Accident rates are lower in countries where young drivers are required to have 100 hours of driving experience. Yeah, thanks, thanks. Like, oh yeah, that strengthens it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was confused because I was like, what? This strengthens it. Why is it wrong? But yeah, it strengthens it instead of weakens it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think you guys get it. I think yeah. I was surprised. You guys did really well. I thought yeah, it would be more difficult. That was a good one. I like nice. It. We have one more assumption question. We have two um two for each questions for each. Yeah. Like five more, I think we have. So 15 more minutes. Let's keep going. Yeah. All right. Okay, that's weird. Guys, okay. you're saying easy peasy, lemon squeezy, but 87% got it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> easy peasy, lemon squeezy. No, it's not B. It's D. D is the right answer. Why did everyone say B? Let's look at it. Let's, let's analyze it together. Okay. So, yeah. 
So let's, let's do it. Which of the following most weakens the argument? Undoubtedly, early upbringing affects your social adjustment in later life. A recent, demonstrate, uh, a recent study demonstrated that parents of children who act, uh, of parents who act aggressively towards their offspring grow up as violent adults. Con consequently, if we could stop parents behaving aggressively towards our children, we would eliminate scripture report. Okay. So, the conclusion is if we could stop parents from behaving aggressively towards their children, we'd be able to eliminate a significant portion of violence from our society because they're saying that early upbringing makes you more violent as an adult. Okay, so A, it is not possible to legislate against aggressive behavior. Legislation has nothing to do with it. They're just saying if it were possible, that would be good. So A doesn't matter. And I don't think many people, okay, two people, okay. okay. Um, in many cases, children who are treated violently by their parents make sure that their own children do not suffer in the same way. I could see how that's a very popular answer because it seems like if the children, if the parents make sure that their children do not suffer in the same way, then this whole paragraph makes no sense. But if you think about it carefully, what they're saying is parents who act aggressively, this is saying treated violently. There's a difference. You could act aggressively towards your kids without treating them violently. There's a slight difference. And they're saying in many cases, um, children who are treated violently by their parents make sure that their children do not suffer in the same way. That could, it could be the case that they just suffer in a different way. It's not necessarily striking exactly where it should be. They can be violent in different aspects of society. Um, it's not necessarily, they can, it's not about different aspects of society, but the parents could treat their kids aggressively or violently in different ways because they're saying in the same way. So it's like, oh, if my dad hit me, I'm not going to hit my kid. Because I also chose B. But if I'm <laughs> screaming at my kid, that could still lead to him being more aggressive as an adult. Yeah. But I'm still not hitting him. So it's not really hitting, um, it's not really weakening it. D is... Continuing poverty and deprivation are the major are the major causes of aggressive behavior in both adults and their children. So what this is saying is that this is all correlation. This is saying that actually it's not the, it, like it could be the fact that aggression has to do with it, but maybe there's a third option. Maybe the poverty is and deprivation is leading to aggression, and the aggression is just associated with poverty. So it could be that children who, are grow, who grow up in poor uh, families are more likely to be aggressive. And as a consequence, their parents are also more um, likely to be aggressive to them. This is a very tricky question. <laughs> you want to act aggressively because I chose me and it's wrong. It's a very tricky question. I'm so, yeah. But this is why it's important to, to check which one directly affects the assumption because if d is true the whole the assumption that parents acting aggressively to their kids will lead to uh kids that are more or adults that are more aggressive if there's a different reason that is proven you're completely targeting that and you're destroying the argument All right, if you guys get it, we can move on. Yeah, that's a hard one. But isn't the argument that we can lower violence? No, the, uh, the, uh, the argument is if we were able to, okay, let's, let's look at it like this, right? The conclusion is, if we could stop parents behaving aggressively towards their children, we would be able to eliminate a significant portion of violence. If the problem is actually about poverty and deprivation, then that makes no sense. If the actual problem is that poor people are more likely to be aggressive, and then you just stop parents from being aggressive to their children, they're still gonna be aggressive because they're still poor. So that most weakens it. You see what I mean? Did you get it? A saufa, saufa.
Right. Maya says, it, yeah. If the problem is in the kids being poor, the parents, and it's not necessarily that the parents are treating them aggressively, then it would make sense that making the parents treat them less aggressively wouldn't really solve the problem. You chose to answer this person with the passage, what? <laughs> okay, you guys got it now? It's a, it's a very tricky one, but it kind of shows you how you should be like looking for these kind of tricks because I've looked at, I'm at logical or critical thinking questions and usually three of them are just completely wrong. Three of them just don't really get the point. You have two of them, which are, which might be true. One of them, which seems like it could be true, but it isn't really true. And one of them, which is actually true. So you got to be able to identify which is which. That's why you have to come up with your answer before looking at the answer choices. That way you don't fall into the trap. All right, I think we, we looked at this for long enough. Um, flaws in the argument. This is my favorite. I love flaws in the argument. <laughs> okay, I'm moving on, moving on, Paris. So finding flaws in the argument feels really good. You know, you, someone gives you an argument and you're like, actually, that is a straw man fallacy and you're actually ad hominem. And it makes you feel really good because you're kind of poking holes in the argument. And it kind of feels good when you're doing these questions as well because you're reading the argument and you're like, actually, there's a flaw here and you catch it and you got it right and you're kind of breaking down their, their um, argument. It, it feels really good. So this is like my favorite type of question. So what, that, what the question asks is to find the flaw. Some of them are really easy to spot and, they're and others are based off of incorrect assumptions. So if you find the assumption, you find the flaw. So if they're saying one, two, three leads to conclusion and you're saying this is incorrect, then the whole conclusion is incorrect because the definition of assumption is something that the conclusion relies on. So if there's a flaw in the assumption, there's a flaw in the conclusion. And another thing is if the conclusion is built off of incorrect reasons, but that's not usually the case. So general method, find the conclusion. If you found the flaw, it's obvious you found the flaw. If not, find the assumption and examine if the assumption makes sense, if it's valid, if it's strong, or if it's flimsy. So here's an example. Num okay, I, I made this up. The number of shark attacks is correlated. No, this is actually a, a common um, correlation versus causation thing. This is actually true. Um, shark attacks is correlated to the amount of ice cream people eat. Therefore, I'm scared of, I'm scared of, of sharks, so I'm not going to eat ice cream. What's the assumption here? No, no, we find a conclusion and make a flaw about it. Kind of. You think about it like this, right? Someone built a building based off of these pillars, which are assumptions. In order to break down the building, you break down the, the pillars in order for the whole building to collapse. So because the conclusion relies on assumptions, if you find a flaw in the assumption, you found a flaw in the conclusion. So people are saying, if you eat ice cream, you're more likely to get attacked by a shark. Eating ice cream causes you to get yes, if it thinks yes. Yeah. And what are they, what's, what are they, um, correlation is not causation, right? That's the first type of flaw. Yeah. Nice catch, nice catch, Michaelis. So the conclusion is that the person won't eat ice cream. The assumption is that since shark attacks and ice cream consumption are correlated, one causes the other. That's the first type of flaw. The first type of flaw is correlation versus causation. So if you guys don't know what correlation is, basically, let's say I graphed the number, so number of shark attacks. And then this is time. So if these are the months, like this is the middle, this is the summer, right? Winter, almost no shark attacks. Summer, a lot. Winter again, none. And then if I graph the, num the amount of ice cream people eat, it's also, it's low during the winter, high during the summer, low again during the winter. Correlation means when you graph them, it seems like they're following the same pattern. But it doesn't necessarily mean that one causes the other. So it could be that there's a common factor that in the summer, people go to the beach. When people are at the beach, they're more likely to get attacked by sharks and they're more likely to eat ice cream. And also it's hotter. So people like to eat ice cream when it's hot. 
So an assumption, so the assumption is because they're correlated, it's causal, but that's a flawed assumption. So you find the assumption, you find the flaw. Let's, let's continue. Um, this is another type of, of flaw, absolute numbers versus percentages. So the flaw relates to where the author equates percentages with real numbers. So I heard in Shark Tank one time, I think it was Kevin O'Leary, he was like, would you rather have 10% of a watermelon or 50% of a grape? Which that makes sense, right? Like a watermelon is massive. 10% of it is really big. But if you take 50% of a grape, that's nothing. So even though it seems like 50% is greater, you need to keep in mind what the numbers relate to. You need to keep in mind the absolute numbers which the percentage re um, relates to. The fact that two events occur together doesn't mean that one, yes, you're right, Petra. So here's an example. More people in Milan purchase organic and free range foods compared to any in Pavia. Therefore, people in Milan are more health conscious. What's the assumption and what's the flaw here? Do you, do you guys see it? And if you're extra observant, you'll find the extra flaw, which I'm going to continue off of. So more people in Milan purchase organic and free range foods. Therefore, people in Milan are more health conscious. So obviously, I was just talking about absolute numbers and percentages. So it has something to do with that. It's not taking into account a population. Nice. You got it. It's saying more people. Right? I don't actually know the populations. But if Milan has, I'm just throwing a random number. I have no idea. How much do you think Milan like? I don't know. Two million? How but, many? How many of you guys think? Let's say yeah. 2 million people in Milan. How many people in Pavia? Like 300,000? 70,000. Seven, whatever, 70,000. I don't know. I'm really bad at population tests. <laughs> if, let's say, 200,000 people in Milan buy free range foods, and let's just say every single person in Pavia buys free range, organic, all of that health stuff. Let's say it's 70,000. People in Milan are more health conscious, right? 200,000 people in Milan compared to 70,000 in Pavia. But every single person in Pavia is buying free range food. You got it, Omar. Population plus, it assumes that buying health foods means you are conscious and it doesn't mention any other reasons. You got it exactly on the nose. Nice. Exactly. You got it right, Leon, as well. That's the next point. It might be the case that people in Milan are more health conscious. The author is not taking into account the percentage of people. If you paid extra attention, you would find the second flaw. And Leanne and Omar did get it. I'm not sure if other people, if you did, very good job. The assumption is that purchasing organic and free range food means that you're health conscious. It's a flawed assumption because there's other possibilities. It could be that there's less availability of free range organic foods in Pavia. It could be that it's more expensive and people here have less um, available income. It's a flawed assumption. This is exactly what I'm saying. So the previous example was a good example of both the absolute numbers and percentages and overlooking alternatives. This is when they say definitive statements. You know when those passages were like, therefore, this must be the case. It is definitely true that. It is certain that. This is saying 100% sure this means that. But in almost every case, there are other reasons it could be true, right? So it's ignoring the possibility of other alternatives, even if it's more likely, right? So this is, an, this is an easy example, right? The lights are on in the neighbor's house. Therefore, they must be awake. You see how I use the word must? If I said probably, that would be completely different. I'm not, the word probably entails that there's a possibility that something else might be a ca the case, but this is the most likely outcome, or this is the most likely situation. The word must says the only reason that the lights are on in the neighbor's house are there is because they are, they're awake, right? So the author is ignoring the possibility that they maybe forgot to turn the lights off or someone is That's scared of the dark. Yeah, exactly. Where, where? There is. 
This is met throughout all the online questions. When you see oversimplifications, all, must, generally, yes, Paris. Yeah. Exactly. If there is all, must, red flag, you should, you should definitely, if it says all or must, in all sections. check it. Yeah. All sections. Make sure, check it. Because something is up. It might still be true, but your red flag should go up. You should be more alert. You could also reduce, probably, probably would have made a statement not flawed. True. Yes, Petra. If it said probably, it would not be flawed. So the point is you can't jump to conclusion and state that one conclusion is the only one when others are possible. You can't say this must be true if there are other possible cases. Okay, so logical comparisons. This is where you compare two things that seem like you can compare them, but it's not logically reasonable. You can't actually compare them. Here's an example. The percentage of people driving cars has been steadily rising while the number of people taking the bus has decreased. This means that people are abandoning public transport for, public, uh, for personal means of travel. You see what I mean? You guys see the flaw in this argument? The ones that decreased could have been more in number. This also has to do with another flaw. Yeah, percentage versus absolute. So maybe if you're looking at the absolute numbers of people driving cars and people taking the bus, it could have a different picture. It's not necessarily true that the conclusion follows the reasons. But because, because the percentage has to do with number over total pop which is population, right? So if the number of people driving cars over the total population, right? What if the population changes? What if the population goes up? What if the population goes down? That will alter the percentage. Whereas the number of people won't change based on the population. It will, and that has to do with other things but it doesn't directly affect it, right? Like it doesn't directly affect it, but it will, this is another assumption, right? The, the other assumption is that because more people of the other flaws, because more people are taking the bus or fewer people are driving cars, that means that uh, people are abandoning public transport. There could be other reasons. Doesn't necessarily mean. There are other reasons, yeah. So first of all, absolute number versus percentages, and also it's uh, other reasons. You guys are getting good at this. So the next one, projecting. This is especially the case, like the fun thing with this is when I was studying for the IMAT, I was able to argue with people better because I, these are very common in like verbal arguments. So projecting is where someone will take a small group of people, which is usually, and usually associate it with a large group of people. And a lot of the times it's a subset of that population. Um, I'll give you an example, a simple example. There are many stories of Rottweilers biting and injuring people. Rottweilers should be banned, right? In this case, the person is associating the action of a small group, which is Rottweilers. Rottweilers are a small group in the category of dogs. So Rottweilers are a subsection of the population of dogs, right? And they're assuming that because even if, let's assume, right? Even if Rottweilers were more dangerous, which is another flaw because we'll talk about that in a bit, that doesn't necessarily mean that all Rottweilers are, are, are I'm sorry, just because the few that are in these stories are aggressive doesn't mean that all Rottweilers should, um, should be banned. The, the few in the stories shouldn't be extrapolated to all Rottweilers because there could be other situations, right? Maybe people in poorer places or people who want protection purposefully get aggressive Rottweilers to protect themselves. And then that causes the stories and then people think that Rottweilers are aggressive or more likely to bite people. It's confusing a correlation with the causation. Not, mm, no, it's not, not really. 
just projective. It's it's multiple flaws, but I don't think correlation versus causation. Okay, so relating to the previous example with projecting, they're projecting the Rottweilers from the stories to all Rottweilers, which there might be other other reasons where why those Rottweilers are more aggressive, right? But another problem. Let's see if you guys can find it. There's another there's another flawed assumption. Uh, there's another flaw in, in this argument, which relates to the, the next common flaws in, in the IMAT. Let's see if anyone gets it. Let's see. The inverse of the true Scotman's fallacy. Maybe. That's a good, that's a good uh, catch, Michaelis. Stories may not be true, Veronica, nice. You got it. I think I think Veronica got it. Jumping to conclusions, right? Oh wait, is that jumping to conclusions? Where? Oh yeah, okay, it is jumping to conclusions. So you're taking a few anecdotes, which is I heard stories of Rottweilers being aggressive. If you guys don't know what anecdotes are, they're kind of stories, right? Like, let's say you're talking with your friend and Ari says, Oh, you know. Um, I yesterday I heard that my neighbor's Rottweiler bit someone. That's the story. You're, you, they're anecdotes. And then if I'm taking his anecdote, his story, and extrapolating it and saying all Rottweilers are aggressive based on the stories that I've heard, that's a flaw. That's not a strong um, reason to conclude that. Maybe Ari's lying. There's a bunch of things that could be happening, right? Maybe the fact that Rottweilers are perceived to be more aggressive, so people are more likely to tell stories about aggressive Rottweilers. Anecdotes in Greek is their literary stories with a funny dad joke punchline. Yeah, so you're making broad generalizations from a few stories. This usually is um, done together with the, with the previous example, from small categories to big, like for small examples. Um, this could be also in the form of studies. So imagine if there was a study where they did it on four men, right? Four men in their 30s. And then the conclusion from that study is that eating apples is bad. And then they say, everyone should not eat apples. They're extrapolating from a small group of people to a larger group of people when it, when it might not be the case. And this is a study but imagine if you said, um, I have four friends who went on the carnivore diet and they felt better. They ate only meat and they felt better. And then I said, everyone should eat meat. It's a flawed, it's a, it's flawed logic. All right, so that's the, that's the last of the, of the flaws. We, we can cover them one more quickly. So if we quickly go over it, Correlation versus causation is the first one. Absolute numbers and percentages. Uh, overlooking alternatives. Illogical comparisons. And projecting. And is there one more? And jumping to conclusions. So these are the common flaws. Doesn't mean they're the only flaws, but there's something you should keep an eye on. Something you should remember that you that you've heard that is a common way that people incorrectly draw a conclusion based off their reasons. And use that, if you find them in the IMAT, then there's your answer. So we'll do some examples. These are, I think, pretty straightforward. Let's start the, uh, relaunch the poll. And let me zoom in. Okay. Yeah, of course, we are going to have a 10 minute break after this section, then we are going to solve a couple of math and physics questions and we are done.
So good work on uh, staying this long, guys. Okay, 84%. You guys pretty much got it. So, if you guys want to type in the chat, which of the previous common flaws did this passage show? And the answer was E, by the way. Can you, can you move this over there? Yeah, you got it. Petra, Michaelis, and Petra, uh, and Paris. So basically they're saying, if you skip all the stuff in the beginning, they're saying that as roads grind to a halt, it will not be long before canals once open and become the backbone of the transportation. So they're saying in the past, we did this, and then we changed to this, and because this is no longer going to be the case, we're going to go back to this. But what about other alternatives? What if we move to a different type of, um, of transport, right? Assuming canals will be more effective, cheaper, and more economic. Mm. Maybe. Let me think about that. Canals replaced with other modes of transportation, which are faster and cheaper. In the 21st century, choose to close to use road haulage as mean transportation. With the rise of fuel costs and low emission zones, road haulage is now, yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, cheaper is more economic, but it could, like, the reason why they stopped using it in the beginning is because it was less economic. Now that it's becoming, now that, um, the solution is less economic doesn't stop the previous solution from also being less economic so it makes sense that they're going to do something else probably we're almost done paris we're almost done we have a couple a couple more types of questions and then we're done and then we'll take a break yeah the general knowledge is like five minutes we just skim through the past papers to see which topics they have been asked on and then we will uh, you will download the architect Let's do it quickly. I'll, I won't give as much time. Like, let's try to do it quickly. Um, Cause let's get through critical thinking. Cause I pretty much got through the most important stuff. Yeah, we are 10 hours in, it's in 10. Yeah, this is supposed to be eight hours. Yeah. Your brain hurts? Yeah, I'm, I make sense Paris, yeah, I got you. I think everyone's, yeah, pretty good. Mm, chances we continue to know it's a problem, but um, we have another hour or so, a bit math of physics, and I think uh, we will finish in about maybe less than an hour, and I will upload the, the rest of the slides to the website so you can answer everything and just ask me yeah, about I think the we questions. Today. Yeah. It's a bit much, but I think, yeah. It's not, it's not too bad because we're almost done critical thinking. We're not gonna go deep into physics and math and general knowledge is not gonna take very long. Yeah. 
Let's give them some time to think about this. Thanks, Thomas. <laughs> All right, 60% voted. Yeah, just show the results. You guys pretty much got it, it's C, right? So let's go over E because it seems like um, some people got E. So the public does not necessarily know whether a film has been expensive or cheap to make. That, close, almost, but it doesn't necessarily um, it's not necessarily the flaw in the argument. So what they're saying is that because there are some, so they're saying there are some uh, films which were expensive, which did badly, and some films which did, um, which were cheap, did well, then directors should have lo make low budget films. It's obvious that if directors want to make popular films, they should stick to low budgets. The number C, uh, Question, the answer C is saying the cost of the film does not, is not a factor in what determines its, possi its, its popularity or it, it's, it's not necessarily a factor. If that is the flaw, it's directly attacking the assumption in the argument. E is saying that the public doesn't really know whether a film is expensive or not. It doesn't really matter. That doesn't really affect um, the conclusion. All right, let's continue. So we only have two left, I think. Parallel reasoning and then one more. So parallel reasoning is a tricky one in the IMAT. What you have to do is you generalize the, um, the argument in bare bones form. What that means is, I'll show you later, but um, so, okay, actually I'll explain it now. So what bare bones form means is, here's an example, right? If I study harder, I will get better grades. If I get better grades, I'll get a better job and I won't be poor. Here, you simplify it to, if I do X, I will get Y. If I get Y, Z won't happen. If you strip away all the fat, if you strip away all the specifics and go down just to the bones, just to what is left, when you strip away all the stuff, that's what you get. That's the structure of the argument. And what this is saying is find the answer with the same structure argument as the one in the passage. And by doing this, if you do this with the passage and then you do this with the answers, you pretty much can't go wrong because you're taking away all the specifics and you're going down just to what's important. And if the, ba the basic bare bones is the same, that's the correct answer. If they're different, that's the wrong answer. This is one of the most guaranteed questions you can get if you do it right. I'll give you some, I'll give you some examples. So, do, do the same for the answers, identify which one's the same at its core, and um, yeah. So actually, maybe I should explain it a bit more. So let's see. So if I study harder, that's the first part, I will get better grades. That's the second part. If I get better grades, I'll get a better job and won't be poor, right? Those are the parts of this um, this argument. Take away the specifics, right? Take away study harder. If I X, 
I will take away the specifics y. If I y, I will get z. That's it. A leads to b, b leads to c. What? A, if I, A leads to B, if I study harder, I will get B. B leads to C, therefore A leads to C. Yeah, I think you got it, Omar. But that way is, it, it, you can do it that way, but it's, it's gonna be a bit harder to identify the, the passage and the answers. So I think it's better if you guys do an example and if you have any questions, you can ask, because I'm not really sure how much better I can explain it. So let's see if you guys can do it. Right. Okay, so basically, what do you guys think? What was your bare bones um, structure? The answer was C, by the way. So most people got it right. But D was a very popular wrong answer. So we'll, we'll go through it. So what was your, the people who did D or C, what was your bare bones structure? How did you guys break it down? If someone wants to do X, they have to do Y. Nice. If you want X, you have to do Y. Nice. You guys got it. So he did Y. X to Y. You need to do Y to be X. Yeah. <laughs> That's all right, Omar. So if Dennis, Denise wants to go to the party, she must tidy her room. If X, she needs Y. Therefore, she did Y. That's the same as the question. In D, only people who go swimming every day can be fit. As Mandy goes swimming every day, she is fit. That's a different argument structure. This is, it's, it's not saying that only people who are good football players have a good level of fitness. That's not what they're saying. They're saying in order to be a good football player, you need a good level of fitness. Yeah, therefore Z to Y, uh, Z to X, nice. You got it, Lux. So, only people, only people who go swimming every day can be fit. Mandy goes swimming every day, she is fit. 
That's not, you guys see how that's not the same structure? What do you guys think is the structure for, for D? Yeah, what's, what's your structure for D? Yeah. It's not, when I see the word only, I start doubting. Nice, nice Petra. It's good, nice. Everyone who does X is Y. Only X can Y, nice. That's not what they're saying. Yes, nice Thomas. That's what it would be if the same structure was in the passage. X leads to Y, but Mandy's already Y because she does X. Yeah, nice. You guys are getting it. So this is saying Jack wants to improve his football skills, so he decided to go running every day. This is not saying that. This is saying she already goes swimming every day, so she is fit. It's not the same argument. I think you guys are getting it. All right, so we'll skip the second one just to save a bit of time. Um, and we'll go to the last type. So applying principles. I think applying principles is the last one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, this is the last one, guys. We're almost done. So applying principles. This type of question, they'll ask you to find the principle which best illustrates the underlying argument. So basically, the principle is the foundation of the chain of reasoning which led the author to their conclusion. So how do you do this? You read the passage, you generalize the argument, and then you find the answer which best fits that reasoning. So it's not like the, the previous one where you strip it down to bare bones, but you find another way of showing the author's point in the argument, right? Like if the, if the I think it's best to show an example. Um, is this the, yeah. So basically applying principles is saying, what is another way of showing the author's point in the passage? Or what is another example of what the author is trying to portray in the passage? Um, I think inductive reasoning is a little bit different. Not, not rewording the conclusion. That's the first type of question. So let me, let me think of, of a simple example. Um, I think let's do an example and we'll talk about it because it's hard to explain, but it's easier once you, you have an example. So we'll do the question first and we'll talk about it. This is gonna to be tough to show all on screen because it's quite a long one. Guys, uh, raise your hand if you don't see the question. You don't see the question? How don't you see the, is it too blurry or is the framing bad? Can yeah. you be specific? Can you type in the chat? No, I blurry. Don't. I think then you're just going to have to use the PDF that I sent. Mm -hmm. It's good. Okay. Okay. So I see the people and say no. All right. Sorry, the internet connection.
Okay, so most, almost everyone got it right. So what I meant was by generalizing the argument, it's not the same as the previous one. So what I meant was, let's say, this argument in this passage is saying that um, right now it is proven that salt intake must be reduced by those with hypertension. Why should everyone else be deprived of salt? Here, that is the general argument. If a subpopulation of people are impacted by a specific um, action, why should the whole population have to do the same or have to also um, have that be done to them? So in A's case, you should, yeah, you should have the answer. Adding fluoride to drinking water has reduced tooth decay, but fluoride is unwelcome to some people. That doesn't really matter, ignore that. Instead, dentists should advise patients with tooth problems on, a better, tooth, on better tooth care. It's the same sort of argument. It's the same general argument. They're saying that instead of applying the solution to everyone, you apply the solution to, a, to the subset that is targeted. That's why A is correct. You see what I mean? So the requirement, what did people get wrong? So some, a couple of people said B, C, and E. I think this is just, um, so in some questions, there's a tricky one that a lot of people get wrong. But in this case, I think if you kind of understand um, the, thing, the thought process, then you would see that A is correct. For the people that put B, C, and E, I would say try to think, think it through again. So understand what general argument is the author trying to um, express, and then find a different example of that argument, if you see what I mean. So the requirement to wear seatbelts has reduced deaths in car accidents, but was unpopular when first introduced. People eventually accepted such changes, even if it has not benefited them personally. That's not the same argument. That's not, a, that's not showing the same principle. It's not showing uh, another example of what the author meant in the passage. So if you got the answer wrong, it's probably because you didn't understand the author's argument that, uh, well enough. So in this case, I would say, try to understand what the, uh, what the argument is better, and then find the argument, which is a, a similar um, thought process. All right, I think that's it. Yeah. A is correct. Skip this one. All right. We did it, guys. <laughs> so let's have a 10-minute break, Great game in 15, and we will come back at uh, 7.35 Italian time. All right. Thanks for having me, guys.
All right, guys. Uh, we have like three more minutes to the break. I just wanted to say thank you so much for the kind words. It's really important to us. And uh, we are really glad we are able to help you with your diamond exam. And for everything you want, we are here for you. Just talk with us because I guess you are probably stressed right now. So just send us a, me a message and we are here for you. And thank you for staying for so long. It's thank you for staying 49 with us. people after almost 12 hours. So thank you so much. So if you are here, please raise your hand and we will start in two minutes. Perfect. Nice. Okay, uh, the general knowledge section is at slide 562. Mm -hmm. If you're looking on the PDF. Yeah. Okay, shall I start? Yeah, I think we should start as soon as possible okay. so we can go to sleep Good. today. All right. So this part should be easy. Later break. Uh, first of all, you can download the deck card on with the deck with 600 cards based on the past paper that I made from the donator only forum. So, so, so make sure again, yep. send me a private message on the website so I can open it again. It's yep. very important. Okay, this is a little statistic that I made. Um, the first one is the general knowledge of 2019 paper. Um, because as you know, from 2019, we have 12 questions of general knowledge. Uh, from the two we had uh, in the past years. Uh, so the second graph is 2018-2014. You can see that literature um, holds up a great space on 2000, in 2019, which is kind of a new category. Maybe zoom in a bit, so yeah. it's a bit Sorry. small font. Okay. Yeah. Right. So literature. But we cannot really teach it. So the pen is not working. Oh, the pen is uh, older? No. Can right. I use mine? Sorry. We have two pens here. Of five. <laughs> Maybe try this one. Okay. Sorry, no, guys. You, you disconnected the. Uh, the screen. All right, wait, guys. We are going to reconnect the. Sorry. All right. That doesn't work. No, maybe this one. No, never mind. So we want to okay. uh, answer okay. for the session, <laughs> and let's continue. Okay. Can I connect mine? Um, oh. Uh, so. One second, guys. Yeah. Six hundred what? Okay. For the meanwhile, you can just keep asking me questions about uh, no, kidding. general no, alignment and stuff. Much. It's okay. So. Why? Okay. We'll do general knowledge without pencil. Anyway, so literature we cannot really teach. I think it comes from your high school background. Um, general culture, same. Uh, what history also? What we can do is global focus on global politics, Italian politics, and European politics. Um, Eight percent means it was just one question um, on the twelve that we had, and Nobel Prize. Um, Cambridge loves asking you about Nobel prizes, so maybe a quick recap on that would be very helpful. Check on the Anki Dex. Mm -hmm. uh, so here is the general knowledge questions from the 2019 IMAP. I divided it into categories. So maybe you can go through that later or tomorrow or when you have time. So as you can see, we have literature, scientific and sorry, uh, literature, general culture, Nobel Prize, history, politics, government, Italian politics, European politics. Uh, in the past year, since that we have the big part about scientific, on scientific and economic culture, we will see that in a moment. And then the same categories. Those are the answers, so check them here. Uh, let's try to solve those. All righty then, doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Do it by yourselves. <laughs> uh, right. These are questions about scientific culture in general. So, okay. Uh, here I made a quick summary about a couple of important topics. Uh, nuclear fission, discovery of DNA. Yeah. It's good stuff uh, actually, to know in the general Discovery knowledge. of DNA, you should definitely check on this because on the Italian test uh, of 2020 that 
took place two days ago in, I guess, biology, uh, there was a pretty hard question about uh, history of DNA and the experiment that uh, Hershey and Avery Hershey and Chase did. Mm -hmm. So, Is it both on, yeah, it was in biology. Okay, so, so about the Nobel Prize, is there any category they ask more frequently? Um, medicine related yeah. Nobel Prizes, almost all the time. They won't ask you only biology, chemistry related stuff, medicine, but not uh, maybe even peace, but that's yeah. it. And literature because yeah, but, lately they love it. Yeah, usually medicine related. Is so it, okay. I think we are just going to share with them the tables yeah. so they can look up them. This is another summary about mm -hmm. most important facts about medical history. So they love to ask, I think Jenner is important, the small book, the first vaccine. Uh, and then we have uh, Koch with bacteriology. And the first antibiotic was discovered by Fleming and it is penicillin. And then DNA sequencing, Sanger, this is biotechnology. So maybe you should get a quick look on that also for biology. This question is about global politics. We won't do the question, but maybe I will explain really quick the United Nations. Um, yeah. So it was founded right after World War II because there was need of peace and of a global organization. Uh, the question was, which one of the following is not a stated... Okay. Which one of the following is not a stated purpose of the United Nations? So, um, this, uh, the purpose of the United Nations is to maintain internal, international peace and security, to develop friendly relations among nations, to achieve international cooperation, and to be a center of harmonizing the actions of the nations. The thing that does not do is to encourage peaceful trade between nations. It has nothing to do, and not nothing, but it has nothing to do with trade and economy. It's about international cooperation on a more politic and social level. Mm -hmm. Okay. But wait, in previous slides, yeah. we showed them Flemings. I think this one is wrong, right? It's 1980-28 Fleming one. Might be right. Sorry. Yeah, yeah all right. Sure. Okay. So we will fix it on the slides Sorry. later and we'll send yep. Thank you for that. Uh, another thing about the United Nations, uh, most of the uh, all independent states of the world are part of it. So we have 193 member states. Uh, except the Vatican City, Taiwan, and National Palestinian Authority, which are all present as just observers. Mm -hmm. And for the questions, uh, yes, Alex, you can just use the Anki cards, because I took from the 11,000 Anki deck, the huge one, and I only took the very high yield stuff, based on past papers from the uh, Italian exam, IMAT, and even different high school exams that Cambridge does as well. So it's very high yield for the exam. And uh, for the new people, in order to get it, you have to send me a PM on the website. So I will give you a badge, a donator badge, and you will see then on the main forum, a new forum for donators only with all the study materials we just talked about, including the recording and everything. Okay, so next European Union, I'm sure that there will be at least one question about it. So it's 1.5 point for free. Yeah. Um, this is a little history of the EU. Uh, this is a very cool animated video. Uh, I know that you cannot see the video, but maybe later click on the link in the, uh, that is here. It's really nice. So uh, try to understand which countries are part of the EU, which are not, uh, what is the Schengen area, which country adopted the uh, Euro, uh, and check on the Scandinavia, the northern country, because they are pretty complicated. Not all of them are part of the European Union, but some uh, uh, uses the euro mm -hmm. and so on. Okay, and finally, the NATO. Yeah, it's very important yeah. as well. Yeah. And that's it. Remember so, that the aim of the NATO is to defend the interests of the Western countries. So it was formed to face the Soviet Union and the USSR. Mm -hmm. Basically, that's it. So which of the following countries is not a founding member of the NATO? The Germany, because the Germany, first of all, lost the war. And secondly, it was occupied by the West German, at least, by Americans, French, and British until 1955. And East German was occupied by the Soviets, so definitely not part of the NATO. 
And that's it for the, sorry, that's it for the general knowledge part. All right. So we are going to skip now for math and physics. Yep. And it might be a different PDF slide set, you are right. But um, it's supposed to be the same one. So just a minute, we are going to change the um, iPad. iPads, the technology here. And uh, for now, we can just ask a question and we can uh, answer questions because I have some questions from this phone and actually I didn't answer yet. So if you have anything, just tell me now. And also, you will all get accepted in Marathon for it. And guys, <laughs> as well, you won't need the next year of Marathon. No, I'm not going to stream. Is this GK different than what we promised us or the same? Um, you know, I can't really promise anything for the actual exam, yeah. but all of it based on the analysis of past pa papers. Yeah, actually it's really difficult to make provision on general knowledge because we had just one year, which is last year, mm -hmm. with 12 questions. And as you can see from the statistic, it changed quite a bit. Yeah. So I don't know. But in general, maybe it's a good idea to spend like two hours on the 600 cards of the Anki, an yeah. just like skim through it, see all the cards, and that's it. Maybe you will score something, maybe you will not. It's, it's a good idea always. Okay. All right. So you have your pen. Is this mine? Mm -hmm. Maybe try this one. Okay, so talk disconnected and territory. Mm. Like what you said, we will have on entermedschool.com as donors. Uh, it's a badge for contributors, for donators, and it opens you a section nobody can see, only for donators with all the study materials I'm going Daddy, to release today. Some more. No? All right. Maybe we don't have a battery anymore. So, just a second. Do you have the answers here? Yeah, very. All right, Tiger. Okay. Perfect. Okay. All right. Good. Okay, so here we go, Martin Physics. Yeah, it's the last section. Yeah. We are going to be very high yield. So we remove some okay. uh, yeah. questions and we are going to solve only the most, uh, the probability that to show up in the exam. You can try to solve the questions later by yourself. And if you have any question or doubt, you can just text me or I. Yeah, of course. Okay, so we will start with kinematics. This is the first question. I'll give you one minute. Do you make All right. So let's take this one one minute. You should zoom because I don't okay. think. Yeah, it's the same slide, but different iPad because the battery just died. Don't worry. All right. So I made this big box of food at the beginning of the morning and every week I just run to the kitchen, eat something and come back here like in five minutes. And I eat a lot, you have no idea. All right.
All right. Okay. I see it was uh, controversial. Mm -hmm. The correct answer is D. The cliff is about 20 meters high. Uh, we see why in a second. Okay. So what we have to use is the law uh, of, uh, is this one? Uh, it's the law of the uniform, uniformly accelerated motion. So we have uh, S, which is the space, uh, equals to S0, initial space is zero, so there's no. Uh, initial velocity, no, velocity, no initial velocity because the object is still at the beginning. And then we have one half times uh, acceleration, which is gravity, so we can approximate it to 10, times time uh, to the second. Two seconds, so it's four. 10 times four divided by two is 20. Mm -hmm. And if you studied physics for the IMAT exam, I would highly suggest using those questions we are going to show you today to memorize the equations again because those are the questions that usually they asked about all the time. Yeah, right. go through the PowerPoint at the end of each uh, math and physics uh, section. I put a quick summary with the important formulas. Mm -hmm. Okay, all so right. yeah, Let's next do another one. one and uh, zoom in on the question and I will run the poll again. Okay, we don't, we don't have that much time. Uh, I know this question might have been a little bit difficult, but try to imagine that you're actually taking the exam. So the time you have is limited as it is limited now. Um, if you don't know the answer and you see it's already one minute, uh, try to uh, decide if you're going to leave the question blank or if you're going to guess it. Like maybe you're uncertain between two options and then you're gonna guess it. Okay, try to also uh, simulate that part. The correct answer is C. Let's see why. Okay, so the first thing we have to do is to find the time using the inverse formula uh, of the acceleration. Acceleration is um, delta V uh, divided by T, so time is uh, difference in velocity divided by acceleration, which is eight. Then we use again the same formula as before, which is the uh, law of uniformly accelerated motion. Uh, in this time, we have an initial velocity. So we add uh, initial velocity times time, which is eight times 12 plus one half uh, acceleration. The acceleration is 
uh, 1.50 and it's actually a deceleration so it's negative i wrote not 1.5 but 3 divided by 2 3 halves because i think it's easier to calculate it this is another trick 1.5 is 3 halves um, you can see it's easier to do the calculation you can just 2 times 2 is 4, 64 divided, 64 is times uh, to the second, 64 divided by 4 is 16. And then you just have to do 16 times 3, which is 48, and 8 times 12, which is 96. Uh, because it's a de deceleration and the whole acceleration here is negative, we have 96 minus 48, which is 48 meters. Is it clear? Any question, guys? Why minus? Uh, because it's deceleration. Yeah, it's a deceleration. So it's not, it's an acceleration, but it's not speeding up, it's speeding down. Explain it again, please. Okay, we can do this together. Maybe here, I'll write it with you. So first thing we have to do is to find the time. We use this formula. The time is delta V divided by A, the acceleration. So it's different in velocity. The initial speed is 12. So um, difference in velocity means final velocity minus initial velocity. Initial, initial velocity. velocity. So it's mm -hmm. a 0 minus 12, which is minus 12 divided by acceleration, which is 1.5, but it's a deceleration, so it's minus 1.5. Uh, the result is plus eight. Now that we have the time, we can use this formula, which is the law of uniformly accelerated motion. Which is very important. Yeah, you should definitely yeah. memorize this. Mm -hmm. We have um, space equal to initial, initial velocity, uh, which is 12 times time, which is what we found here, eight, plus one half times the acceleration, which is negative. I wrote it as three halves, which is the same thing as writing minus 1.5. It's just easier for me to do calculations. Times eight to the second, which is 64, okay? Now we calculate it. 12 times eight is 96. Then we have, um, 64 divided by 2 and then 2 again. So it's 64 divided by 4, which is 16. 16 times 3, which is 48, but it's negative. Okay, there is a minus here. So it's 96 minus 48, which is 48. All right. Better? So Roy asked, even the speed is negative? Uh, no. Yes, no, the speed is not negative, yeah. but delta V means final velocity mm -hmm. minus initial initial velocity. Yeah. So it's zero minus 12. Yeah. The 12 itself is positive, but it's minus initial velocity. That's yeah. why it becomes negative. Got it, Roy. All right, perfect. Okay. Any more questions, guys? All right, perfect, let's keep going. Okay. Next question. This is about angular velocity.
Okay. So the correct answer was C. I saw it causes some difficulties, but it actually was more reasoning problem. Uh, okay, so a tractor traveling at constant speed in a straight line has front wheels of diameter D and a real, uh, rear wheels of diameter 2D. If you draw it, it's something like this here. The angular velocity of the front wheel is omega. Now, the linear velocity is distance divided by time. What is angular velocity? It's angle divided by time. Okay, so this, this is the front wheel, which is smaller. And this is the um, rear wheels, which is uh, larger and bigger. Uh, if you talk about linear velocity, you can see that, of course, the bigger one has to travel more at the same time. But the angular velocity is the same. Um, there are wheels, and the car is moving on uh, both of the wheels. So it will be like something like this, no? Mm -hmm. the car. But they are moving together. Uh, it's not possible that one wheel is moving faster than the other one. What do we mean when one wheel is moving faster? It's the angular velocity, okay? So if this wheel is doing 600, six, uh, 360 degrees, this one is also rotating the same. It's one complete cycle. Uh, you can see here, they're doing the same angle at the same time but one wheel has a faster, higher linear velocity, the bigger one, because it has to travel more. The circumference is larger, is bigger. But the angular velocity is the same, and this is very important. That's why, um, if you know it, this problem was very, very quick. Uh, you just notice that the angular velocity is the same, no calculation, and the answer is C. Mm -hmm. When is the angular velocity different? Uh, when they are moving at different, yeah. when they're not together. Yeah, because they are constrict yeah. together in this car, so it has to be the same, but if it was a different, so it was yeah. a different angular velocity. Okay. Uh, let's move on this second problem really quick to see if you understood. All right. All right, time is up. The answer was A. Okay, most of you got it wrong. Let's see this. Satellite is an orbit around the Earth. Um, the diameter of its orbit is A times 10 to the fourth, and the time taken is A times 10 to the fourth. What is the speed of satellite in the orbit, and what is the, its angular velocity omega? Okay. So uh, the speed is the linear velocity, right? So it's distance divided by time. 
the distance is just the circumference of the circle. So we have to take the, uh, the formula is here, 2 uh, pi r. Uh, we have pi and we have 2 r already because it's the diameter, 8 times 10 to the 4. So this is the speed. Oh, no, sorry. This is the distance. The velocity is this, the uh, space travel, so the distance, divided by time. We have pi 8 to the uh, 8 times 10 to the fourth kilometers divided by what is the time taken for one complete orbit, so doing one circumference, 8 times 10 to the fourth. So the calculation is really easy and the velocity is pi. What about the angular velocity? Angular velocity is angle divided by time. What is the angle of doing one complete cycle? 360 grades, which is how many radians? Two pi radians, okay? So omega is two pi divided by the time. Time to make one complete orbit, one cycle. Eight to, uh, times 10 to the fourth, which is pi divided four times 10 to the fourth. Perfect. Any question, guys? By the way, this table is very good for the IMF exam, yep. for the common degrees compared to the radians. This one. Why four times? Where? Um, you mean the. 10 to the fourth, you mean? No, I think here. Okay. I think you mean the angular velocity. It's because, look, um, angular velocity is 2 pi because it's one complete cycle and these are 360 grades divided by the time, which is 8 times 10 to the fourth uh, seconds. Now you divide 2 um, with 8 and you have 1 here and 4. So this is pi divided by 4 times 10 to the fourth. All right, okay. perfect. Perfect. Another Great. one. Okay, here you find the summary, the formulas that you should know. And then I think you should know also this table and the difference between linear velocity and angular velocity. Now we will skip all those questions and go into this one. This one is kind of hard, but yeah. I'm sure you can do it. All right, so let's do it. Yeah. We are going to give you guys uh, more 30 seconds because we can see a lot of people are trying to answer it, so it's good.
Benjamin, about the study material, I'm going to share it on a specific uh, place on the website. So um, I will update later on the, what, on the WhatsApp group exactly what to do to find it. Don't worry. All right? Okay. So the correct answer was A. Most of you got it wrong, but don't worry, we will see it now. I will explain it to you now. So an object is moving with kinetic energy A, E on a horizontal plane, then goes up a smooth inclined line plane. Um, here, the, ob the speed of the object is half of the speed on the horizontal plane. What is the potential energy? We have, you have to uh, recap the law of conservation of energy, which say the potential energy plus the kinetic energy is constant. This means that the variation of potential energy, delta U, is equal to delta K, the variation of kinetic energy. Okay. So here, we have, um, hold on, okay. Um, well, at the starting point, uh, what is the potential energy? The potential energy here is zero because the height of the object is zero. Okay, remember, uh, this is the formula of the potential en energy, mass times gravitational acceleration times height. The height here is zero. What is the kinetic energy? The object is moving, right? It is moving with kinetic energy E. So the kinetic energy here is E. According to the law of conservation of energy, this sum, so E plus zero, which is E, must be the same of the sum of the K and the U here. So this is equal to E again. So you can see that we have to calculate the K and the U uh, up here. It says that on the inclined plane, the speed of the object is half of the speed on the horizontal plane. Then how much is k? If, um, let me erase this. The formula of kinetic energy is one half time mass times velocity to the second. We don't know the mass, we don't know the velocity, but it's fine. Velocity one, the mass one. What, this is k1. What about K2? K2 is same one half. The mass of the object is the same. What about the velocity? It says that the speed is half of the uh, initial velocity. So it's V1 divided by two to the second. Okay, let's solve this. We have one half mass velocity to the second divided by four. Now you can see that this thing is the same of this thing. So this up here that I circled in blue is K1. So we can say that K2 is K1 divided by four. Now K1 is equal to E. So this is equal to E divided by four. If K2 is E divided by four, and the sum of K2 and U2 is E, how much will, you, uh, will be the value of U? It's three fourth E. The answer is A. Any questions, guys? Probably the... All right, so I think the next question is going to be about thermodynamic, oh wait. Last step again, please, no, it's clear. Uh, um, where did you get the three from and last step again? Where did you get the three from? Okay, uh, okay, last step. So we went uh, until uh, K2, we decided that K2 is equal to K1 divided by four, all right? K1 is equal to E, we said that at the beginning. So. K2 is also E divided by four here. Now we have K2 plus U2 must be equal to E because of the low conservation of energy. This also means that K, um, the final uh, kinetic energy plus the final potential energy is equal to the sum of the 
initial potential energy and the initial kinetic energy. Okay, it's just that this is equal to E. Now we have that K2 is equal to E divided by 4 plus U2 that we don't know and we have to know. So this becomes U2 is E minus E divided by 4, which is 3 quarters E. What? All right. I think it's clear. Let's move on. We'll skip all this part. Okay. I like this exercise. Yeah, this one is an important one for the AMT exam. Yeah. So let's uh, try to solve this one as well. I'll give you one minute. All right. And let's see the result. Yes, most of you got it right. The answer is yeah. A. Good How job. to solve this one? This one was also more a logic kind of problem. So what is power? Power is work divided by time. What is work? Work is force times the displacement, the space, divided by time. What is force? Force is mass times the acceleration, and then the same, space divided by time. What is acceleration? Mass times acceleration is... Um, times squared. Thank you. We are uh, tired, speed <laughs> times uh, space, sorry, times uh, divided by times squared, yes. And then again, we copy the rest, space and time. And that's it. We have to convert the power, the what, which unit is what, into uh, the fundamental units, which are mass, space, and time. Let's convert this into the actual units. The mass is measured in kilograms, the space into meters. We have meters squared divided by the time is in second, second cube. So that's the answer, A. Right. And most of you got it right, so good job. It's yeah, uh, good. important, all the units, the place with the units, it's very important for the AMT exam. So if you know the units already, you should already recap them. And if you don't, um, like a guy, I think I'm going to skip most of the physics. Mm, mm, yeah, if like, it's, I mean, it's too late to study physics from yeah. scratch, so it's okay, but make sure to start and to know your strategy for the actual exam. And also what I was kind of trying to show you um, with this presentation was that even if you don't know physics, if you memorize just few formulas, you are able to solve it. Uh, it's a lot about logic. And actually we're skipping the most easy questions, but not all of the questions in the IMAP uh, physics are that hard okay so I think if you just spend the last two days trying to memorize uh, some of the most important formulas you will be able to get right a couple of questions in physics and that's already three five points more yeah and every point counts yeah all right so how many points uh, how should you uh, wait yeah how many should we answer like minimum it depends because if you score all the points from chemistry and biology and you know it perfectly, you get 45 points. 
and you don't need for most of the universities as a non you you don't need to solve the math and physics but there are some subjects on math and physics like dynamics thermodynamics the electrical circuits we are going to do in just a moment that they are asked on every year again and again yeah. and it's not so complicated yeah and it's pretty fun i have to say physics is it's pretty fun but i'm a huge geek so <laughs> yeah i like it too yeah. okay so all here right. you find the summaries we didn't uh, do all the part about the equilibrium the moment the torque so make sure to go through that by yourselves mm -hmm. skip skip okay um this question uh, this is about fluid dynamics. It's every year uh, there might be one question about it and it's always very, very controversial. Like it's not immediate to answer. So for this one uh, and the next one too, I, wouldn't, I won't make a poll. I will just explain uh, together and we'll do together the question, okay? So a balloon filled with air is tied to a heavy rock and dropped into deep water. The balloon sinks deeper and deeper. No air enters or leaves the balloon, and the temperature of the air in the balloon stays constant. Which row of the table identifies what happens to the actress acting on the balloon and to the volume of the air in the balloon as it sinks? Assume that the air acts as an ideal gas. The correct answer is A, but let's see why. So there is this balloon connected to a rock that is sinking deeper into the water. What is happening? Um, as the balloon is going down, the pressure is increasing. The pressure of the water above the balloon is increasing. Remember, in water, every 10 meters, you have one atmosphere more of pressure, which is huge. Um, like the whole atmosphere above us is one atmosphere. Sorry. The uh, pressure of the whole air above us is about one atmosphere. In water, every 10 meters is one atmosphere more. So it's like crazy pressure. This water is getting down, so more and more water is above the balloon. Like this. So you see the pressure is increasing. This is the uh, gas flow uh, the law of the gases, ideal gases, which you should definitely absolutely know. It's very important. Pressure times volume is equal to nRT. N is the number of moles, uh, R is the gas constant, and T is the temperature. The key relation is here. No air is leaving, so the number of moles is not changing. The temperature is also constant. The only variation we have is the pressure. If pressure is increasing, and this here is constant, then the volume must decrease. Remember that gases are compressible. So actually what is happening here is that the balloon is becoming smaller and smaller because the air inside is getting more and more compressed. That's why the first row, the, uh, sorry, the second column, the volume decreases. So these two answer it are the options. Now what about the uptrust? The uptrust is also called the buoyant force the, uh, from the Archimedes principle. And the formula is here. Force, Archimedes force is equal to the density of the fluid in which the object is immersed, the density of the water, the volume of the immersed object, so the volume of the balloon, and the constant of gravity. So we have the volume here, and we just stated that the volume is decreasing. If the volume is decreasing, then the force is also decreasing. That's why row one is the correct answer. Abstrus is decreasing. Mm -hmm. Is everything clear? And T is in Kelvin, right? Usually T is yeah. in Kelvin, but if it's delta T, you can use yeah. Celsius as well yeah. because it's only the change in T. But I would suggest for the IMAT exam, always convert it yeah. into Kelvins, always. It's the safest way to go. So plus 273. Mm -hmm. Good. Next right. one. This was on um, one Italian exam. I hate it. I took like, I spent two days thinking about it. 
and I'm not sure if I got it still now. I'm not fully convinced, but anyway, I'll try to convince you before the myself. A tub has the shape of a cube with sides along 100 centimeters and it's partially filled with water, density one kilograms uh, on liters. On the water is floating a big piece of ice of 50 kilograms. The density, as you can see, is smaller than uh, the density of the water, of course. If you let all the ice melt and neglect the evaporation, how does the water level in the tub change? The answer is that it doesn't change. The explanation is the following. According to Archimedes' principle, at the initial situation, the floating ice cube displaces the same volume of water as the immersed part of the ice. So it increases the water level in the tub. When the ice cube melts, the volume of displaced water decreases, but the water level in the tub doesn't change because water coming from the melted ice, both the immersed and the immersed part is added. This is possible because ice has a smaller density than water, and melting it occupies lesser volume. Now I'll try to explain it with uh, my words. First situation, the ice is floating. We have an uh, upward buoyant force, which is equal, this one, the red one, which is equal to the weight of the volume of displaced water. And this is the key concept of floating up objects, okay? Every object that is floating receives a force which is equal to the weight, the weight force of the volume of fluid that they displaced. So this is the formula of the buoyant force, the actors, the density of the water times the volume of the immersed object times gravity it is equal to the weight, so its mass, times gravity. Now the density is mass divided by volume. So if we write again this formula, instead of using density, we use mass divided by volume, time volume, time gravity. We can simplify it and we obtain mass times gravity. So we would have here, uh, mass of displaced water times gravity equals to mass ice times gravity. We can simplify the G and we have this formula here. The mass of the displaced water is equal to the mass of the ice. When ice melts into the water, it doesn't change its mass. But because ice is less dense, when it melts into water, it occupies less volume. So the volume of the immersed ice is equal to the volume of water melted from immersed and the immersed part of ice. That's how you compensate it. Any questions? I know you must be so tired by now, but a bit more and we're finished. So good work for staying so, for so long, guys. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I'm dying. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you might, even if you get this one point extra yeah. from this, two hours of physics and math, it will it's be completely worth it. Worth it. Yeah. It's worth it. I would say this, if you love physics like I do, you can spend one week thinking about it um, and trying to convince yourself. Otherwise, just learn that when ice melts, it occupies the same, like the volume doesn't change. If ice is floating and it melts, the volume of the water doesn't change. Okay, I think we can move on. Nathan, how are you thanking us? It's almost funny. <laughs> <laughs> so being super polite, Nathan. <laughs> okay, let's do this one. All right, so zoom in a bit and then okay. let's sign another poll. Good job, guys. Well, I think we got some really important weak points today because we used the poll system and we actually mm -hmm. saw your weak spots and now you can get those extra points on the IMAT and this is was the point of the smartphone. So good work. And right. it's great for us too because we can see your progress and how you're doing. It's really yeah. nice. Then I can't wait to see you in, it in Italian next year. So just yeah. come say hello immediately yeah. when you pass the yeah. exam. All right. Oh, sorry. Free lunch. All right, let's do it. Okay.
this is an easy one. Yeah, so easy everyone one. who hates physics doesn't know anything of physics. This one is where you can get one uh, one point five points just for knowing one formula. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it's an important formula. I also use in chemistry a lot. So. All right, Thomas. Let's do it. <laughs> Yeah, we can see that so many of you got it right because yeah. even if you are afraid of physics and you didn't study physics for the actual exam, you can see there are many different um, points you can score on the math and physics only from being uh, having general knowledge. And uh, this point is having the knowledge from the actual chemistry because this is the yeah. ideal gas law which you have to know for the exam. Okay. All right. Hands up. Great who said A, not so great, who said C. <laughs> this is the formula. Uh, pressure times volume is an N R R T. I English is hard. <laughs> if the pressure halves, if pressure goes down, is decreasing, what happens to the volume? This thing, no one's talking about number of moles, uh, temperature, so this thing is constant. PV is constant. That's a good question. Don't you need to say here that it's a closed system? You don't have to say it's a closed system because once you have pressure applied, you just assume it's a closed system. So if the pressure is decreasing, but the product of pressure and volume must be the same, then volume must be increasing. Okay, and if pressure is one half, and this still has to be one because it's constant, like before P times V, if it's one, then it has to be the same, then the volume must be two. So you can uh, cancel the two. Mm -hmm. That's why it doubles. Yeah, the same for chemistry questions. Everything with ideal gas in the question, immediately use the PV equals NLT. It's very important that you will see immediately the logic behind the question. Good. All right. Almost done, Everyone, guys. Yes, very good. Okay, we are into. Okay, here you have the summaries, and here you find we are into the last topic of physics. Mm -hmm. All right, let's do some electricity, yeah. which is, by the way, you have one question every year on electricity, yeah. either on uh, thermodynamics, electricity, or um, electric circuits. So it's very important. Circuits, sorry. <laughs> Again, English is hard, especially <laughs> after 12 hours of math. Yeah. All right, let's do it. That's so cool. Perfect. All right, guys, good job. Let's see now how we solve this yep. question. The answer was B. Yeah, and good a lot job, of you guys. got it right. Yeah, good good job. job. It's very important for the exam. This was a simple formula. The formula of power. Power is, oh, it's just, um, 
voltage difference in voltage times um, I, which is the electric current. We have to use the inverse formula because here we have the power and here we have the voltage difference. So uh, current is will be equal to uh, power divided by delta V. Mm -hmm. In which of the household appliance does the biggest flow of intensity flows? If E must be the biggest, then P must be the biggest, which is the biggest power. It's definitely the washing machine. This one here. Good job. All right. Let's do another one. Now we will do a uh, Ohm's law question okay. for well, electrical circuits, yeah. which is extremely important for the exam because there are a lot of electrical circuits questions on the exam. Okay. So let's try to do one now. This is a very nasty one. Yeah. All right. Okay, good. The correct answer was, let me check. Yeah, B. Good job, guys. This is about resistance. How do you calculate resistance in a circuit? So if we're talking about resistance in series, the total resistance is equal to the sum of the resistances in the system in series. If we are talking about resistance in parallel, we have to do uh, the reciprocal mm -hmm. so, of the resistance. So uh, one divided by the total resistances will be equal to the sum of the reciprocal of the sum of the resistances. Like the sum of the reciprocal of the resistances. This thing. Native speakers <laughs> in the crowd, is the reciprocal yeah. is the right word? <laughs> the dominator? Yeah, thanks guys. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so we, what we have to do is to calculate all the possible combinations. Let's say that these three resistors are all in series. So it will be something like this. Right? In this case, uh, total resistance is the sum of the three resistances. So first case, total resistance is 6 plus 6 plus 6, which is 18. So answer E is possible, it's not correct. Second possibility, all the resistances are in parallel. So I think it will look something like this. Yeah, exactly. Okay, in this case, the reciprocal of the total resistances is one six plus one six plus one six, which is three six, which is one half. So the total resistance Always remember not to end here. I used to do that and score bad in test in high school. It's not finished here. You have to do the reciprocal in order to get the total resistance. Yeah. So total resistance is two. Yeah, just okay? flip it. Yeah, flip it. And Alex, yeah, it's a good one. You can also do the formula R T O T, the R one times R two, yeah, divided by R one plus R two. Yeah, it's it's a good one. But uh, if you don't want uh, to memorize this one, this one is a bit more easier to uh, actually memorize. memorize. Yeah. So it's not true. Now we can have one resistance in series connect, uh, one resistance connected in series to other two connected together 
in parallel like this Come on. Yeah. in this case we have first we have to calculate the small circuit so we have two resistances in parallel the total resistance of one plus two will be one six plus one six which is going to be two third so the r1 plus two is equal to flip it one third. three halves it's one third Sorry. divided to three Sorry. Yeah. okay Sorry. thanks it's three now we have to connect it in series with this one this one is six so third option is our total resistance is six plus three it's nine so it's not c last option we have is uh, one resistance connected in parallel to other two resistances. So it's something like this. In this case, we have to calculate first the small circuit. Six plus six, it's easy, it's 12. And then we have to do the parallel system, the bigger one. So we have, I'll write it here. The reciprocal is one sixth plus one twelfth. So it's 12 divided by two, three, one fourth. Remember to flip it, it's four. Fourth case, total resistance is equal to four. So it's not A, it's not C, not D, it's not T. E. The answer is B, 15. I just blacked out. <laughs> yeah. All right. So yeah. can you repeat the parallel and series formulas? Yes, of course. Of course. Uh, you have find them here. Yeah. You can see it on the yeah. actual PowerPoint itself. This is also important. In series, the current is constant in a circuit, while in parallel, the voltage difference is constant. All right. So this Perfect. is important. All right. This was another question to just check if you understood, but you will do this by yourselves. OK. OK, guys, an important thing, capacitors. Uh, capacitor are the opposite of resistances. Just remember that. So uh, a condensator, uh, condensators in parallel will have the same formula of total resistances in series, while capacitors in series will have the same formulas of uh, total uh, capacity, uh, sorry, total resistances in parallel. Mm -hmm. Just remember that it is the opposite. Mm -hmm. And you will use the same formula. Here you have find the summaries of the last topic of physics. Okay. Now what time is it? Why do you turn it into two? Okay, because in order to get the actual number, the value you have to get, you have to flip it back. This is part of the um, formula itself. Yeah. It's just a way to reach it. Okay. Uh, so I will explain just the last exercise on math and then I really have to go because I have to catch the last train. All right, so let's do it as well and uh, I think we are done. Yeah. Yeah, after this, there is no break, there is a sleep time. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Thinking <laughs> time, all the knowledge we just got today. And then, um, <laughs> okay, it's all good. All right, perfect. I stopped the video, I'm going to sit here.
Okay, great. Let's check the answer quickly. The answer was C. Ooh, that was tricky. Okay, the important thing about probability that you have to know is that um, when you're calculating combined probability, you have to multiply, while when you're just um, adding, uh, it's the sum. We will see that in a, in a second. So let me erase this thing. The game is that you have to score five on one dice or the sum of both of your dices uh, dice must be five, right? So what are the possible combination to win the game? Here we have dice one and here we have dice two. First possibility to win. Um, you score five on the first dice, doesn't matter what you score on the second one. What is the probability to get five on a dice? One sixth, because there are six faces on the dice. Second, um, second uh, option, no matter what you score on the first dice, you get five on the second one and you win the game. What is the probability to get five on the second one, no matter what you have on the first one? One sixth. Third option, you score one on the first dice and four on the second dice. In this case, what is the probability to score one on the first dice? One sixth. What is the probability to get four on the second one? One sixth. What do you have to do with those two events? They have to occur both of them together at the same time. So you have to multiply them. And the probability to get one on the first one and, second on the, uh, and four on the second one is one divided by 36. Fourth option, you get two and three. What is the probability? Same as before, one divided by 36. Fifth option, three and two, one, 36. Sixth option, four and one, and that's it. Now what you have to do with all of those probabilities, they don't have to occur all together. It's either one or the other, right? You just need one of them to occur, one of these six options to occur. So you will sum them. You have one six plus one six plus uh, one, two, three, four, four divided by 36. And I think the answer will be four, nine. That's it. If you have any doubt, uh, Ari will answer it. Yeah. <laughs> and right. I have to go. So thank you guys. It was an amazing experience. I hope it was at least somehow useful. I need the iPad. Thank you, iPad. <laughs> We Thank you, good job, and let's see you in Italy. I'm sure you all do great on the exam. Yeah, perfect. Okay. okay, see you. All right. We did it. Almost 12 hours. I think exactly 12 hours. It's insane. But good job, guys. <laughs> It was a real marathon, absolutely. It was a real marathon. Yeah. So, bye, say good night. All right. Perfect. Yeah. So, thank you so much for joining this marathon. Um, I actually was a bit delusional and I thought I'm going to upload and to teach you some nephron and female uh, reproductive system. But you have very high yield, uh, slides on the actual um, slides we just showed you. So make sure to pass through the study materials. And again, thank you for joining this marathon and donating to the website because without you, I, would, I wouldn't and we wouldn't be able to keep hosting and running this nonprofit website. So thank you so much. And I really hope to see you next year in Italia. All right. Guys, if you have any more questions before I'm going into coma, please do it right now. And um, I will do my best to help you. And uh, all right. Why don't you multiply yourself? <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. Let's sleep. Thanks, guys. It's so nice to see this community really coming into the real deal because I used to dream about it actually a year and a half ago when I studied myself for the IMAT exam. And now to see so many people, it's so, 
it's just it's amazing to me. Don't cry. Yeah, I'm going to cry, guys, but it's out of tiredness. It's not out of excitement or something. Okay. So I'm going to watch and um, I'm going to uh, upload this entire marathon to YouTube under private. So only people with a uh, URL and link will be able to see it. Uh, all right, so I'm going to sleep. I wish you the best. We are here for you. If you are stressed or you need anything, just don't hesitate to PM us anywhere. We are here for you guys. All right, so good night. Bye guys.